Section Zero of an Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine by John Henry Newman. Introduction, Part One. To the Rev. Samuel William Waite, B.D., President of Trinity College, Oxford. My dear President, Not from any special interest which I anticipate you will take in this volume, or any sympathy you will feel in its argument, or intrinsic fitness of any kind in my associating you and your fellows with it, but because I have nothing besides it to offer you, in token of my sense of the gracious compliment which you and they have paid me in making me once more a member of a college dear to me from undergraduate memories. Also because of the happy coincidence that whereas its first publication was contemporaneous with my leaving Oxford, its second becomes by virtue of your act contemporaneous with a recovery of my position there. Therefore it is that without your leave or your responsibility, I take the bold step of placing your name in the first pages of what, at my age, I must consider the last print or reprint on which I shall ever be engaged. I am, my dear President, most sincerely yours, John H. Newman. February 23, 1878 Preface to the Edition of 1878 the following pages were not in the first instance written to prove the divinity of the Catholic religion, though ultimately they furnish a positive argument in its behalf, but to explain certain difficulties in its history felt before now by the author himself and commonly insisted on by Protestants in controversy as serving to blunt the force of its prima facie and general claims on our recognition. However beautiful and promising that religion is in theory, its history, we are told, is its best refutation, the inconsistencies found age after age in its teaching being as patent as the simultaneous contrarieties of religious opinion manifest in the high, low, and broad branches of the Church of England. In reply to this specious objection, it is maintained in this essay that, granting that some large variations of teaching in its long course of 1800 years exist, nevertheless these, on examination, will be found to arise from the nature of the case, and to proceed on a law, and with a harmony and a definite drift, and with an analogy to scripture revelations, which, instead of telling to their disadvantage, actually constitute an argument in their favor as witnessing to a superintending providence and a great design in the mode and in the circumstances of their occurrence. Perhaps his confidence in the truth and availableness of this view has sometimes led the author to be careless and over-liberal in his concessions to Protestants of historical fact. If this be so anywhere, he begs the reader in such cases to understand him as speaking hypothetically, and in the sense of an argumentum ad hominem, and a fortiori. Nor is such hypothetical reasoning out of place in a publication which is addressed not to theologians, but to those who as yet are not even Catholics, and who, as they read history, would scoff at any defense of Catholic doctrine which did not go the length of covering admissions in matters of fact as broad as those which are here ventured on. In this new edition of the essay, various important alterations have been made in the arrangement of its separate parts, and some, not indeed in its matter, but in its text. February 2nd, 1878 Advertisement to the First Edition Oculi mei defecerunt in salutare tuum. It is now above eleven years since the writer of the following pages, in one of the early numbers of the tracts for the times, expressed himself thus. 
considering the high gifts and the strong claims of the church of rome and her dependencies on our admiration reverence love and gratitude how could we withstand her as we do how could we refrain from being melted into tenderness and rushing into communion with her but for the words of truth which bid us prefer itself to the whole world he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me how could we learn to be severe and execute judgment but for the warning of moses against even a divinely gifted teacher who should preach new gods and the anathema of saint paul even against angels and apostles who should bring in a new doctrine he little thought when he so wrote that the time would ever come when he should feel the obstacle which he spoke of as lying in the way of communion with the church of rome to be destitute of solid foundation the following work is directed towards its removal having in former publications called attention to the supposed difficulty he considers himself bound to avow his present belief that it is imaginary he has neither the ability to put out of hand a finished composition nor the wish to make a powerful and moving representation on the great subject of which he treats his aim will be answered if he succeeds in suggesting thoughts which in god's good time may quietly bear fruit in the minds of those to whom that subject is new and which may carry forward inquirers who have already put themselves on the course if at times his tone appears positive or peremptory he hopes this will be imputed to the scientific character of the work which requires a distinct statement of principles and of the arguments which recommend them he hopes too he shall be excused for his frequent quotations from himself which are necessary in order to show how he stands at present in relation to various of his former publications littlemore october sixth eighteen forty five postscript since the above was written the author has joined the catholic church it was his intention and wish to have carried his volume through the press before deciding finally on this step but when he had got some way in the printing he recognized in himself a conviction of the truth of the conclusion to which the discussion leads so clear as to supersede further deliberation shortly afterwards circumstances gave him the opportunity of acting upon it and he felt that he had no warrant for refusing to do so his first act on his conversion was to offer his work for revision to the proper authorities but the offer was declined on the ground that it was written and partly printed before he was a catholic and that it would come before the reader in a more persuasive form if he read it as the author wrote it it is scarcely necessary to add that he now submits every part of the book to the judgment of the church with whose doctrine on the subjects of which he treats he wishes all his thoughts to be coincident part one doctrinal developments viewed in themselves introduction christianity has been long enough in the world to justify us in dealing with it as a fact in the world's history its genius and character its doctrines precepts and objects cannot be treated as matters of private opinion or deduction unless we may reasonably so regard the spartan institutions or the religion of mahomet it may indeed legitimately be made the subject matter of theories what is its moral and political excellence what its due location in the range of ideas or of facts which we possess whether it be divine or human whether original or eclectic or both at once how far favorable to civilization or to literature whether a religion for all ages or for a particular state of society these are questions upon the fact or professed solutions of the fact and belong to the province of opinion but to a fact they do relate on an admitted fact do they turn which must be ascertained as other facts and surely has on the whole been so ascertained 
unless the testimony of so many centuries is to go for nothing. Christianity is no theory of the study or the cloister. It has long since passed beyond the letter of documents and the reasonings of individual minds, and has become public property. Its sound has gone out into all lands, and its words unto the end of the world. It has from the first had an objective existence, and has thrown itself upon the great concourse of men. Its home is in the world, and to know what it is, we must seek it in the world, and hear the world's witness of it. 2. The hypothesis, indeed, has met with wide reception in these latter times that Christianity does not fall within the province of history, that it is to each man what each man thinks it to be, and nothing else, and thus in fact is a mere name for a cluster or family of rival religions altogether, religions at variance one with another, and claiming the same appellation, not because there can be assigned any one and the same doctrine as the common foundation of all, but because certain points of agreement may be found here and there of some sort or other, by which each in its turn is connected with one or other of the rest. Or again, it has been maintained, or implied, that all existing denominations of Christianity are wrong, none representing it as taught by Christ and his apostles, that the original religion has gradually decayed or become hopelessly corrupt, nay, that it died out of the world at its birth, and was forthwith succeeded by a counterfeit or counterfeits which assumed its name, though they inherited at best but some fragments of its teaching. Or rather, that it cannot even be said either to have decayed or to have died, because historically it has no substance of its own, but from the first and onwards it has, on the stage of the world, been nothing more than a mere assemblage of doctrines and practices derived from without, from Oriental, Platonic, Polytheistic sources, from Buddhism, Essenism, Manichaeism, or that allowing true Christianity still to exist, it has but a hidden and isolated life in the hearts of the elect, or again as a literature or philosophy not certified in any way, much less guaranteed, to come from above, but one out of the various separate informations about the supreme being and human duty with which an unknown providence had furnished us, whether in nature or in the world. 3. All such views of Christianity imply that there is no sufficient body of historical proof to interfere with, or at least to prevail against, any number whatever of free and independent hypotheses concerning it. But this surely is not self-evident, and has itself to be proved. Till positive reasons grounded on facts are adduced to the contrary, the most natural hypotheses, the most agreeable to our mode of proceeding in parallel cases, and that which takes precedence of all others, is to consider that the society of Christians, which the apostles left on earth, were of that religion to which the apostles had converted them, that the external continuity of name, profession, and communion argues a real continuity of doctrine, that as Christianity began by manifesting itself as of a certain shape and bearing to all mankind, therefore it went on so to manifest itself and that the more, considering that prophecy had already determined that it was to be a power visible in the world and sovereign over it, characters which are accurately fulfilled in that historical Christianity to which we commonly give the name. It is not a violent assumption, then, but rather mere abstinence from the wanton admission of a principle which would necessarily lead to the most vexatious and preposterous skepticism to take it for granted, before proof to the contrary, that the Christianity of the 2nd, 4th, 7th, 12th, 16th, and intermediate centuries is in its substance the very religion which Christ and his apostles taught in the first, whatever may be the modifications for good or for evil which lapse of years or the vicissitudes of human affairs have impressed upon it. Of course, I do not deny the abstract possibility of extreme changes. The substitution is certainly, 
in idea, supposable of a counterfeit Christianity, superseding the original by means of the adroit innovations of seasons, places, and persons, till, according to the familiar illustration, the blade and the handle are alternately renewed, and identity is lost without the loss of continuity. It is possible, but it must not be assumed. The onus probandi is with those who assert what it is unnatural to expect. To be just able to doubt is no warrant for disbelieving. 4. Accordingly, some writers have gone on to give reasons from history for their refusing to appeal to history. They aver that, when they come to look into the documents and literature of Christianity in times past, they find its doctrines so variously represented and so inconsistently maintained by its professors that however natural it be a priori, it is useless, in fact, to seek in history the matter of that revelation which has been vouchsafed to mankind, that they cannot be historical Christians if they would. They say, in the words of Chillingworth, There are popes against popes, councils against councils, some fathers against others, the same fathers against themselves, a consent of fathers of one age against a consent of fathers of another age, the church of one age against the church of another age. Hence they are forced, whether they will or not, to fall back upon the Bible as the sole source of revelation, and upon their own personal private judgment as the sole expounder of its doctrine. This is a fair argument, if it can be maintained, and it brings me at once to the subject of this essay. Not that it enters into my purpose to convict of misstatement, as might be done, each separate clause of this sweeping accusation of a smart but superficial writer. But neither, on the other hand, do I mean to deny everything that he says to the disadvantage of historical Christianity. On the contrary, I shall admit that there are in fact certain apparent variations in its teaching which have to be explained. Thus I shall begin, but then I shall attempt to explain them to the exculpation of that teaching in point of unity, directness, and consistency. 5. Meanwhile, before setting about this work, I will address one remark to Chillingworth and his friends. Let them consider that if they can criticize history, the facts of history certainly can retort upon them. It might, I grant, be clearer on this great subject than it is. This is no great concession. History is not a creed or a catechism. It gives lessons rather than rules. Still, no one can mistake its general teaching in this matter, whether he accept it or stumble at it. Bold outlines and broad masses of color rise out of the records of the past. They may be dim, they may be incomplete, but they are definite. And this one thing at least is certain. Whatever history teaches, whatever it omits, whatever it exaggerates or extenuates, whatever it says and unsays, at least the Christianity of history is not Protestantism. If ever there were a safe truth, it is this. And Protestantism has ever felt it so. I do not mean that every writer on the Protestant side has felt it, for it was the fashion at first, at least as a rhetorical argument against Rome, to appeal to past ages or to some of them. But Protestantism as a whole feels it and has felt it. This is shown in the determination already referred to of dispensing with historical Christianity altogether and of forming a Christianity from the Bible alone. Men never would have put it aside unless they had despaired of it. It is shown by the long neglect of ecclesiastical history in England, which prevails even in the English Church. Our popular religion scarcely recognizes the fact of the twelve long ages which lie between the councils of Nicaea and Trent, except as affording one or two passages to illustrate its wild interpretations of certain prophecies of St. Paul and St. John. It is melancholy to say it, but the chief, perhaps the only English writer who has any claim to be considered an ecclesiastical historian, 
is the unbeliever Gibbon. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. 6. And this utter incongruity between Protestantism and historical Christianity is a plain fact, whether the latter be regarded in its earlier or in its later centuries. Protestants can as little bear its anti-Nicene as its post-Tridentine period. I have elsewhere observed on this circumstance. So much must the Protestant grant that if such a system of doctrine as he would now introduce ever existed in early times, it has been clean swept away as if by a deluge, suddenly, silently, and without memorial, by a deluge coming in a night, and utterly soaking, rotting, heaving up, and hurrying off every vestige of what it found in the church before cock-crowing so that, when they rose in the morning, her true seed were all dead corpses, nay, dead and buried, and without gravestone. The waters went over them, there was not one of them left, they sunk like lead in the mighty waters. Strange antitype, indeed, to the early fortunes of Israel. Then the enemy was drowned, and Israel saw them dead upon the seashore. But now it would seem... Water proceeded as a flood out of the serpent's mouth, and covered all the witnesses, so that not even their dead bodies lay in the streets of the great city. Let him take which of his doctrines he will, his peculiar view of self-righteousness, of formality, of superstition, his notion of faith, or of spirituality in religious worship, his denial of the virtue of the sacraments, or of the ministerial commission, or of the visible church or his doctrine of the divine efficacy of the scriptures as the one appointed instrument of religious teaching. And let him consider how far antiquity, as it has come down to us, will countenance him in it. No, he must allow that the alleged deluge has done its work. Yes, and has in turn disappeared itself. It has been swallowed up by the earth, mercilessly as itself was merciless. That Protestantism, then, is not the Christianity of history, it is easy to determine. But to retort is a poor reply in controversy to a question of fact, and whatever be the violence or the exaggeration of writers like Chillingworth, if they have raised a real difficulty, it may claim a real answer, and we must determine whether, on the one hand, Christianity is still to represent to us a definite teaching from above, or whether, on the other, its utterances have been from time to time so strangely at variance that we are necessarily thrown back on our own judgment individually to determine what the revelation of God is, or rather if in fact there is or has been any revelation at all. 7. Here, then, I concede to the opponents of historical Christianity that there are to be found during the 1800 years through which it has lasted certain apparent inconsistencies and alterations in its doctrine and its worship, such as irresistibly attract the attention of all who inquire into it. They are not sufficient to interfere with the general character and course of the religion, but they raise the question how they came about and what they mean, and have in consequence supplied matter for several hypotheses. Of these, one is to the effect that Christianity has even changed from the first, and ever accommodates itself to the circumstances of times and seasons. But it is difficult to understand how such a view is compatible with the special idea of revealed truth, and in fact its advocates more or less abandon, or tend to abandon, the supernatural claims of Christianity. So it need not detain us here. A second and more plausible hypothesis is that of the Anglican divines, who reconcile and bring into shape the exuberant phenomena under consideration by cutting off and casting away as corruptions all usages, ways, opinions, and tenets which have not the sanction of primitive times. They maintain that history first presents to us a pure Christianity in East and West, and then a corrupt and then, of course, their duty is to draw the line between what is corrupt and what is pure, 
and to determine the dates at which the various changes from good to bad were introduced such a principle of demarcation available for the purpose they consider they have found in the dictum of vincent of lerin that revealed and apostolic doctrine is quod semper quod ubique quod ab omnibus a principle infallibly separating on the whole field of history authoritative doctrine from opinion rejecting what is faulty and combining and forming a theology that christianity is what has been held always everywhere and by all certainly promises a solution of the perplexities and interpretation of the meaning of history what can be more natural than that divines and bodies of men should speak sometimes from themselves sometimes from tradition what more natural than that individually they should say many things on impulse or under excitement or as conjectures or in ignorance what more certain than that they must all have been instructed and catechized in the creed of the apostles what more evident than that what was their own would in its degree be peculiar and differ from what was similarly private and personal in their brethren what more conclusive than that the doctrine that was common to all at once was not really their own but public property in which they had a joint interest and was proved by the concurrence of so many witnesses to have come from an apostolical source here then we have a short and easy method for bringing the various informations of ecclesiastical history under that antecedent probability in its favor which nothing but its actual variations would lead us to neglect here we have a precise and satisfactory reason why we should make much of the earlier centuries yet pay no regard to the later why we should admit some doctrines and not others why we refuse the creed of pius the fourth and accept the thirty-nine articles eight such is the rule of historical interpretation which has been professed in the english school of divines and it contains a majestic truth and offers an intelligible principle and wears a reasonable air it is congenial or as it may be said native to the anglican mind which takes up a middle position neither discarding the fathers nor acknowledging the pope it lays down a simple rule by which to measure the value of every historical fact as it comes and thereby it provides a bulwark against rome while it opens an assault upon protestantism such is its promise but its difficulty lies in applying it in particular cases the rule is more serviceable in determining what is not than what is christianity it is irresistible against protestantism and in one sense indeed it is irresistible against rome also but in the same sense it is irresistible against england it strikes at rome through england it admits of being interpreted in one of two ways if it be narrowed for the purpose of disproving the catholicity of the creed of pope pius it becomes also an objection to the athanasian and if it be relaxed to admit the doctrines retained by the english church it no longer excludes certain doctrines of rome which that church denies it cannot at once condemn saint thomas and saint bernard and defend saint athanasius and saint gregory nazianzen this general defect in its serviceableness has been heretofore felt by those who appealed to it it was said by one writer the rule of vincent is not of a mathematical or demonstrative character but moral and requires practical judgment and good sense to apply it for instance what is meant by being taught always does it mean in every century or in every year or in every month does everywhere mean in every country or in every diocese and does the consent of the fathers require us to produce the direct testimony of every one of them how many fathers how many places how many instances constitute a fulfillment of the test proposed it is then from the nature of the case a condition which never can be satisfied as fully as it might have been it admits of various and unequal application in various instances 
and what degree of application is enough, must be decided by the same principles which guide us in the conduct of life, which determine us in politics or trade or war, which lead us to accept revelation at all, for which we have but probability to show it most, nay, to believe in the existence of an intelligent creator. 9. So much was allowed by this writer, but then he added, This character indeed of Vincent's canon will but recommend it to the disciples of the school of Butler from its agreement with the analogy of nature. But it affords a ready loophole for such as do not wish to be persuaded, of which both Protestants and Romanists are not slow to avail themselves. This surely is the language of disputants who are more intent on assailing others than on defending themselves, as if similar loopholes were not necessary for Anglican theology. He elsewhere says, What there is not the shadow of a reason for saying that the fathers held, what has not the faintest pretensions of being a Catholic truth, is this, that St. Peter or his successors were and are universal bishops, that they have the whole of Christendom for their one diocese in a way in which other apostles and bishops had and have not. Most true if, in order that a doctrine be considered Catholic, it must be formally stated by the fathers generally from the very first. But on the same understanding, the doctrine also of the apostolical succession in the Episcopal order has not the faintest pretensions of being a Catholic truth. Nor was this writer without a feeling of the special difficulty of his school, and he attempted to meet it by denying it. He wished to maintain that the sacred doctrines admitted by the Church of England into her articles were taught in primitive times with a distinctness which no one could fancy to attach to the characteristic tenets of Rome. We confidently affirm, he said in another publication, that there is not an article in the Athanasian Creed concerning the Incarnation which is not anticipated in the controversy with the Gnostics. There is no question which the Apollinarian or the Nestorian heresy raised, which may not be decided in the words of Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Tertullian. 10. This may be considered as true. It may be true also, or at least shall here be granted as true, that there is also a consensus in the Antinicene Church for the doctrines of our Lord's consubstantiality and co-eternity with the Almighty Father. Let us allow that the whole circle of doctrines of which our Lord is the subject was consistently and uniformly confessed by the primitive Church, though not ratified formally in Council. But it surely is otherwise with the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. I do not see in what sense it can be said that there is a consensus of primitive divines in its favor which will not avail also for certain doctrines of the Roman Church which will presently come into mention. And this is a point which the writer of the above passages ought to have more distinctly brought before his mind and more carefully weighed. But he seems to have fancied that Bishop Bull proved the primitiveness of the Catholic doctrine concerning the Holy Trinity as well as that concerning our Lord. Now it should be clearly understood what it is which must be shown by those who would prove it. Of course, the doctrine of our Lord's divinity itself partly implies and partly recommends the doctrine of the Trinity. But implication and suggestion belong to another class of arguments, which has not yet come into consideration. Moreover, the statements of a particular father or doctor may certainly be of a most important character, but one divine is not equal to a catena. We must have a whole doctrine stated by a whole church. The Catholic truth in question is made up of a number of separate propositions, each of which, if maintained to the exclusion of the rest, is a heresy. In order then to prove that all the anti-Nicene writers taught the dogma of the Holy Trinity, it is not enough to prove that each still has gone far enough to be only a heretic, not enough to prove that one has held that the Son is God, for so did the Sabellian, 
so did the Macedonian, and another that the father is not the son, for so did the Arian, and another that the son is equal to the father, for so did the Tritheist, and another that there is but one God, for so did the Unitarian. Not enough that many attached in some sense a threefold power to the idea of the Almighty, for so did almost all the heresies that ever existed, and could not but do so if they accepted the New Testament at all. But we must show that all these statements at once, and others too, are laid down by as many separate testimonies as may fairly be taken to constitute a consensus of doctors. It is true, indeed, that the subsequent profession of the doctrine in the universal church creates a presumption that it was held even before it was professed, and it is fair to interpret the early fathers by the later. This is true, and admits of application to certain other doctrines besides that of the Blessed Trinity in unity. But there is as little room for such antecedent probabilities as for the argument from suggestions and intimations in the precise and imperative quod semper, quod ubique, quod ab omnibus, as it is commonly understood by English divines, and is by them used against the later church and the see of Rome. What we have a right to ask, if we are bound to act upon Vincent's rule in regard to the Trinitarian dogma, is a sufficient number of anti-Nicene statements, each distinctly anticipating the Athanasian creed. End of section zero. Section 1 of An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction, Part 2. 11. Now let us look at the leading facts of the case, in appealing to which I must not be supposed to be ascribing any heresy to the holy men whose words have not always been sufficiently full or exact to preclude the imputation. First, the creeds of that early day make no mention in their letter of the Catholic doctrine at all. They make mention indeed of a three, but that there is any mystery in the doctrine, that the three are one, that they are co-equal, co-eternal, all increate, all omnipotent, all incomprehensible, is not stated, and never could be gathered from them. Of course, we believe that they imply it, or rather intend it. God forbid we should do otherwise. But nothing in the mere letter of those documents leads to that belief. To give a deeper meaning to their letter, we must interpret them by the times which came after. Again, there is one and one only great doctrinal council in Antinicene times. It was held at Antioch in the middle of the 3rd century, on occasion of the incipient innovations of the Syrian heretical school. Now the fathers there assembled, for whatever reason, condemned, or at least withdrew when it came into the dispute, the word homoousion, which was afterwards received at Nicaea as the special symbol of Catholicism against Arius. Again, the six great bishops and saints of the Anti-Nicene Church were St. Irenaeus, St. Hippolytus, St. Cyprian, St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, St. Dionysius of Alexandria, and St. Methodius. Of these, St. Dionysius is accused by St. Basil of having sown the first seeds of Arianism, and St. Gregory is allowed by the same learned father to have used language concerning our Lord, which he only defends on the plea of an economical object in the writer. St. Hippolytus speaks as if he were ignorant of our Lord's eternal sonship. St. Methodius speaks incorrectly, at least upon the Incarnation. And St. Cyprian does not treat of theology at all. Such is the incompleteness of the extant teaching of these true saints, and in their day faithful witnesses of the Eternal Son. Again, Athenagoras, St. Clement, Tertullian, and the two saints Dionysii 
would appear to be the only writers whose language is at any time exact and systematic enough to remind us of the Athanasian Creed. If we limit our view of the teaching of the Fathers by what they expressly state, St. Ignatius may be considered as a Patripassian, St. Justin Arianizes, and St. Hippolytus is a Photinian. Again, there are three great theological authors of the Antinicene centuries, Tertullian, Origen, and, we may add, Eusebius, though he lived some way into the fourth. Tertullian is heterodox on the doctrine of our Lord's divinity, and indeed ultimately fell altogether into heresy or schism. Origen is, at the very least, suspected, and must be defended and explained rather than cited as a witness of orthodoxy. And Eusebius was a semi-Arian. 12. Moreover, it may be questioned whether any anti-Nicene father distinctly affirms either the numerical unity or the co-equality of the three persons, except perhaps the heterodox Tertullian, and that chiefly in a work written after he had become a Montanist. Yet, to satisfy the anti-Roman use of quod semper, etc., surely we ought not to be left for these great articles of doctrine to the testimony of a later age. Further, Bishop Bull allows that nearly all the ancient Catholics who preceded Arius have the appearance of being ignorant of the invisible and incomprehensible, immensum, nature of the Son of God, an article expressly taught in the Athanasian Creed under the sanction of its anathema. It must be asked, moreover, how much direct and literal testimony the Antinicene Fathers give, one by one, to the divinity of the Holy Spirit. This alone shall be observed, that St. Basil, in the fourth century, finding that if he distinctly called the third person in the Blessed Trinity by the name of God, he should be put out of the church by the Arians, pointedly refrained from doing so on an occasion on which his enemies were on the watch, and that when some Catholics found fault with him, St. Athanasius took his part. Could this possibly have been the conduct of any true Christian, not to say saint, of a later age? That is, whatever be the true account of it, does it not suggest to us that the testimony of those early times lies very unfavorably for the application of the rule of Vincentius? 13. Let it not be for a moment supposed that I impugn the orthodoxy of the early divines, or the cogency of their testimony among fair inquirers, but I am trying them by that unfair interpretation of Vincentius, which is necessary in order to make him available against the Church of Rome. And now, as to the positive evidence which those fathers offer in behalf of the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity, it has been drawn out by Dr. Burton, and seems to fall under two heads. One is the general ascription of glory to the three persons together, both by fathers and churches, and that on continuous tradition and from the earliest times. Under the second fall certain distinct statements of particular fathers. Thus we find the word Trinity used by St. Theophilus, St. Clement, St. Hippolytus, Tertullian, St. Cyprian, Origen, St. Methodius, and the divine Circum Incesio, the most distinctive portion of the Catholic doctrine, and the unity of power or again of substance, are declared with more or less distinctness by Athenagoras, St. Irenaeus, St. Clement, Tertullian, St. Hippolytus, Origen, and the two saints Dionysii. This is pretty much the whole of the evidence. 14. Perhaps it will be said we ought to take the Anti-Nicene Fathers as a whole and interpret one of them by another. This is to assume that they are all of one school, which of course they are, but which in controversy is a point to be proved. But it is even doubtful whether, on the whole, such a procedure would strengthen the argument. For instance, as to the second head of the positive evidence noted by Dr. Burton, 
Tertullian is the most formal and elaborate of these fathers in his statements of the Catholic doctrine. It would hardly be possible, says Dr. Burton, after quoting a passage, for Athanasius himself, or the compiler of the Athanasian Creed, to have delivered the doctrine of the Trinity in stronger terms than these. Yet Tertullian must be considered heterodox on the doctrine of our Lord's eternal generation. If then we are to argue from his instance to that of the other fathers, we shall be driven to the conclusion that even the most exact statements are worth nothing more than their letter, are a warrant for nothing beyond themselves, and are consistent with heterodoxy where they do not expressly protest against it. And again, as to the argument derivable from the doxologies, it must not be forgotten that one of the passages in St. Justin Martyr includes the worship of the angels. We worship and adore, he says, him and the Son who came from him and taught us these things, and the host of those other good angels who follow and are like him and the prophetic spirit. A Unitarian might argue from this passage that the glory and worship which the early church ascribed to our Lord was not more definite than that which St. Justin was ready to concede to creatures. 15. Thus much on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Let us proceed to another example. There are two doctrines which are generally associated with the name of a father of the 4th and 5th centuries and which can show little definite, or at least but partial, testimony in their behalf before his time, purgatory and original sin. The dictum of Vincent admits both, or excludes both, according as it is or is not rigidly taken. But if used by Aristotle's lesbian rule, then as Anglicans would wish, it can be made to admit original sin and exclude purgatory. On the one hand, some notion of suffering or disadvantage or punishment after this life in the case of the faithful departed or other vague forms of the doctrine of purgatory has in its favor almost a consensus of the four first ages of the Church, though some fathers stated with far greater openness and decision than others. It is, as far as words go, the confession of St. Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, St. Perpetua, St. Cyprian, Origen, Lactantius, St. Hilary, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Ambrose, St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nazianzus and of Nyssa, St. Chrysostom, St. Jerome, St. Paulinus, and St. Augustine. And so, on the other hand, there is a certain agreement of fathers from the first that mankind has derived some disadvantage from the sin of Adam. 16. Next, when we consider the two doctrines more distinctly, the doctrine that between death and judgment there is a time or state of punishment, and the doctrine that all men, naturally propagated from fallen Adam, are in consequence born destitute of original righteousness, we find on the one hand several, such as Tertullian, St. Perpetua, St. Cyril, St. Hilary, St. Jerome, St. Gregory Nissen, as far as their words go, definitely declaring a doctrine of purgatory, whereas no one will say that there is a testimony of the fathers equally strong for the doctrine of original sin, though it is difficult here to make any definite statement about their teaching without going into a discussion of the subject. On the subject of purgatory, there were, to speak generally, two schools of opinion, the Greek, which contemplated a trial of fire at the last day through which all were to pass, and the African, resembling more nearly the present doctrine of the Roman Church. And so there were two principal views of original sin, the Greek and the African or Latin. Of the Greek, the judgment of Hooker is well known, though it must not be taken in the letter. Quote, the heresy of free will was a millstone about those Pelagians' neck. Shall we therefore give sentence of death inevitable against all those fathers in the Greek church which, being mispersuaded, died in the air of free will? End quote. Bishop Taylor, arguing for an opposite doctrine, bears a like testimony. Original sin, he says, 
as it is at this day commonly explicated, was not the doctrine of the primitive church. But when Pelagius had puddled the stream, St. Austin was so angry that he stamped and disturbed it more. And truly, I do not think that the gentlemen that urged against me St. Austin's opinion do well consider that I profess myself to follow those fathers who were before him, and whom St. Austin did forsake, as I do him, in the question. The same is asserted or allowed by Jansenius, Petavius, and Valch, men of such different schools, that we may surely take their agreement as a proof of the fact. A late writer, after going through the testimonies of the fathers one by one, comes to the conclusion first that the Greek church in no point favored Augustine, except in teaching that from Adam's sin came death, and, after the time of Methodius, an extraordinary and unnatural sensuality also. Next, that the Latin church affirmed, in addition, that a corrupt and contaminated soul and that by generation was carried on to his posterity and lastly that neither greeks nor latins held the doctrine of imputation it may be observed in addition that in spite of the forcible teaching of saint paul on the subject the doctrine of original sin appears neither in the apostles nor the nicene creed seventeen one additional specimen shall be given as a sample of many others. I betake myself to one of our altars to receive the blessed Eucharist. I have no doubt whatever on my mind about the gift which that sacrament contains. I confess to myself my belief, and I go through the steps on which it is assured to me. Quote, the presence of Christ is here, for it follows upon consecration and consecration is the prerogative of priests, and priests are made by ordination, and ordination comes in direct line from the apostles. Whatever be our other misfortunes, every link in our chain is safe. We have the apostolic succession, we have a right form of consecration, therefore we are blessed with the great gift. End quote. Here the question rises in me. Who told you about that gift? I answer, I have learned it from the fathers. I believe the real presence because they bear witness to it. St. Ignatius calls it the medicine of immortality. St. Irenaeus says that our flesh becomes incorrupt and partakes of life and has the hope of the resurrection as being nourished from the Lord's body and blood, that the Eucharist is made up of two things, an earthly and an heavenly. Perhaps Origen, and perhaps Magnus, after him, say that it is not a type of our Lord's body, but his body. And St. Cyprian uses language as fearful as can be spoken of those who profane it. I cast my lot with them, I believe as they. Thus I reply, and then the thought comes upon me a second time. And do not the same ancient fathers bear witness to another doctrine which you disown? Are you not as a hypocrite, listening to them when you will and deaf when you will not? How are you casting your lot with the saints when you go but halfway with them? For of whether of the two do they speak the more frequently? Of the real presence in the Eucharist? Or of the Pope's supremacy? You accept the lesser evidence, you reject the greater. 18. In truth, scanty as the anti-Nicene notices may be of the papal supremacy, they are both more numerous and more definite than the adducible testimonies in favor of the real presence. The testimonies to the latter are confined to a few passages, such as those just quoted. On the other hand, of a passage in St. Justin, Bishop K. remarks, le Nourri infers that Justin maintained the doctrine of transubstantiation. It might, in my opinion, be more plausibly urged in favor of consubstantiation, since Justin calls the consecrated elements bread and wine, though not common bread and wine. We may therefore conclude that when he calls them the body and blood of Christ, he speaks figuratively. Clement, observes the same author, 
says that the scripture calls wine a mystic symbol of the holy blood. Clement gives various interpretations of Christ's expressions in John 6 respecting his flesh and blood, but in no instance does he interpret them literally. His notion seems to have been that, by partaking of the bread and wine in the Eucharist, the soul of the believer is united to the Spirit, and that by this union the principle of immortality is imparted to the flesh. It has been suggested by some, says Waterland, that Tertullian understood John VI merely of faith or doctrine or spiritual actions, and it is strenuously denied by others. After quoting the passage, he adds, All that one can justly gather from this confused passage is that Tertullian interpreted the bread of life in John VI of the word which he sometimes makes to be vocal and sometimes substantial, blending the ideas in a very perplexed manner, so that he is no clear authority for construing John VI of doctrines, etc. All that is certain is that he supposes the word made flesh, the word incarnate, to be the heavenly bread spoken of in that chapter. Origen's general observation relating to that chapter is that it must not be literally, but figuratively understood. Again, it is plain enough that Eusebius followed Origen in this matter, and that both of them favored the same mystical or allegorical construction, whether constantly and uniformly, I need not say. I will but add the incidental testimony afforded on a late occasion. How far the Anglican doctrine of the Eucharist depends on the times before the Nicene Council, how far on the times after it, may be gathered from the circumstance that, when a memorable sermon was published on the subject, out of about 140 passages from the Fathers appended in the notes, not in formal proof but in general illustration, only 15 were taken from anti-Nicene writers. With such evidence, the anti-Nicene testimonies which may be cited in behalf of the authority of the Holy See need not fear a comparison. Faint they may be one by one, but at least we may count seventeen of them, and they are various, and are drawn from many times and countries, and thereby serve to illustrate each other, and form a body of proof. Whatever objections may be made to this or that particular fact, and I do not think any valid ones can be raised, still, on the whole, I consider that a cumulative argument rises from them in favor of the ecumenical and the doctrinal authority of Rome stronger than any argument which can be drawn from the same period for the doctrine of the real presence. I shall have occasion to enumerate them in the fourth chapter of this essay. 19. If it be said that the real presence appears by the liturgies of the 4th or 5th century to have been the doctrine of the earlier, since those very forms probably existed from the first in divine worship, this is doubtless an important truth. But then it is true also that the writers of the 4th and 5th centuries fearlessly assert or frankly allow that the prerogatives of Rome were derived from apostolic times and that because it was the see of St. Peter. Moreover, if the resistance of St. Cyprian and Firmilian to the Church of Rome in the question of baptism by heretics be urged as an argument against her primitive authority, or the earlier resistance of Polycrates of Ephesus, let it be considered first whether all authority does not necessarily lead to resistance. Next, whether St. Cyprian's own doctrine, which is in favor of Rome, is not more weighty than his act, which is against her. Thirdly, whether he was not already in error in the main question under discussion, and Firmilian also. And lastly, which is the chief point here, whether in like manner we may not object on the other hand against the real presence, the words of Tertullian, who explains, This is my body, by a figure of my body, and of Origen, who speaks of our drinking Christ's blood not only in the rite of the sacraments, but also when we receive his discourses, and says that that bread which God the Word acknowledges as his body is the Word which nourishes souls. 
passages which admit of a Catholic interpretation when the Catholic doctrine is once proved, but which prima facie run counter to that doctrine. It does not seem possible, then, to avoid the conclusion that, whatever be the proper key for harmonizing the records and documents of the early and later Church, and true as the dictum of Vincentius must be considered in the abstract, and possible as its application might be in his own age when he might almost ask the primitive centuries for their testimony, it is hardly available now or effective of any satisfactory result. The solution it offers is as difficult as the original problem. 20. Another hypothesis for accounting for a want of accord between the early and the late aspects of Christianity is that of the Disciplina Arcani, put forward on the assumption that there has been no variation in the teaching of the Church from first to last. It is maintained that doctrines which are associated with the later ages of the Church were really in the Church from the first, but not publicly taught, and that for various reasons, as for the sake of reverence, that sacred subjects might not be profaned by the heathen, and for the sake of catechumens, that they might not be oppressed or carried away by a sudden communication of the whole circle of revealed truth. And indeed, the fact of this concealment can hardly be denied, in whatever degree it took the shape of a definite rule which might vary with persons and places. That it existed even as a rule, as regards the sacraments, seems to be confessed on all hands that it existed in other respects as a practice is plain from the nature of the case and from the writings of the apologists minutius felix and arnobius in controversy with pagans imply a denial that then the christians used altars yet tertullian speaks expressly of the ara dei in the church what can we say but that the apologists deny altars in the sense in which they ridicule them or that they deny that altars such as the pagan altars were tolerated by Christians. And in like manner, Minucius allows that there were no temples among Christians, yet they are distinctly recognized in the edicts of the Diocletian era and are known to have existed at a still earlier date. It is the tendency of every dominant system, such as the paganism of the Antinicene centuries, to force its opponents into the most hostile and jealous attitude from the apprehension which they naturally feel, lest if they acted otherwise, in those points in which they approximate towards it, they should be misinterpreted and overborne by its authority. The very fault now found with clergymen of the Anglican Church, who wish to conform their practices to her rubrics, and their doctrines to her divines of the seventeenth century, is that, whether they mean it or no, whether legitimately or no, still, in matter of fact, they will be sanctioning and encouraging the religion of Rome, in which there are similar doctrines and practices, more definite and more influential, so that, at any rate, it is inexpedient at the moment to attempt what is sure to be mistaken. That is, they are required to exercise a disciplina arcani, and a similar reserve was inevitable on the part of the Catholic Church at a time when priests and altars and rites all around it were devoted to malignant and incurable superstitions. It would be wrong indeed to deny, but it was a duty to withhold the ceremonial of Christianity, and apologists might be sometimes tempted to deny absolutely what at furthest could only be denied under conditions. An idolatrous paganism tended to repress the externals of Christianity, as at this day the presence of Protestantism is said to repress, though for another reason, the exhibition of the Roman Catholic religion. On various grounds, then, it is certain that portions of the Church system were held back in primitive times, and of course, this fact goes some way to account for that apparent variation and growth of doctrine which embarrasses us when we would consult history for the true idea of Christianity. Yet it is no key to the whole difficulty as we find it, for obvious reasons. 
because the variations continue beyond the time when it is conceivable that the discipline was in force, and because they manifest themselves on a law, not abruptly, but by a visible growth, which has persevered up to this time without any sign of its coming to an end. 21. The following essay is directed towards a solution of the difficulty which has been stated. The difficulty as far as it exists, which lies in the way of our using in controversy the testimony of our most natural informant concerning the doctrine and worship of Christianity, videlicet, the history of 1800 years. The view on which it is written has at all times, perhaps, been implicitly adopted by theologians, and, I believe, has recently been illustrated by several distinguished writers of the continent, such as de Maitre and Möller. Videlicet, that the increase and expansion of the Christian creed and ritual, and the variations which have attended the process in the case of individual writers and churches, are the necessary attendants on any philosophy or polity which takes possession of the intellect and heart, and has had any wide or extended dominion. That, from the nature of the human mind, time is necessary for the full comprehension and perfection of great ideas and that the highest and most wonderful truths, though communicated to the world once for all by inspired teachers, could not be comprehended all at once by their recipients, but as being received and transmitted by minds not inspired, and through media which were human, have required only the longer time and deeper thought for their full elucidation. This may be called the theory of development of doctrine and before proceeding to treat of it, one remark may be in place. It is undoubtedly an hypothesis to account for a difficulty, but such too are the various explanations given by astronomers from Ptolemy to Newton of the apparent motions of the heavenly bodies, and it is as unphilosophical on that account to object to the one as to object to the other. Nor is it more reasonable to express surprise that, at this time of day, a theory is necessary, granting for argument's sake that the theory is novel, than to have directed a similar wonder in disparagement of the theory of gravitation, or the Plutonian theory in geology. Doubtless the theory of the secret and the theory of doctrinal developments are expedients, and so is the dictum of Vincentius, so is the art of grammar or the use of the quadrant, it is an expedient to enable us to solve what has now become a necessary and an anxious problem. For three hundred years the documents and the facts of Christianity have been exposed to a jealous scrutiny. Works have been judged spurious, which once were received without a question. Facts have been discarded or modified, which were once first principles in argument. New facts and new principles have been brought to light philosophical views and polemical discussions of various tendencies have been maintained with more or less success. Not only has the relative situation of controversies and theologies altered, but infidelity itself is in a different, I am obliged to say in a more hopeful position, as regards Christianity. The facts of revealed religion, though in their substance unaltered, present a less compact and orderly front to the attacks of its enemies now than formerly, and allow of the introduction of new inquiries and theories concerning its sources and its rise. The state of things is not as it was, when an appeal lay to the supposed works of the Areopagite, or to the primitive decretals, or to St. Dionysius's answers to Paul, or to the Cena Domini of St. Cyprian. The assailants of dogmatic truth have got the start of its adherence of whatever creed. Philosophy is completing what criticism has begun, and apprehensions are not unreasonably excited lest we should have a new world to conquer before we have weapons for the warfare. Already infidelity has its views and conjectures on which it arranges the facts of ecclesiastical history, and it is sure to consider the absence of any antagonist theory as an evidence of the reality of its own. 
that the hypothesis here to be adopted accounts not only for the athanasian creed but for the creed of pope pius is no fault of those who adopt it no one has power over the issues of his principles we cannot manage our argument and have as much of it as we please and no more an argument is needed unless christianity is to abandon the province of argument and those who find fault with the explanation here offered of its historical phenomena will find it their duty to provide one for themselves and as no special aim at roman catholic doctrine need be supposed to have given a direction to the inquiry so neither can a reception of that doctrine be immediately based on its results it would be the work of a life to apply the theory of developments so carefully to the writings of the fathers and to the history of controversies and councils as thereby to vindicate the reasonableness of every decision of rome much less can such an undertaking be imagined by one who in the middle of his days is beginning life again thus much however might be gained even from an essay like the present an explanation of so many of the reputed corruptions doctrinal and practical of rome as might serve as a fair ground for trusting her in parallel cases where the investigation had not been pursued end of section one section two of an essay on the development of christian doctrine by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one on the development of ideas section one on the process of development in ideas it is the characteristic of our minds to be ever engaged in passing judgment on the things which come before us no sooner do we apprehend than we judge we allow nothing to stand by itself we compare contrast abstract generalize connect adjust classify and we view all our knowledge in the associations with which these processes have invested it of the judgments thus made which become aspects in our minds of the things which meet us some are mere opinions which come and go or which remain with us only till an accident displaces them whatever be the influence which they exercise meanwhile others are firmly fixed in our minds with or without good reason and have a hold upon us whether they relate to matters of fact or to principles of conduct or our views of life and the world or our prejudices imaginations or convictions many of them attach to one and the same object which is thus variously viewed not only by various minds but by the same they sometimes lie in such near relation that each implies the others some are only not inconsistent with each other in that they have a common origin some as being actually incompatible with each other are one or other falsely associated in our minds with their object and in any case they may be nothing more than ideas which we mistake for things thus judaism is an idea which once was objective and gnosticism is an idea which was never so both of them have various aspects those of judaism were such as monotheism a certain ethical discipline a ministration of divine vengeance a preparation for christianity those of the gnostic idea are such as the doctrine of two principles that of emanation the intrinsic malignity of matter the inculpability of sensual indulgence or the guilt of every pleasure of sense of which last two one or other must be in the gnostic a false aspect and subjective only two the idea which represents an object or supposed object is commensurate with the sum total of its possible aspects however they may vary in the separate consciousness of individuals 
and in proportion to the variety of aspects under which it presents itself to various minds is its force and depth and the argument for its reality ordinarily an idea is not brought home to the intellect as objective except through this variety like bodily substances which are not apprehended except under the clothing of their properties and results and which admit of being walked round and surveyed on opposite sides and in different perspectives and in contrary lights in evidence of their reality and as views of a material object may be taken from points so remote or so opposed that they seem at first sight incompatible and especially as their shadows will be disproportionate or even monstrous and yet all these anomalies will disappear and all these contrarieties be adjusted on ascertaining the point of vision or the surface of projection in each case so also all the aspects of an idea are capable of coalition and of a resolution into the object to which it belongs and the prima facie dissimilitude of its aspects becomes when explained an argument for its substantiveness and integrity and their multiplicity for its originality and power three there is no one aspect deep enough to exhaust the contents of a real idea no one term or proposition which will serve to define it though of course one representation of it is more just and exact than another and though when an idea is very complex it is allowable for the sake of convenience to consider its distinct aspects as if separate ideas thus with all our intimate knowledge of animal life and of the structure of particular animals we have not arrived at a true definition of any one of them but are forced to enumerate properties and accidents by way of description nor can we enclose in a formula that intellectual fact or system of thought which we call the platonic philosophy or that historical phenomenon of doctrine and conduct which we call the heresy of montanus or of manis again if protestantism were said to lie in its theory of private judgment and lutheranism in its doctrine of justification this indeed would be an approximation to the truth but it is plain that to argue or to act as if the one or the other aspect were a sufficient account of those forms of religion severally would be a serious mistake sometimes an attempt is made to determine the leading idea as it has been called of christianity an ambitious essay as employed on a supernatural work when even as regards the visible creation and the inventions of man such a task is beyond us thus its one idea has been said by some to be the restoration of our fallen race by others philanthropy by others the tidings of immortality or the spirituality of true religious service or the salvation of the elect or mental liberty or the union of the soul with god if indeed it is only thereby meant to use one or other of these as a central idea for convenience in order to group others around it no fault can be found with such a proceeding and in this sense i should myself call the incarnation the central aspect of christianity out of which the three main aspects of its teaching take their rise the sacramental the hierarchical and the ascetic but one aspect of revelation must not be allowed to exclude or to obscure another and christianity is dogmatical devotional practical all at once it is esoteric and exoteric it is indulgent and strict it is light and dark it is love and it is fear four when an idea whether real or not is of a nature to arrest and possess the mind it may be said to have life that is to live in the mind which is its recipient thus mathematical ideas real as they are 
can hardly properly be called living, at least ordinarily. But when some great enunciation, whether true or false, about human nature, or present good, or government, or duty, or religion, is carried forward into the public throng of men, and draws attention, then it is not merely received passively in this or that form into many minds, but it becomes an active principle within them, leading them to an ever new contemplation of itself, to an application of it in various directions, and a propagation of it on every side. Such is the doctrine of the divine right of kings, or of the rights of man, or of the anti-social bearings of a priesthood, or utilitarianism, or free trade, or the duty of benevolent enterprises, or the philosophy of Zeno or Epicurus, doctrines which are of a nature to attract and influence, and have so far a prima facie reality that they may be looked at on many sides, and strike various minds very variously. Let one such idea get possession of the popular mind, or the mind of any portion of the community, and it is not difficult to understand what will be the result. At first, men will not fully realize what it is that moves them, and will express and explain themselves inadequately. There will be a general agitation of thought and an action of mind upon mind. There will be a time of confusion when conceptions and misconceptions are in conflict, and it is uncertain whether anything is to come of the idea at all, or which view of it is to get the start of the others. New lights will be brought to bear upon the original statements of the doctrine put forward. Judgments and aspects will accumulate. After a while, some definite teaching emerges, and as time proceeds, one view will be modified or expanded by another, and then combined with a third, till the idea to which these various aspects belong will be to each mind separately what at first it was only to all together. It will be surveyed, too, in its relation to other doctrines or facts, to other natural laws or established customs, to the varying circumstances of times and places, to other religions, polities, philosophies, as the case may be. How it stands affected towards other systems how it affects them, how far it may be made to combine with them, how far it tolerates them when it interferes with them, will be gradually wrought out. It will be interrogated and criticized by enemies, and defended by well-wishers. The multitude of opinions formed concerning it in these respects, and many others, will be collected, compared, sorted, sifted, selected, rejected, gradually attached to it, separated from it, in the minds of individuals and of the community. It will, in proportion to its native vigor and subtlety, introduce itself into the framework and details of social life, changing public opinion, and strengthening or undermining the foundations of established order. Thus, in time, it will have grown into an ethical code, or into a system of government, or into a theology, or into a ritual according to its capabilities, and this body of thought, thus laboriously gained, will after all be little more than the proper representative of one idea, being in substance what that idea meant from the first, its complete image as seen in a combination of diversified aspects with the suggestions and corrections of many minds, and the illustration of many experiences. 5. This process, whether it be longer or shorter in point of time, by which the aspects of an idea are brought into consistency and form, I call its development, being the germination and maturation of some truth or apparent truth on a large mental field. On the other hand, this process will not be a development unless the assemblage of aspects which constitute its ultimate shape, really belongs to the idea from which they start. A republic, for instance, is not a development from a pure monarchy, though it may follow upon it, whereas the Greek tyrant may be considered as included in the idea of a democracy. 
Moreover, a development will have this characteristic, that its action being in the busy scene of human life, it cannot progress at all without cutting across and thereby destroying or modifying and incorporating with itself existing modes of thinking and operating. The development, then, of an idea is not like an investigation worked out on paper, in which each successive advance is a pure evolution from a foregoing, but it is carried on through and by means of communities of men and their leaders and guides, and it employs their minds as its instruments, and depends upon them while it uses them. And so, as regards existing opinions, principles, measures, and institutions of the community which it has invaded, it develops by establishing relations between itself and them. It employs itself in giving them a new meaning and direction, in creating what may be called a jurisdiction over them, in throwing off whatever in them it cannot assimilate. It grows when it incorporates, and its identity is found, not in isolation, but in continuity and sovereignty. This it is that imparts to the history both of states and of religions its specially turbulent and polemical character. Such is the explanation of the wranglings, whether of schools or of parliaments. It is the warfare of ideas, under their various aspects, striving for the mastery, each of them enterprising, engrossing, imperious, more or less incompatible with the rest, and rallying followers or rousing foes, according as it acts upon the faith, the prejudices, or the interest of parties or classes. 6. Moreover, an idea not only modifies, but is modified, or at least influenced, by the state of things in which it is carried out, and is dependent in various ways on the circumstances which surround it. Its development proceeds quickly or slowly as it may be. The order of succession in its separate stages is variable. It shows differently in a small sphere of action and in an extended. It may be interrupted, retarded, mutilated, distorted by external violence. It may be enfeebled by the effort of ridding itself of domestic foes. It may be impeded and swayed or even absorbed by counter-energetic ideas. It may be colored by the received tone of thought into which it comes, or depraved by the intrusion of foreign principles, or at length shattered by the development of some original fault within it. 7. But whatever be the risk of corruption from intercourse with the world around, such a risk must be encountered if a great idea is duly to be understood, and much more if it is to be fully exhibited. It is elicited and expanded by trial and battles into perfection and supremacy. Nor does it escape the collision of opinion even in its earlier years, nor does it remain truer to itself and with a better claim to be considered one and the same, though externally protected from vicissitude and change. It is indeed sometimes said that the stream is clearest near the spring. Whatever use may fairly be made of this image, it does not apply to the history of a philosophy or belief, which on the contrary is more equable and purer and stronger when its bed has become deep and broad and full. It necessarily rises out of an existing state of things and for a time savors of the soil. Its vital element needs disengaging from what is foreign and temporary, and is employed in efforts after freedom, which become more vigorous and hopeful as its years increase. Its beginnings are no measure of its capabilities, nor of its scope. At first, no one knows what it is, or what it is worth. It remains perhaps for a time quiescent. It tries, as it were, its limbs, and proves the ground under it, and feels its way. From time to time it makes essays which fail, and are in consequence abandoned. It seems in suspense which way to go, it wavers, and at length strikes out in one definite direction. 
in time it enters upon strange territory points of controversy alter their bearing parties rise and fall around it dangers and hopes appear in new relations and old principles reappear under new forms it changes with them in order to remain the same in a higher world it is otherwise but here below to live is to change and to be perfect is to have changed often section two on the kinds of development in ideas to attempt an accurate analysis or complete enumeration of the processes of thought whether speculative or practical which come under the notion of development exceeds the pretensions of an essay like the present but without some general view of the various mental exercises which go by the name we shall have no security against confusion in our reasoning and necessary exposure to criticism item one first then it must be borne in mind that the word is commonly used and is used here in three senses indiscriminately from defect of our language on the one hand for the process of development on the other for the result and again either generally for a development true or not true that is faithful or unfaithful to the idea from which it started or exclusively for a development deserving the name a false or unfaithful development is more properly to be called a corruption item two next it is plain that mathematical developments that is the system of truths drawn out from mathematical definitions or equations do not fall under our present subject though altogether analogous to it there can be no corruption in such developments because they are conducted on strict demonstration and the conclusions in which they terminate being necessary cannot be declensions from the original idea item three nor of course do physical developments as the growth of animal or vegetable nature come into consideration here excepting that together with mathematical they may be taken as illustrations of the general subject to which we have to direct our attention item four nor have we to consider material developments which though effected by human contrivance are still physical as the development as it is called of the national resources we speak for instance of ireland the united states or the valley of the indus as admitting of a great development by which we mean that those countries have fertile tracts or abundant products or broad and deep rivers or central positions for commerce or capacious and commodious harbors the materials and instruments of wealth and these at present turned to insufficient account development in this case will proceed by establishing marts cutting canals laying down railroads erecting factories forming docks and similar works by which the natural riches of the country may be made to yield the largest return and to exert the greatest influence in this sense art is the development of nature that is its adaptation to the purposes of utility and beauty the human intellect being the developing power two item five when society and its various classes and interests are the subject matter of the ideas which are in operation the development may be called political as we see it in the growth of states or the changes of a constitution barbarians descend into southern regions from cupidity and their warrant is the sword this is no intellectual process nor is it the mode of development exhibited in civilized communities where civilization exists reason in some shape or other is the incentive or the pretense of development when an empire enlarges it is on the call of its allies or for the balance of power or from the necessity of a demonstration of strength or from a fear for its frontiers it lies uneasily in its territory it is ill-shaped it has unreal boundary lines deficient communication between its principal points or defenseless or turbulent neighbors thus of old time 
Euboea was necessary for Athens, and Scythera for Sparta, and Augustus left his advice as a legacy to confine the empire between the Atlantic, the Rhine, and Danube, the Euphrates, and the Arabian and African deserts. In this day we hear of the Rhine being the natural boundary of France, and the Indus of our Eastern Empire, and we predict that, in the event of a war, Prussia will change her outlines in the map of Europe. The development is material, but an idea gives unity and force to its movement. And so, to take a case of national politics, a late writer remarks of the Parliament of 1628-29 to in its contest with Charles, that, so far from encroaching on the just powers of a limited monarch, it never hinted at the securities which were necessary for its measures. However, quote, twelve years more of repeated aggressions, he adds, taught the long Parliament what a few sagacious men might perhaps have already suspected, that they must recover more of their ancient constitution from oblivion, that they must sustain its partial weakness by new securities, that, in order to render the existence of monarchy compatible with that of freedom, they must not only strip it of all it had usurped, but of something that was its own. End quote. Whatever be the worth of this author's theory, his facts or representations are an illustration of a political development. Again, at the present day, that Ireland should have a population of one creed and a church of another is felt to be a political arrangement so unsatisfactory that all parties seem to agree that either the population will develop in power or the establishment in influence. Political developments, though really the growth of ideas, are often capricious and irregular from the nature of their subject matter. They are influenced by the character of sovereigns, the rise and fall of statesmen, the fate of battles, and the numberless vicissitudes of the world. Quote, Perhaps the Greeks would be still involved in the heresy of the Monophysites, says Gibbon, if the emperor's horse had not fortunately stumbled. Theodosius expired. His orthodox sister succeeded to the throne. End quote. 3. Again, it often happens, or generally, that various distinct and incompatible elements are found in the origin or infancy of politics, or indeed of philosophies, some of which must be ejected before any satisfactory developments, if any, can take place. And they are commonly ejected by the gradual growth of the stronger. The reign of Charles I, just referred to, supplies an instance in point. Sometimes discordant ideas are for a time connected and concealed by a common profession or name. Such is the case of coalitions in politics and comprehensions in religion, of which commonly no good is to be expected. Such is an ordinary function of committees and boards, and the sole aim of conciliations and concessions, to make contraries look the same, and to secure an outward agreement where there is no other unity. Again, developments, reactions, reforms, revolutions, and changes of various kinds are mixed together in the actual history of states as of philosophical sects, so as to make it very difficult to exhibit them in any scientific analysis. Often the intellectual process is detached from the practical, and posterior to it. Thus it was, after Elizabeth had established the Reformation, that Hooker laid down his theory of church and state as one and the same, differing only in idea and after the revolution and its political consequences that Warburton wrote his alliance. And now again a new theory is needed for the constitutional lawyer in order to reconcile the existing political state of things with the just claims of religion. And so again, in parliamentary conflicts, men first come to their conclusions by the external pressure of events or the force of principles they do not know how. Then they have to speak, 
and they look about for arguments, and a pamphlet is published on the subject in debate, or an article appears in a review, to furnish commonplaces for the many. Other developments, though political, are strictly subjected and consequent to the ideas of which they are the exhibitions. Thus, Locke's philosophy was a real guide, not a mere defense of the Revolution era, operating forcibly upon church and government in and after his day. Such, too, were the theories which preceded the overthrow of the old regime in France and other countries at the end of the last century. Again, perhaps there are polities founded on no ideas at all, but on mere custom, as among the Asiatics. 4. Item 6. In other developments, the intellectual character is so prominent that they may even be called logical, as in the Anglican doctrine of the royal supremacy, which has been created in the courts of law, not in the cabinet or on the field. Hence, it is carried out with a consistency and minute application which the history of constitutions cannot exhibit. It does not only exist in statutes or in articles or in oaths, it is realized in details, as in the congé d'élire and letter missive on appointment of a bishop, in the forms observed in privy council on the issuing of state prayers, in certain arrangements observed in the prayer book, where the universal or abstract church precedes the king, but the national or really existing body follows him, imprinting his name in large capitals, while the holiest names are in ordinary type, and in fixing his arms in churches instead of the crucifix, moreover perhaps in placing sedition, privy conspiracy, and rebellion before false doctrine, heresy, and schism in the litany. Again, when some new philosophy or its installments are introduced into the measures of the legislature, or into the concessions made to a political party, or into commercial or agricultural policy, it is often said, we have not seen the end of this, it is an earnest of future concessions. Our children will see. We feel that it has unknown bearings and issues. The admission of Jews to municipal offices has lately been defended on the ground that it is the introduction of no new principle, but a development of one already received, that its great premises have been decided long since, and that the present age has but to draw the conclusion, that it is not open to us to inquire what ought to be done in the abstract, since there is no ideal model for the infallible guidance of nations, that change is only a question of time, and that there is a time for all things, that the application of principles ought not to go beyond the actual case, neither preceding nor coming after an imperative demand, that, in point of fact, Jews have lately been chosen for offices, and that in point of principle, the law cannot refuse to legitimate such elections. 5. Item 7. Another class of developments may be called historical, being the gradual formation of opinion concerning persons, facts, and events. Judgments, which were at one time confined to a few, at length spread through a community, and attain general reception by the accumulation and concurrence of testimony. Thus, some authoritative accounts die away, others gain a footing, and are ultimately received as truths. Courts of law, parliamentary proceedings, newspapers, letters, and other posthumous documents, the industry of historians and biographers, and the lapse of years, which dissipates parties and prejudices, are in this day the instruments of such development. Accordingly, the poet makes truth the daughter of time. Thus, at length, approximations are made to a right appreciation of transactions and characters. History cannot be written except in an after age. Thus, by development, the canon of the New Testament has been formed. 
thus public men are content to leave their reputation to posterity great reactions take place in opinion nay sometimes men outlive opposition and obloquy thus saints are canonized in the church long after they have entered into their rest six item eight ethical developments are not properly matter for argument and controversy but are natural and personal substituting what is congruous desirable pious appropriate generous for strictly logical inference bishop butler supplies us with a remarkable instance in the beginning of the second part of his analogy as principles imply applications and general propositions include particulars so he tells us do certain relations imply correlative duties and certain objects demand certain acts and feelings he observes that even though we were not enjoined to pay divine honors to the second and third persons of the holy trinity what is predicated of them in scripture would be an abundant warrant an indirect command nay a ground in reason for doing so does not he asks the duty of religious regards to both these divine persons as immediately arise to the view of reason out of the very nature of these offices and relations as the inward good will and kind intention which we owe to our fellow creatures arises out of the common relations between us and them he proceeds to say that he is speaking of the inward religious regards of reverence honor love trust gratitude fear hope Quote, in what external manner this inward worship is to be expressed is a matter of pure revealed command but the worship the internal worship itself to the son and holy ghost is no further matter of pure revealed command than as the relations they stand in to us are matter of pure revelation for the relations being known the obligations to such internal worship are obligations of reason arising out of those relations themselves end quote. here is a development of doctrine into worship of which parallel instances are obviously to be found in the church of rome seven a development converse to that which butler speaks of must next be mentioned as certain objects excite certain emotions and sentiments so do sentiments imply objects and duties thus conscience the existence of which we cannot deny is a proof of the doctrine of a moral governor which alone gives it a meaning and a scope that is the doctrine of a judge and judgment to come is a development of the phenomenon of conscience again it is plain that passions and affections are in action in our minds before the presence of their proper objects and their activity would of course be an antecedent argument of extreme cogency in behalf of the real existence of those legitimate objects supposing them unknown and so again the social principle which is innate in us gives a divine sanction to society and to civil government and the usage of prayers for the dead implies certain circumstances of their state upon which such devotions bear and rites and ceremonies are natural means through which the mind relieves itself of devotional and penitential emotions and sometimes the cultivation of awe and love towards what is great high and unseen has led a man to the abandonment of his sect for some more catholic form of doctrine aristotle furnishes us with an instance of this kind of development in his account of the happy man after showing that his definition of happiness includes in itself the pleasurable which is the most obvious and popular idea of happiness he goes on to say that still external goods are necessary to it about which however the definition said nothing that is a certain prosperity is by moral fitness not by logical necessity attached to the happy man for it is impossible he observes or not easy to practice high virtue without abundant means many deeds are done by the instrumentality of friends 
wealth, and political power, and of some things the absence is a cloud upon happiness, as of noble birth, of hopeful children, and of personal appearance. For a person utterly deformed, or low-born, or bereaved and childless, cannot quite be happy, and still less if he have very worthless children or friends, or they were good and died. 8. This process of development has been well delineated by a living French writer in his lectures on European civilization, who shall be quoted at some length. Quote, if we reduce religion, he says, to a purely religious sentiment, it appears evident that it must and ought to remain a purely personal concern. But I am either strangely mistaken, or this religious sentiment is not the complete expression of the religious nature of man. Religion is, I believe, very different from this, and much more extended. There are problems in human nature, in human destinies, which cannot be solved in this life, which depend on an order of things unconnected with the visible world, but which unceasingly agitate the human mind with a desire to comprehend them. The solution of these problems is the origin of all religion. Her primary object is to discover the creeds and doctrines which contain or are supposed to contain it. Another cause also impels mankind to embrace religion. From whence do morals originate? Whither do they lead? Is this self-existing obligation to do good an isolated fact, without an author, without an end? Does it not conceal, or rather, does it not reveal to man an origin, a destiny beyond this world? The science of morals, by these spontaneous and inevitable questions, conducts man to the threshold of religion, and displays to him a sphere from whence he has not derived it. Thus, the certain and never-failing sources of religion are, on the one hand, the problems of our nature, on the other, the necessity of seeking for morals a sanction, an origin, and an aim. It therefore assumes many other forms besides that of a pure sentiment. It appears a union of doctrines, of precepts, of promises. This is what truly constitutes religion. This is its fundamental character. It is not merely a form of sensibility, an impulse of the imagination, a variety of poetry. When thus brought back to its true elements, to its essential nature, Religion appears no longer a purely personal concern, but a powerful and fruitful principle of association. Is it considered in the light of a system of belief, a system of dogmas? Truth is not the heritage of any individual. It is absolute and universal. Mankind ought to seek and profess it in common. Is it considered with reference to the precepts that are associated with its doctrines? A law which is obligatory on a single individual is so on all. It ought to be promulgated, and it is our duty to endeavor to bring all mankind under its dominion. It is the same with respect to the promises that religion makes in the name of its creeds and precepts. They ought to be diffused. All men should be incited to partake of their benefits. A religious society, therefore, naturally results from the essential elements of religion, and is such a necessary consequence of it, that the term which expresses the most energetic social sentiment, the most intense desire to propagate ideas and extend society, is the word proselytism, a term which is especially applied to religious belief, and in fact consecrated to it. When a religious society has ever been formed, when a certain number of men are united by a common religious creed, are governed by the same religious precepts, and enjoy the same religious hopes, some form of government is necessary. No society can endure a week, nay more, no society can endure a single hour without a government. The moment, indeed, a society is formed, by the very fact of its formation, it calls forth a government, 
a government which shall proclaim the common truth which is the bond of the society and promulgate and maintain the precepts that this truth ought to produce the necessity of a superior power of a form of government is involved in the fact of the existence of a religious as it is in that of any other society and not only is a government necessary but it naturally forms itself when events are suffered to follow their natural laws when force does not interfere power falls into the hands of the most able the most worthy those who are most capable of carrying out the principles on which the society was founded is a warlike expedition in agitation the bravest take the command is the object of the association learned research or a scientific undertaking the best informed will be the leader the inequality of faculties and influence which is the foundation of power in civil life has the same effect in a religious society religion has no sooner arisen in the human mind than a religious society appears and immediately a religious society is formed it produces its government End quote. nine item nine it remains to allude to what unless the word were often so vaguely and variously used i should be led to call metaphysical developments i mean such as are a mere analysis of the idea contemplated and terminate in its exact and complete delineation thus aristotle draws the character of a magnanimous or of a munificent man thus shakespeare might conceive and bring out his hamlet or ariel thus walter scott gradually enucleates his james or dalgetty as the action of his story proceeds and thus in the sacred province of theology the mind may be employed in developing the solemn ideas which it has hitherto held implicitly and without subjecting them to its reflecting and reasoning powers i have already treated of this subject at length with a reference to the highest theological subject in a former work from which it will be sufficient here to quote some sentences in explanation quote, the mind which is habituated to the thought of god of christ of the holy spirit naturally turns with a devout curiosity to the contemplation of the object of its adoration and begins to form statements concerning it before it knows whither or how far it will be carried one proposition necessarily leads to another and a second to a third then some limitation is required and the combination of these opposites occasions some fresh evolutions from the original idea which indeed can never be said to be entirely exhausted this process is its development and results in a series or rather body of dogmatic statements till what was an impression on the imagination has become a system or creed in the reason now such impressions are obviously individual and complete above other theological ideas because they are the impressions of objects ideas and their developments are commonly not identical the development being but the carrying out of the idea into its consequences thus the doctrine of penance may be called a development of the doctrine of baptism yet still is a distinct doctrine whereas the developments in the doctrines of the holy trinity and the incarnation are mere portions of the original impression and modes of representing it as god is one so the impression which he gives us of himself is one it is not a thing of parts it is not a system nor is it anything imperfect and needing a counterpart it is the vision of an object when we pray we pray not to an assemblage of notions or to a creed but to one individual being and when we speak of him we speak of a person not of a law or manifestation religious men according to their measure have an idea or vision of the blessed trinity in unity of the son incarnate and of his presence 
not as a number of qualities attributes and actions not as the subject of a number of propositions but as one and individual and independent of words like an impression conveyed through the senses creeds and dogmas live in the one idea which they are designed to express and which alone is substantive and are necessary because the human mind cannot reflect upon that idea except piecemeal cannot use it in its oneness and entireness or without resolving it into a series of aspects and relations End quote. 10 so much on the development of ideas in various subject matters it may be necessary to add that in many cases development simply stands for exhibition as in some of the instances adduced above thus both calvinism and unitarianism may be called developments that is exhibitions of the principle of private judgment though they have nothing in common viewed as doctrines as to christianity supposing the truths of which it consists to admit of development that development will be one or other of the last five kinds taking the incarnation as its central doctrine the episcopate as taught by saint ignatius will be an instance of political development the theotokos of logical the determination of the date of our lord's birth of historical the holy eucharist of moral and the athanasian creed of metaphysical end of section two section three of an essay on the development of christian doctrine by john henry newman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. The Antecedent Argument in Behalf of Developments in Christian Doctrine. Part 1. Section 1. Developments of Doctrine to be Expected. Item 1. If Christianity is a fact, and impresses an idea of itself on our minds, and is a subject matter of exercises of the reason that idea will in course of time expand into a multitude of ideas and aspects of ideas connected and harmonious with one another and in themselves determinate and immutable as is the objective fact itself which is thus represented it is a characteristic of our minds that they cannot take an object in which is submitted to them simply and integrally we conceive by means of definition or description whole objects do not create in the intellect whole ideas but are to use a mathematical phrase thrown into series into a number of statements strengthening interpreting correcting each other and with more or less exactness approximating as they accumulate to a perfect image there is no other way of learning or of teaching we cannot teach except by aspects or views which are not identical with the thing itself which we are teaching two persons may each convey the same truth to a third yet by methods and through representations altogether different the same person will treat the same argument differently in an essay or speech according to the accident of the day of writing or of the audience yet it will be substantially the same and the more claim an idea has to be considered living the more various will be its aspects and the more social and political is its nature the more complicated and subtle will be its issues and the longer and more eventful will be its course and in the number of these special ideas which from their very depth and richness cannot be fully understood at once but are more and more clearly expressed and taught the longer they last having aspects many and bearings many mutually connected and growing one out of another and all parts of a whole with a sympathy 
and correspondence keeping pace with the ever-changing necessities of the world, multiform, prolific, and ever-resourceful, among these great doctrines, surely we Christians shall not refuse a foremost place to Christianity. Such, previously to the determination of the fact, must be our anticipation concerning it from a contemplation of its initial achievements. 2. It may be objected that its inspired documents at once determine the limits of its mission without further trouble. But ideas are in the writer and reader of the Revelation, not the inspired text itself, and the question is whether those ideas which the letter conveys from writer to reader reach the reader at once in their completeness and accuracy on his first perception of them or whether they open out in his intellect and grow to perfection in the course of time. Nor could it surely be maintained without extravagance that the letter of the New Testament, or of any assignable number of books, comprises a delineation of all possible forms which a divine message will assume when submitted to a multitude of minds. Nor is the case altered by supposing that inspiration provided in behalf of the first recipients of the revelation what the divine fiat effected for herbs and plants in the beginning which were created in maturity still the time at length came when its recipients ceased to be inspired and on these recipients the revealed truths would fall as in other cases at first vaguely and generally though in spirit and in truth and would afterwards be completed by developments. Nor can it fairly be made a difficulty that thus to treat of Christianity is to level it in some sort to sects and doctrines of the world, and to impute to it the imperfections which characterize the productions of man. Certainly it is a sort of degradation of a divine work to consider it under an earthly form, but it is no irreverence since our lord himself its author and guardian bore one also christianity differs from other religions and philosophies in what is superadded to earth from heaven not in kind but in origin not in its nature but in its personal characteristics being informed and quickened by what is more than intellect by a divine spirit it is externally what the Apostle calls an earthen vessel, being the religion of men, and, considered as such, it grows in wisdom and stature. But the powers which it wields, and the words which proceed out of its mouth, attest its miraculous nativity. Unless, then, some special ground of exception can be assigned, it is as evident that Christianity, as a doctrine and worship, will develop in the minds of recipients, as that it conforms in other respects, in its external propagation, or its political framework, to the general methods by which the course of things is carried forward. 3. Item 2. Again, if Christianity be an universal religion, suited not simply to one locality or period but to all times and places it cannot but vary in its relations and dealings towards the world around it that is it will develop principles require a very various application according as persons and circumstances vary and must be thrown into new shapes according to the form of society which they are to influence hence all bodies of Christians, orthodox or not, develop the doctrines of Scripture. Few but will grant that Luther's view of justification had never been stated in words before his time, that his phraseology and his positions were novel, whether called for by circumstances or not. It is equally certain that the doctrine of justification defined at Trent was, in some sense, new also, the refutation and remedy of errors cannot precede their rise, and thus the fact of false developments or corruptions involves the correspondent manifestation of true ones. 
Moreover, all parties appeal to Scripture, that is, argue from Scripture. But argument implies deduction, that is, development. Here there is no difference between early times and late, between a Pope ex cathedra and an individual Protestant, except that their authority is not on a par. On either side, the claim of authority is the same, and the process of development. Accordingly, the common complaint of Protestants against the Church of Rome is, not simply that she has added to the primitive or the scriptural doctrine, for this they do themselves, but that she contradicts it, and moreover imposes her additions as fundamental truths under sanction of an anathema. For themselves they deduce by quite as subtle a method, and act upon doctrines as implicit and on reasons as little analyzed in time past as Catholic schoolmen. What prominence has the royal supremacy in the New Testament, or the lawfulness of bearing arms, or the duty of public worship, or the substitution of the first day of the week for the seventh, or infant baptism, to say nothing of the fundamental principle that the Bible, and the Bible only, is the religion of Protestants. These doctrines and usages, true or not, which is not the question here, are surely not gained by the direct use and immediate application of Scripture, nor by a mere exercise of argument upon words and sentences placed before the eyes, but by the unconscious growth of ideas suggested by the letter and habitual to the mind. 4. Item 3. And, indeed, when we turn to the consideration of particular doctrines on which Scripture lays the greatest stress, we shall see that it is absolutely impossible for them to remain in the mere letter of Scripture, if they are to be more than mere words, and to convey a definite idea to the recipient. When it is declared that the Word became flesh, three wide questions open upon us on the very announcement. What is meant by the Word? What by flesh? What by became? The answers to these involve a process of investigation and are developments. Moreover, when they have been made, they will suggest a series of secondary questions, and thus at length a multitude of propositions is the result, which gather round the inspired sentence of which they come giving it externally the form of a doctrine, and creating or deepening the idea of it in the mind. It is true that, so far as such statements of Scripture are mysteries, they are relatively to us but words, and cannot be developed. But as a mystery implies in part what is incomprehensible, or at least unknown, so does it in part imply what is not so, it implies a partial manifestation, or a representation by economy. Because then, it is in a measure understood, it can so far be developed, though each result in the process will partake of the dimness and confusion of the original impression. 5. Item 4. This, moreover, should be considered that great questions exist in the subject matter of which Scripture treats, which Scripture does not solve. Questions, too, so real, so practical that they must be answered, and unless we suppose a new revelation, answered by means of the revelation which we have, that is, by development. Such is the question of the canon of Scripture and its inspiration, that is, whether Christianity depends on a written document as Judaism? If so, on what writings and how many? Whether that document is self-interpreting or requires a comment? And whether any authoritative comment or commentator is provided? Whether the revelation and the document are commensurate, or the one outruns the other? All these questions surely find no solution on the surface of Scripture, nor indeed under the surface in the case of most men, however long and diligent might be their study of it. Nor were these difficulties settled by authority, 
as far as we know, at the commencement of the religion. Yet surely it is quite conceivable that an apostle might have dissipated them all in a few words, had divine wisdom thought fit. But, in matter of fact, the decision has been left to time, to the slow process of thought, to the influence of mind upon mind, the issues of controversy, and the growth of opinion. 6. To take another instance just now referred to. If there was a point on which a rule was desirable from the first, it was concerning the religious duties under which Christian parents lay as regards their children. It would be natural indeed in any Christian father, in the absence of a rule, to bring his children for baptism. Such in this instance would be the practical development of his faith in Christ and love for his offspring. Still, a development it is, necessarily required, yet, as far as we know, not provided for his need by direct precept in the revelation as originally given. Another very large field of thought, full of practical considerations, yet, as far as our knowledge goes, but only partially occupied by any apostolical judgment, is that which the question of the effects of baptism opens upon us. That they who came in repentance and faith to that holy sacrament received remission of sins is undoubtedly the doctrine of the apostles. But is there any means of a second remission for sins committed after it? St. Paul's epistles, where we might expect an answer to our inquiry, contain no explicit statement on the subject. What they do plainly say does not diminish the difficulty. Videlicet, first, that baptism is intended for the pardon of sins before it, not in prospect. Next, that those who have received the gift of baptism, in fact, live in a state of holiness, not of sin. How do statements such as these meet the actual state of the Church as we see it at this day? Considering that it was expressly predicted that the kingdom of heaven, like the fisher's net, should gather of every kind, and that the tares should grow with the wheat until the harvest, a graver and more practical question cannot be imagined than that which it has pleased the divine author of the revelation to leave undecided, unless indeed there be means given in that revelation of its own growth or development. As far as the letter goes of the inspired message, everyone who holds that scripture is the rule of faith, as all Protestants do, must allow that, quote, there is not one of us, but has exceeded by transgression its revealed ritual, and finds himself in consequence thrown upon those infinite resources of divine love which are stored in Christ, but have not been drawn out into form in the appointments of the gospel, end quote. Since, then, Scripture needs completion, the question is brought to this issue, whether defect or inchoateness in its doctrines be or be not an antecedent probability in favor of a development of them. 7. There is another subject, though not so immediately practical, on which Scripture does not, strictly speaking, keep silence, but says so little as to require and so much as to suggest information beyond its letter, the intermediate state between death and the resurrection. Considering the long interval which separates Christ's first and second coming, the millions of faithful souls who are waiting it out, and the intimate concern which every Christian has in the determination of its character, it might have been expected that Scripture would have spoken explicitly concerning it, whereas in fact its notices are but brief and obscure. We might indeed have argued that this silence of Scripture was intentional, with a view of discouraging speculations upon the subject, except for the circumstance that, as in the question of our post-baptismal state, its teaching seems to proceed upon an hypothesis inapplicable to the state of the Church after the time when it was delivered. As Scripture contemplates Christians, not as backsliders, but as saints, so does it apparently represent the day of judgment as immediate, and the interval of expectation as evanescent. 
it leaves on our minds the general impression that Christ was returning on earth at once, the time short, worldly engagements superseded by the present distress, persecutors urgent, Christians as a body sinless and expectant, without home, without plan for the future, looking up to heaven. But outward circumstances have changed, and with the change, a different application of the revealed word has of necessity been demanded, that is, a development. When the nations were converted and offenses abounded, then the church came out to view, on the one hand, as a temporal establishment, on the other, as a remedial system, and passages of scripture aided and directed the development, which before were of inferior account. Hence, the doctrine of penance as the complement of baptism, and of purgatory as the explanation of the intermediate state. So reasonable is this expansion of the original creed, that, when some ten years since, the true doctrine of baptism was expounded among us without any mention of penance, our teacher was accused by many of us of novationism. While, on the other hand, heterodox divines have before now advocated the doctrine of the sleep of the soul, because they said it was the only successful preventive of belief in purgatory. 8. Thus developments of Christianity are proved to have been in the contemplation of its divine author, by an argument parallel to that by which we infer intelligence in the system of the physical world. In whatever sense the need and its supply are a proof of design in the visible creation, in the same do the gaps, if the word may be used, which occur in the structure of the original creed of the Church, make it probable that those developments which grow out of the truths which lie around it were intended to fill them up. Nor can it be fairly objected that in thus arguing we are contradicting the great philosopher who tells us that, quote, upon supposition of God affording us light and instruction by revelation, additional to what he has afforded us by reason and experience, we are in no sort judges by what methods and in what proportion it were to be expected that this supernatural light and instruction would be afforded us, end quote because he is speaking of our judging before a revelation is given. He observes that, quote, We have no principles of reason upon which to judge beforehand how it were to be expected revelation should have been left, or what was most suitable to the divine plan of government, end quote, in various respects. But the case is altogether altered when a revelation is vouchsafed for then a new precedent, or what he calls principle of reason, is introduced, and from what is actually put into our hands, we can form a judgment whether more is to be expected. Butler, indeed, as a well-known passage of his work shows, is far from denying the principle of progressive development. 9. Item 5. The method of revelation observed in Scripture abundantly confirms this anticipation. For instance, prophecy, if it had so happened, need not have afforded a specimen of development. Separate predictions might have been made to accumulate as time went on. Prospects might have opened, definite knowledge might have been given by communications independent of each other, as St. John's Gospel, or the epistles of St. Paul, are unconnected with the first three Gospels, though the doctrine of each apostle is a development of their matter. But the prophetic revelation is, in matter of fact, not of this nature, but a process of development. The earlier prophecies are pregnant texts, out of which the succeeding announcements grow. They are types. It is not that first one truth is told, then another but the whole truth, or large portions of it, are told at once, yet only in their rudiments, or in miniature, and they are expanded and finished in their parts, as the course of revelation proceeds. The seed of the woman was to bruise the serpent's head. The scepter was not to depart from Judah, till Shiloh came, to whom was to be the gathering of the people. He was to be wonderful, counselor, 
the Prince of Peace. The question of the Ethiopian rises in the reader's mind. Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Every word requires a comment. Accordingly, it is no uncommon theory with unbelievers that the messianic idea, as they call it, was gradually developed in the minds of the Jews by a continuous and traditional habit of contemplating it, and grew into its full proportions by a mere human process. And so far seems certain, without trenching on the doctrine of inspiration, that the books of Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus are developments of the writings of the prophets, expressed or elicited by means of current ideas in the Greek philosophy, and ultimately adopted and ratified by the Apostle in his epistle to the Hebrews. 10. But the whole Bible, not its prophetical portions only, is written on the principle of development. As the revelation proceeds, it is ever new, yet ever old. St. John, who completes it, declares that he writes no new commandment unto his brethren, but an old commandment which they had from the beginning. And then he adds, A new commandment I write unto you. The same test of development is suggested in our Lord's words on the mount, as has already been noticed. Quote, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. End quote. He does not reverse but perfect what has gone before. Thus, with respect to the evangelical view of the rite of sacrifice, first, the rite is enjoined by Moses. Next, Samuel says, To obey is better than sacrifice. Then Hosea, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Isaiah, Incense is an abomination unto me. Then Malachi, describing the times of the gospel, speaks of the pure offering of wheat flour, and our Lord completes the development when he speaks of worshipping in spirit and in truth. If there is anything here left to explain, it will be found in the usage of the Christian Church immediately afterwards, which shows that sacrifice was not removed, but truth and spirit added nay, the ephata of our Lord and his apostles, are of a typical structure, parallel to the prophetic announcements above mentioned, and predictions as well as injunctions of doctrine. If then the prophetic sentences have had that development which has really been given them, first by succeeding revelations, and then by the event, it is probable antecedently that those doctrinal, political, ritual, and ethical sentences which have the same structure should admit the same expansion. Such are, This is my body, or Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, or The meek shall inherit the earth, or Suffer little children to come unto me, or The pure in heart shall see God. 11. On this character of our Lord's teaching, the following passage may suitably be quoted from a writer already used. Quote, His recorded words and works when on earth come to us as the declarations of a lawgiver. In the Old Covenant, Almighty God first of all spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai and afterwards wrote them. So our Lord first spoke His own Gospel both of promise and of precept, on the mount, and his evangelists have recorded it. Further, when he delivered it, he spoke by way of parallel to the Ten Commandments, and his style, moreover, corresponds to the authority which he assumes. It is of that solemn, measured, and severe character, which bears on the face of it tokens of its belonging to one who spake as none other man could speak. The Beatitudes with which his sermon opens are an instance of this incommunicable style, which befitted, as far as human words could befit, God incarnate. Nor is this style peculiar to the Sermon on the Mount. 
all through the Gospels it is discernible, distinct from any other part of Scripture, showing itself in solemn declarations, canons, sentences, or sayings, such as legislators propound, and scribes and lawyers comment on. Surely everything our Saviour did and said is characterized by mingled simplicity and mystery. His emblematical actions, his typical miracles, his parables, his replies, his censures, are all evidences of a legislature in germ, afterwards to be developed, a code of divine truth which was ever to be before men's eyes, to be the subject of investigation and interpretation, and the guide in controversy. Verily, verily, I say unto you, but I say unto you, are the tokens of a supreme teacher and prophet. And thus the fathers speak of his teaching. His sayings, observes St. Justin, were short and concise, for he was no rhetorician, but his word was the power of God. And St. Basil, in like manner, every deed and every word of our Saviour Jesus Christ is a canon of piety and virtue. When, then, thou hearest word or deed of his, do not hear it as by the way, or after a simple and carnal manner, but enter into the depth of his contemplations, become a communicant in truths mystically delivered to thee. End quote. 12. Moreover, while it is certain that developments of revelation proceeded all through the old dispensation down to the very end of our Lord's ministry, on the other hand, if we turn our attention to the beginnings of apostolical teaching after his ascension, we shall find ourselves unable to fix an historical point at which the growth of doctrine ceased, and the rule of faith was once for all settled. Not on the day of Pentecost, for St. Peter had still to learn at Joppa that he was to baptize Cornelius, not at Joppa and Caesarea, for St. Paul had to write his epistles, not on the death of the last apostle, for St. Ignatius had to establish the doctrine of episcopacy, not then, nor for centuries after, for the canon of the New Testament was still undetermined, not in the creed, which is no collection of definitions, but a summary of certain credenda, an incomplete summary, and, like the Lord's Prayer or the Decalogue, a mere sample of divine truths, especially of the more elementary. No one doctrine can be named which starts complete at first and gains nothing afterwards from the investigations of faith and the attacks of heresy. The church went forth from the old world in haste, as the Israelites from Egypt, with their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. 13. Further, the political developments contained in the historical parts of Scripture are as striking as the prophetical and the doctrinal. Can any history wear a more human appearance than that of the rise and growth of the chosen people to whom I have just referred. What had been determined in the counsels of the Lord of heaven and earth from the beginning, what was immutable, what was announced to Moses in the burning bush, is afterwards represented as the growth of an idea under successive emergencies. The divine voice in the bush had announced the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt and their entrance into Canaan, and added as a token of the certainty of his purpose, When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Now this sacrifice or festival, which was but incidental and secondary in the great deliverance, is for a while the ultimate scope of the demands which Moses makes upon Pharaoh. Thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. It had been added that Pharaoh would first refuse their request, 
but that after miracles he would let them go altogether, nay, with jewels of silver and gold and raiment. Accordingly, the first request of Moses was, Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Before the plague of frogs, the warning is repeated, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And after it, Pharaoh says, I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. It occurs again before the plague of flies, and after it Pharaoh offers to let the Israelites sacrifice in Egypt, which Moses refuses on the ground that they will have to sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes. We will go three days' journey into the wilderness, he proceeds, and sacrifice to the Lord our God and Pharaoh then concedes their sacrificing in the wilderness. Only, he says, you shall not go very far away. The demand is repeated separately before the plagues of murin, hail, and locusts, no mention being yet made of anything beyond a service or sacrifice in the wilderness. On the last of these interviews, Pharaoh asks an explanation, and Moses extends his claim. We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. That it was an extension seems plain from Pharaoh's reply. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. Upon the plague of darkness, Pharaoh concedes the extended demand, accepting the flocks and herds. But Moses reminds him that they were implied, though not expressed in the original wording. Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Even to the last, there was no intimation of their leaving Egypt for good. The issue was left to be wrought out by the Egyptians. All these thy servants, says Moses, shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And accordingly, after the judgment on the firstborn, they were thrust out at midnight, with their flocks and herds, their kneading troughs and their dough, laden too with the spoils of Egypt, as had been foreordained, yet apparently by a combination of circumstances, or the complication of a crisis. Yet Moses knew that their departure from Egypt was final, for he took the bones of Joseph with him, and that conviction broke on Pharaoh soon when he and his asked themselves, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? But this progress of events, vague and uncertain as it seemed to be, notwithstanding the miracles which attended it, had been directed by him who works out gradually what he has determined absolutely, and it ended in the parting of the Red Sea, and the destruction of Pharaoh's host on his pursuing them. Moreover, from what occurred forty years afterwards, when they were advancing upon the Promised Land, it would seem that the original grant of territory did not include the country east of Jordan, held in the event by Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. At least they undertook at first to leave Sihon in undisturbed possession of his country if he would let them pass through it, and only on his refusing his permission did they invade and appropriate it. 14. Item 6. It is in point to notice also the structure and style of Scripture, a structure so unsystematic and various, and a style so figurative and indirect, that no one would presume at first sight to say what is in it and what is not. It cannot, as it were, be mapped, or its contents catalogued. But after all our diligence, to the end of our lives and to the end of the Church, it must be an unexplored and unsubdued land, with heights and valleys, forests and streams, on the right and left of our path and close about us, 
full of concealed wonders and choice treasures. Of no doctrine whatever, which does not actually contradict what has been delivered, can it be peremptorily asserted that it is not in Scripture. Of no reader, whatever be his study of it, can it be said that he has mastered every doctrine which it contains. Butler's remarks on this subject were just now referred to. Quote, the more distinct and particular knowledge, he says, of those things the study of which the Apostle calls going on unto perfection, end quote, that is, of the more recondite doctrines of the Gospel, quote, and of the prophetic parts of Revelation, like many parts of natural and even civil knowledge, may require very exact thought and careful consideration. The hindrances, too, of natural and of supernatural light and knowledge have been of the same kind. And as it is owned the whole scheme of Scripture is not yet understood, so if it ever comes to be understood, before the restitution of all things, and without miraculous interpositions, it must be in the same way as natural knowledge is come at, by the continuance and progress of learning and of liberty, and by particular persons attending to, comparing, and pursuing intimations scattered up and down it, which are overlooked and disregarded by the generality of the world. For this is the way in which all improvements are made, by thoughtful men tracing on obscure hints, as it were dropped us by nature accidentally, or which seem to come into our minds by chance. Nor is it at all incredible that a book, which has been so long in the possession of mankind, should contain many truths as yet undiscovered. For all the same phenomena and the same faculties of investigation from which such great discoveries in natural knowledge have been made in the present and last age were equally in the possession of mankind several thousand years before. And possibly it might be intended that events, as they come to pass, should open and ascertain the meaning of several parts of Scripture. End quote. Butler, of course, was not contemplating the case of new articles of faith, or developments imperative on our acceptance. But he surely bears witness to the probability of developments taking place in Christian doctrine considered in themselves, which is the point at present in question. 15. It may be added that, in matter of fact, all the definitions or received judgments of the early and medieval church rest upon definite, even though sometimes obscure, sentences of Scripture. Thus, purgatory may appeal to the saving by fire and entering through much tribulation into the kingdom of God, the communication of the merits of the saints to our receiving a prophet's reward for receiving a prophet in the name of a prophet, and a righteous man's reward for receiving a righteous man in the name of a righteous man. The real presence to this is my body, absolution to whose soever sins ye remit, they are remitted, extreme unction to anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, voluntary poverty to sell all that thou hast, obedience to he was in subjection to his parents. The honor paid to creatures, animate or inanimate, to laudate dominum in sanctis eius, and adorates cabellum pedum eius, and so of the rest. 16. Item 7. Lastly, while Scripture nowhere recognizes itself or asserts the inspiration of those passages which are most essential, it distinctly anticipates the development of Christianity, both as a polity and as a doctrine. In one of our Lord's parables, the kingdom of heaven is even compared to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and hid in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree and, as St. Mark words it, shooteth out great branches, so that the birds of the air come 
and lodge in the branches thereof. And again, in the same chapter of St. Mark, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Here an internal element of life, whether principle or doctrine, is spoken of rather than any mere external manifestation. And it is observable that the spontaneous as well as the gradual character of the growth is intimated. This description of the process corresponds to what has been above observed respecting development, videlicet, that it is not an effect of wishing and resolving, or of forced enthusiasm, or of any mechanism of reasoning, or of any mere subtlety of intellect, but comes of its own innate power of expansion within the mind in its season, though with the use of reflection and argument and original thought, more or less as it may happen, with a dependence on the ethical growth of the mind itself, and with a reflex influence upon it. Again, the parable of the leaven describes the development of doctrine in another respect, in its active, engrossing, and interpenetrating power. 17. From the necessity, then, of the case, from the history of all sects and parties in religion, and from the analogy and example of Scripture, we may fairly conclude that Christian doctrine admits of formal, legitimate, and true developments, that is, of developments contemplated by its divine author. The general analogy of the world, physical and moral, confirms this conclusion, as we are reminded by the great authority who has already been quoted in the course of this section. Quote, the whole natural world and government of it, says Butler, is a scheme or system, not a fixed but a progressive one, a scheme in which the operation of various means takes up a great length of time before the ends they tend to can be attained. The change of seasons, the ripening of the fruits of the earth, the very history of a flower is an instance of this. And so is human life. Thus vegetable bodies, and those of animals, though possibly formed at once, yet grow up by degrees to a mature state. And thus rational agents, who animate these latter bodies, are naturally directed to form each his own manners and character by the gradual gaining of knowledge and experience, and by a long course of action. Our existence is not only successive, as it must be of necessity, but one state of our life and being is appointed by God to be a preparation for another, and that to be the means of attaining to another succeeding one, infancy to childhood, childhood to youth, youth to mature age. Men are impatient and for precipitating things, but the author of nature appears deliberate throughout his operations, accomplishing his natural ends by slow successive steps. And there is a plan of things beforehand laid out, which, from the nature of it, requires various systems of means, as well as length of time, in order to the carrying on its several parts into execution. Thus, in the daily course of natural providence, God operates in the very same manner as in the dispensation of Christianity, making one thing subservient to another, this to somewhat farther, and so on, through a progressive series of means, which extend both backward and forward beyond our utmost view. Of this manner of operation, everything we see in the course of nature is as much an instance as any part of the Christian dispensation. End, quote. End of section 3「Section 4 of an Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. The Antecedent Argument 
in behalf of developments in christian doctrine part two section two an infallible developing authority to be expected it has now been made probable that developments of christianity were but natural as time went on and were to be expected and that these natural and true developments as being natural and true were of course contemplated and taken into account by its author who in designing the work designed its legitimate results these whatever they turn out to be may be called absolutely the developments of christianity that beyond reasonable doubt there are such is surely a great step gained in the inquiry it is a momentous fact the next question is what are they and to a theologian who could take a general view and also possessed an intimate and minute knowledge of its history they would doubtless on the whole be easily distinguishable by their own characters and require no foreign aid to point them out no external authority to ratify them but it is difficult to say who is exactly in this position considering that christians from the nature of the case live under the bias of the doctrines and in the very midst of the facts and during the process of the controversies which are to be the subject of criticism since they are exposed to the prejudices of birth education place personal attachment engagements and party it can hardly be maintained that in matter of fact a true development carries with it always its own certainty even to the learned or that history past or present is secure from the possibility of a variety of interpretations two i have already spoken on this subject and from a very different point of view from that which i am taking at present Quote, prophets or doctors are the interpreters of the revelation they unfold and define its mysteries they illuminate its documents they harmonize its contents they apply its promises their teaching is a vast system not to be comprised in a few sentences not to be embodied in one code or treatise but consisting of a certain body of truth pervading the church like an atmosphere irregular in its shape from its very profusion and exuberance at times separable only in idea from episcopal tradition yet at times melting away into legend and fable partly written partly unwritten partly the interpretation partly the supplement of scripture partly preserved in intellectual expressions partly latent in the spirit and temper of christians poured to and fro in closets and upon the housetops in liturgies in controversial works in obscure fragments in sermons in popular prejudices in local customs this i call prophetical tradition existing primarily in the bosom of the church itself and recorded in such measure as providence has determined in the writings of eminent men keep that which is committed to thy charge is st paul's injunction to timothy and for this reason because from its vastness and indefiniteness it is especially exposed to corruption if the church fails in vigilance this is that body of teaching which is offered to all christians even at the present day though in various forms and measures of truth in different parts of christendom partly being a comment partly an addition upon the articles of the creed End quote. if this be true certainly some rule is necessary for arranging and authenticating these various expressions and results of christian doctrine no one will maintain that all points of belief are of equal importance quote, there are what may be called minor points which we may hold to be true without imposing them as necessary end quote. Quote, there are greater truths and lesser truths points which it is necessary and points which it is pious to believe end quote. the simple question is how are we to discriminate the greater from the less the true 
from the false. 3. This need of an authoritative sanction is increased by considering, after M. Guizot's suggestion, that Christianity, though represented in prophecy as a kingdom, came into the world as an idea rather than an institution, and has had to wrap itself in clothing and fit itself with armor of its own providing, and to form the instruments and methods of its prosperity and warfare. If the developments which have above been called moral are to take place to any great extent, and without them it is difficult to see how Christianity can exist at all if only its relations towards civil government have to be ascertained or the qualifications for the profession of it have to be defined, surely an authority is necessary to impart decision to what is vague and confidence to what is empirical to ratify the successive steps of so elaborate a process and to secure the validity of inferences which are to be made the premises of more remote investigations tests it is true for ascertaining the correctness of developments in general may be drawn out as i shall show in the sequel but they are insufficient for the guidance of individuals in the case of so large and complicated a problem as christianity though they may aid our inquiries and support our conclusions in particular points they are of a scientific and controversial not of a practical character and are instruments rather than warrants of right decisions moreover they rather serve as answers to objections brought against the actual decisions of authority than are proofs of the correctness of those decisions while then on the one hand it is probable that some means will be granted for ascertaining the legitimate and true developments of revelation it appears on the other that these means must of necessity be external to the developments themselves four reasons shall be given in this section for concluding that in proportion to the probability of true developments of doctrine and practice in the divine scheme so is the probability also of the appointment in that scheme of an external authority to decide upon them thereby separating them from the mass of mere human speculation extravagance corruption and error in and out of which they grow this is the doctrine of the infallibility of the church for by infallibility i suppose is meant the power of deciding whether this that and a third and any number of theological or ethical statements are true five item one let the state of the case be carefully considered if the christian doctrine as originally taught admits of true and important developments as was argued in the foregoing section this is a strong antecedent argument in favor of a provision in the dispensation for putting a seal of authority upon those developments the probability of their being known to be true varies with that of their truth the two ideas indeed are quite distinct i grant of revealing and of guaranteeing a truth and they are often distinct in fact there are various revelations all over the earth which do not carry with them the evidence of their divinity such are the inward suggestions and secret illuminations granted to so many individuals such are the traditionary doctrines which are found among the heathen that quote, vague and unconnected family of religious truths originally from god but sojourning without the sanction of miracle or a definite home as pilgrims up and down the world and discernible and separable from the corrupt legends with which they are mixed by the spiritual mind alone End quote. there is nothing impossible in the notion of a revelation occurring without evidences that it is a revelation just as human sciences are a divine gift yet are reached by our ordinary powers and have no claim on our faith but christianity is not of this nature it is a revelation which comes to us as a revelation as a whole objectively 
and with a profession of infallibility, and the only question to be determined relates to the matter of the revelation. If, then, there are certain great truths or duties or observances, naturally and legitimately resulting from the doctrines originally professed, it is but reasonable to include these true results in the idea of the revelation itself, to consider them parts of it, and if the revelation be not only true, but guaranteed as true, to anticipate that they too will come under the privilege of that guarantee. Christianity, unlike other revelations of God's will, except the Jewish of which it is a continuation, is an objective religion, or a revelation with credentials. It is natural, I say, to view it wholly as such, and not partly sui generis, partly like others. Such as it begins, such let it be considered to continue, granting that certain large developments of it are true, they must surely be accredited as true. 6. Item 2. An objection, however, is often made to the doctrine of infallibility in limine, which is too important not to be taken into consideration. It is urged that, as all religious knowledge rests on moral evidence, not on demonstration, our belief in the Church's infallibility must be of this character. But what can be more absurd than a probable infallibility, or a certainty resting on doubt? I believe because I am sure, and I am sure because I suppose. Granting, then, that the gift of infallibility be adapted, when believed, to unite all intellects in one common confession, the fact that it is given is as difficult of proof as the developments which it is to prove and nugatory therefore, and in consequence improbable in a divine scheme. The advocates of Rome, it has been urged, quote, insist on the necessity of an infallible guide in religious matters as an argument that such a guide has really been accorded. Now it is obvious to inquire how individuals are to know with certainty that Rome is infallible, how any ground can be such as to bring home to the mind infallibly that she is infallible. What conceivable proof amounts to more than a probability of the fact? And what advantage is an infallible guide if those who are to be guided have, after all, no more than an opinion, as the Romanists call it, that she is infallible? End quote. 7. This argument, however, except when used, as is intended in this passage, against such persons as would remove all imperfection in the proof of religion, is certainly a fallacious one. For since, as all allow, the apostles were infallible, it tells against their infallibility or the infallibility of Scripture as truly as against the infallibility of the Church. For no one will say that the apostles were made infallible for nothing, yet we are only morally certain that they were infallible. Further, if we have but probable grounds for the Church's infallibility, we have but the like for the impossibility of certain things, the necessity of others, the truth, the certainty of others, and therefore the words infallibility, necessity, truth, and certainty ought all of them to be banished from the language. But why is it more inconsistent to speak of an uncertain infallibility than of a doubtful truth or a contingent necessity, phrases which present ideas clear and undeniable? In sooth we are playing with words when we use arguments of this sort. When we say that a person is infallible, we mean no more than that what he says is always true, always to be believed, always to be done. The term is resolvable into these phrases as its equivalents. Either then the phrases are inadmissible, or the idea of infallibility must be allowed. A probable infallibility is a probable gift of never erring. A reception of the doctrine of a probable infallibility is faith and obedience towards a person founded on the probability of his never erring in his declarations or commands. 
what is inconsistent in this idea whatever then be the particular means of determining infallibility the abstract objection may be put aside footnote Quote, it is very common to confuse infallibility with certitude but the two words stand for things quite distinct from each other i remember for certain what i did yesterday but still my memory is not infallible i am quite clear that two and two makes four but i often make mistakes in long addition sums i have no doubt whatever that john or richard is my true friend but i have before now trusted those who failed me and i may do so again before i die i am quite certain that victoria is our sovereign and not her father the duke of kent without any claim myself to the gift of infallibility as i may do a virtuous action without being impeccable i may be certain that the church is infallible while i am myself a fallible mortal otherwise i cannot be certain that the supreme being is infallible unless i am infallible myself certitude is directed to one or other definite concrete proposition i am certain of propositions one two three four or five one by one each by itself i can be certain of one of them without being certain of the rest that i am certain of the first makes it neither likely nor unlikely that i am certain of the second but were i infallible then i should be certain not only of one of them but of all End quote. End of footnote. eight item three again it is sometimes argued that such a dispensation would destroy our probation as dissipating doubt precluding the exercise of faith and obliging us to obey whether we wish it or no and it is urged that a divine voice spoke in the first age and difficulty and darkness rest upon all subsequent ones as if infallibility and personal judgment were incompatible but this is to confuse the subject we must distinguish between a revelation and a reception of it not between its earlier and later stages a revelation in itself divine and guaranteed as such may from first to last be received doubted argued against perverted rejected by individuals according to the state of mind of each ignorance misapprehension unbelief and other causes do not at once cease to operate because the revelation is in itself true and in its proofs irrefragable we have then no warrant at all for saying that an accredited revelation will exclude the existence of doubts and difficulties on the part of those whom it addresses or dispense with anxious diligence on their part though it may in its own nature tend to do so infallibility does not interfere with moral probation the two notions are absolutely distinct it is no objection then to the idea of a peremptory authority such as i am supposing that it lessens the task of personal inquiry unless it be an objection to the authority of revelation altogether a church or a council or a pope or a consent of doctors or a consent of christendom limits the inquiries of the individual in no other way than scripture limits them it does limit them but while it limits their range it preserves intact their probationary character we are tried as really though not on so large a field to suppose that the doctrine of a permanent authority in matters of faith interferes with our free will and responsibility is as before to forget that there were infallible teachers in the first age and heretics and schismatics in the ages subsequent there may have been at once a supreme authority from first to last and a moral judgment from first to last moreover those who maintain that christian truth must be gained solely by personal efforts are bound to show that methods ethical and intellectual are granted to individuals sufficient for gaining it else the mode of probation they advocate is less 
not more perfect than that which proceeds upon external authority on the whole then no argument against continuing the principle of objectiveness into the developments of revelation arises out of the conditions of our moral responsibility nine item four perhaps it will be urged that the analogy of nature is against our anticipating the continuance of an external authority which has once been given because in the words of the profound thinker who has already been cited quote, we are wholly ignorant what degree of new knowledge it were to be expected god would give mankind by revelation upon supposition of his affording one or how far and in what way he would interpose miraculously to qualify them to whom he should originally make the revelation for communicating the knowledge given by it and to secure their doing it to the age in which they should live and to secure its being transmitted to posterity end quote. and because quote, we are not in any sort able to judge whether it were to be expected that the revelation should have been committed to writing or left to be handed down and consequently corrupted by verbal tradition and at length sunk under it End quote. but this reasoning does not apply here as has already been observed it contemplates only the abstract hypothesis of a revelation not the fact of an existing revelation of a particular kind which may of course in various ways modify our state of knowledge by settling some of those very points which before it was given we had no means of deciding nor can it as i think be fairly denied that the argument from analogy in one point of view tells against anticipating a revelation at all for an innovation upon the physical order of the world is by the very force of the terms inconsistent with its ordinary course we cannot then regulate our antecedent view of the character of a revelation by a test which applied simply overthrows the very notion of a revelation altogether anyhow analogy is in some sort violated by the fact of a revelation and the question before us only relates to the extent of that violation Ten. i will hazard a distinction here between the facts of revelation and its principles the argument from analogy is more concerned with its principles than with its facts the revealed facts are special and singular not analogous from the nature of the case but it is otherwise with the revealed principles these are common to all the works of god and if the author of nature be the author of grace it may be expected that while the two systems of facts are distinct and independent the principles displayed in them will be the same and form a connecting link between them in this identity of principle lies the analogy of natural and revealed religion in butler's sense of the word the doctrine of the incarnation is a fact and cannot be paralleled by anything in nature the doctrine of mediation is a principle and is abundantly exemplified in its provisions miracles are facts inspiration is a fact divine teaching once for all and a continual teaching are each a fact probation by means of intellectual difficulties is a principle both in nature and in grace and may be carried on in the system of grace either by a standing ordinance of teaching or by one definite act of teaching and that with an analogy equally perfect in either case to the order of nature nor can we succeed in arguing from the analogy of that order against a standing guardianship of revelation without arguing also against its original bestowal supposing the order of nature once broken by the introduction of a revelation the continuance of that revelation is but a question of degree and the circumstance that a work has begun makes it more probable than not that it will proceed we have no reason to suppose that there is so great a distinction of dispensation between ourselves and the first generation of christians as that they had a living infallible guidance and we have not 
The case then stands thus. Revelation has introduced a new law of divine governance over and above those laws which appear in the natural course of the world. And in consequence, we are able to argue for the existence of a standing authority in matters of faith on the analogy of nature and from the fact of Christianity. Preservation is involved in the idea of creation. As the Creator rested on the seventh day from the work which He had made, yet He worketh hitherto. So He gave the creed once for all in the beginning, yet blesses its growth still, and provides for its increase. His word shall not return unto Him void, but accomplish His pleasure. As creation argues continual governance, so are apostles harbingers of popes. 11. Item 5. Moreover, it must be borne in mind that, as the essence of all religion is authority and obedience, so the distinction between natural religion and revealed lies in this, that the one has a subjective authority and the other an objective. Revelation consists in the manifestation of the invisible divine power or in the substitution of the voice of a lawgiver for the voice of conscience. The supremacy of conscience is the essence of natural religion. The supremacy of apostle or pope or church or bishop is the essence of revealed. And when such external authority is taken away, the mind falls back again of necessity upon that inward guide which it possessed even before revelation was vouchsafed. Thus, what conscience is in the system of nature, such is the voice of Scripture, or of the Church, or of the Holy See, as we may determine it, in the system of Revelation. It may be objected, indeed, that conscience is not infallible. It is true, but still it is ever to be obeyed. And this is just the prerogative which controversialists assign to the See of St. Peter. It is not in all cases infallible, it may err beyond its special province, but it has in all cases a claim on our obedience. Quote, all Catholics and heretics, says Bellarmine, agree in two things. First, that it is possible for the Pope, even as Pope, and with his own assembly of councillors, or with general council, to err in particular controversies of fact, which chiefly depend on human information and testimony. Secondly, that it is possible for him to err as a private doctor, even in universal questions of right, whether of faith or of morals, and that from ignorance, as sometimes happens to other doctors. Next, all Catholics agree in other two points, not, however, with heretics, but solely with each other. First, that the Pope, with general counsel, cannot err either in framing decrees of faith or general precepts of morality. Secondly, that the Pope, when determining anything in a doubtful matter, whether by himself or with his own particular counsel, whether it is possible for him to err or not, is to be obeyed by all the faithful. End quote. Footnote. Seven years ago, it is scarcely necessary to say, the Vatican Council determined that the Pope, ex cathedra, has the same infallibility as the Church. This does not affect the argument in the text. End of footnote. And as obedience to conscience, even supposing conscience ill-informed, tends to the improvement of our moral nature, and ultimately of our knowledge, so obedience to our ecclesiastical superior may subserve our growth in illumination and sanctity, even though he should command what is extreme or inexpedient, or teach what is external to his legitimate province. 12. Item 6. The common sense of mankind does but support a conclusion thus forced upon us by analogical considerations. It feels that the very idea of revelation implies a present informant and guide, and that an infallible one. 
not a mere abstract declaration of truths unknown before to man or a record of history or the result of an antiquarian research but a message and a lesson speaking to this man and that this is shown by the popular notion which has prevailed among us since the reformation that the bible itself is such a guide and which succeeded in overthrowing the supremacy of church and pope for the very reason that it was a rival authority not resisting merely but supplanting it in proportion then as we find in matter of fact that the inspired volume is not adapted or intended to subserve that purpose we are forced to revert to that living and present guide who at the era of our rejection of her had been so long recognized as the dispenser of scripture according to times and circumstances and the arbiter of all true doctrine and holy practice to her children we feel a need and she alone of all things under heaven supplies it we are told that god has spoken where in a book we have tried it and it disappoints it disappoints us that most holy and blessed gift not from fault of its own but because it is used for a purpose for which it was not given the ethiopian's reply when saint philip asked him if he understood what he was reading is the voice of nature how can i unless some man shall guide me the church undertakes that office she does what none else can do and this is the secret of her power Quote, the human mind it has been said wishes to be rid of doubt in religion and a teacher who claims infallibility is readily believed on his simple word we see this constantly exemplified in the case of individual pretenders among ourselves in romanism the church pretends to it she rids herself of competitors by forestalling them and probably in the eyes of her children this is not the least persuasive argument for her infallibility that she alone of all churches dares claim it as if a secret instinct and involuntary misgivings restrained those rival communions which go so far towards affecting it End quote. these sentences whatever be the errors of their wording surely express a great truth the most obvious answer then to the question why we yield to the authority of the church in the questions and developments of faith is that some authority there must be if there is a revelation given and other authority there is none but she a revelation is not given if there be no authority to decide what it is that is given in the words of saint peter to her divine master and lord to whom shall we go nor must it be forgotten in confirmation that scripture expressly calls the church the pillar and ground of the truth and promises her as by covenant that the spirit of the lord that is upon her and his words which he has put in her mouth shall not depart out of her mouth nor out of the mouth of her seed nor out of the mouth of her seed's seed from henceforth and forever 13 item 7 and if the very claim to infallible arbitration in religious disputes is of so weighty importance and interest in all ages of the world much more is it welcome at a time like the present when the human intellect is so busy and thought so fertile and opinion so manifold the absolute need of a spiritual supremacy is at present the strongest of arguments in favor of the fact of its supply surely either an objective revelation has not been given or it has been provided with means for impressing its objectiveness on the world if christianity be a social religion as it certainly is and if it be based on certain ideas acknowledged as divine or a creed which shall here be assumed and if these ideas have various aspects and make distinct impressions on different minds and issue in consequence in a multiplicity of developments true or false or mixed as has been shown what power will suffice to meet and to do justice to these conflicting conditions but a supreme authority 
ruling and reconciling individual judgments by a divine right and a recognized wisdom. In barbarous times the will is reached through the senses. But in an age in which reason, as it is called, is the standard of truth and right, it is abundantly evident to anyone who mixes ever so little with the world that if things are left to themselves, every individual will have his own view of them and take his own course. That two or three will agree today to part company tomorrow. That scripture will be read in contrary ways, and history, according to the apologue, will have to different comers its silver shield and its golden. That philosophy, taste, prejudice, passion, party, caprice, will find no common measure unless there be some supreme power to control the mind and to compel agreement. There can be no combination on the basis of truth without an organ of truth, as cultivation brings out the colors of flowers and domestication changes the character of animals, so does education of necessity develop differences of opinion. And while it is impossible to lay down first principles in which all will unite, it is utterly unreasonable to expect that this man should yield to that or all to one. I do not say there are no eternal truths, such as the poet proclaims, which all acknowledge in private, but that there are none sufficiently commanding to be the basis of public union and action. The only general persuasive in matters of conduct is authority, that is, when truth is in question, a judgment which we feel to be superior to our own. If Christianity is both social and dogmatic, and intended for all ages, it must, humanly speaking, have an infallible expounder. Else you will secure unity of form at the loss of unity of doctrine, or unity of doctrine at the loss of unity of form. You will have to choose between a comprehension of opinions and a resolution into parties between latitudinarian and sectarian error. You may be tolerant or intolerant of contrarieties of thought, but contrarieties you will have. By the Church of England, a hollow uniformity is preferred to an infallible chair, and by the sects of England, an interminable division. Germany and Geneva began with persecution and have ended in skepticism. The doctrine of infallibility is a less violent hypothesis than this sacrifice either of faith or of charity. It secures the object, while it gives definiteness and force to the matter, of the revelation. 14. Item 8. I have called the doctrine of infallibility an hypothesis. Let it be so considered for the sake of argument, that is, let it be considered to be a mere position supported by no direct evidence, but required by the facts of the case, and reconciling them with each other. That hypothesis is indeed, in matter of fact, maintained and acted on in the largest portion of Christendom, and from time immemorial. But let this coincidence be accounted for by the need. Moreover, it is not a naked or isolated fact, but the animating principle of a large scheme of doctrine which the need itself could not simply create. But again, let this system be merely called its development. Yet, even as an hypothesis, which has been held by one out of various communions, it may not be lightly put aside. Some hypothesis, this or that, all parties, all controversialists, all historians must adopt, if they would treat of Christianity at all. Giseler's textbook bears the profession of being a dry analysis of Christian history, yet, on inspection, it will be found to be written on a positive and definite theory, and to bend facts to meet it. An unbeliever as Gibbon assumes one hypothesis, and an ultramontane as Baronius adopts another. The school of Hurd and Newton hold, as the only true view of history, that Christianity slept for centuries upon centuries, except among those whom historians call heretics. 
Others speak as if the oath of supremacy, or the congé d'élire, could be made the measure of St. Ambrose, and they fit the thirty-nine articles on the fervid Tertullian. The question is, which of all these theories is the simplest, the most natural, the most persuasive? Certainly, the notion of development under infallible authority is not a less grave, a less winning hypothesis than the chance and coincidence of events, or the Oriental philosophy, or the working of Antichrist, to account for the rise of Christianity and the formation of its theology. Section 3. The Existing Developments of Doctrine, the Probable Fulfillment of that Expectation. I have been arguing in respect to the revealed doctrine given to us from above in Christianity, first, that in consequence of its intellectual character, and as passing through the minds of so many generations of men, and as applied by them to so many purposes, and as investigated so curiously as to its capabilities, implications, and bearings, it could not but grow or develop, as time went on, into a large theological system. Next, that if development must be, then, whereas revelation is a heavenly gift, he who gave it virtually has not given it unless he has also secured it from perversion and corruption in all such development as comes upon it by the necessity of its nature, or, in other words, that that intellectual action through successive generations, which is the organ of development, must, so far forth as it can claim to have been put in charge of the revelation, be, in its determinations, infallible. Passing from these two points, I come next to the question whether in the history of Christianity there is any fulfillment of such anticipation as I have insisted on, whether, in matter of fact, doctrines, rites, and usages have grown up round the apostolic creed, and have interpenetrated its articles, claiming to be part of Christianity, and looking like those additions which we are in search of. The answer is that such additions there are, and that they are found just where they might be expected, in the authoritative seats and homes of old tradition, the Latin and Greek churches. Let me enlarge on this point. 2. I observe, then, that if the idea of Christianity, as originally given to us from heaven, cannot but contain much which will be only partially recognized by us as included in it, and only held by us unconsciously, and if again Christianity being from heaven, all that is necessarily involved in it and is evolved from it is from heaven, and if, on the other hand, large accretions actually do exist, professing to be its true and legitimate results, our first impression naturally is that these must be the very developments which they profess to be. Moreover, the very scale on which they have been made, their high antiquity yet present promise, their gradual formation yet precision, their harmonious order, dispose the imagination most forcibly towards the belief that a teaching so consistent with itself, so well balanced, so young and so old, not obsolete after so many centuries, but vigorous and progressive still, is the very development contemplated in the divine scheme. These doctrines are members of one family, and suggestive or correlative or confirmatory or illustrative of each other. One furnishes evidence to another, and all to each of them. If this is proved, that becomes probable. If this and that are both probable, but for different reasons, each adds to the other its own probability. The Incarnation is the antecedent of the doctrine of mediation, and the archetype both of the sacramental principle and of the merits of the saints. From the doctrine of mediation follow the atonement, the mass, the merits of martyrs and saints, their invocation and cultus. From the sacramental principle come the sacraments properly so called, 
the unity of the church and the holy see as its type and centre the authority of councils the sanctity of rites the veneration of holy places shrines images vessels furniture and vestments of the sacraments baptism is developed into confirmation on the one hand into penance purgatory and indulgences on the other and the eucharist into the real presence adoration of the host resurrection of the body and the virtue of relics again the doctrine of the sacraments leads to the doctrine of justification justification to that of original sin original sin to the merit of celibacy nor do these separate developments stand independent of each other but by cross relations they are connected and grow together while they grow from one the mass and real presence are parts of one the veneration of saints and their relics are parts of one their intercessory power and the purgatorial state and again the mass and that state are co-relative celibacy is the characteristic mark of monachism and of the priesthood you must accept the whole or reject the whole attenuation does but enfeeble and amputation mutilate it is trifling to receive all but something which is as integral as any other portion and on the other hand it is a solemn thing to accept any part for before you know where you are you may be carried on by a stern logical necessity to accept the whole three next we have to consider that from first to last other developments there are none except those which have possession of christendom none that is of prominence and permanence sufficient to deserve the name in early times the heretical doctrines were confessedly barren and short-lived and could not stand their ground against catholicism as to the medieval period i am not aware that the greeks present more than a negative opposition to the latins and now in like manner the tridentine creed is met by no rival developments there is no antagonist system criticisms objections protests there are in plenty but little of positive teaching anywhere seldom an attempt on the part of any opposing school to master its own doctrines to investigate their sense and bearing to determine their relation to the decrees of trent and their distance from them and when at any time this attempt is by chance in any measure made then an incurable contrariety does but come to view between portions of the theology thus developed and a war of principles an impossibility moreover of reconciling that theology with the general drift of the formularies in which its elements occur and a consequent appearance of unfairness and sophistry in adventurous persons who aim at forcing them into consistency and further a prevalent understanding of the truth of this representation authorities keeping silence eschewing a hopeless enterprise and discouraging it in others and the people plainly intimating that they think both doctrine and usage antiquity and development of very little matter at all and lastly the evident despair of even the better sort of men who in consequence when they set great schemes on foot as for the conversion of the heathen world are afraid to agitate the question of the doctrines to which it is to be converted lest through the opened door they should lose what they have instead of gaining what they have not to the weight of recommendation which this contrast throws upon the developments commonly called catholic must be added the argument which arises from the coincidence of their consistency and permanence with their claim of an infallible sanction a claim the existence of which in some quarter or other of the divine dispensation is as we have already seen antecedently probable all these things being considered i think few persons will deny the very strong presumption which exists that if there must be and are in fact developments in christianity the doctrines propounded by successive popes and councils through so many ages are they
4. A further presumption in behalf of these doctrines arises from the general opinion of the world about them. Christianity being one, all its doctrines are necessarily developments of one, and if so, are of necessity consistent with each other, or form a whole. Now the world fully enters into this view of those well-known developments which claim the name of Catholic. It allows them that title, it considers them to belong to one family, and refers them to one theological system. It is scarcely necessary to set about proving what is urged by their opponents even more strenuously than by their champions. Their opponents avow that they protest not against this doctrine or that, but against one and all. And they seem struck with wonder and perplexity, not to say with awe, at a consistency which they feel to be superhuman, though they would not allow it to be divine. The system is confessed on all hands to bear a character of integrity and indivisibility upon it, both at first view and on inspection. Hence such sayings as the Tota Yacet Babylon of the Distich. Luther did but a part of the work, Calvin another portion, so Sinus finished it. To take up with Luther, and to reject Calvin and Socinus would be, according to that epigram, like living in a house without a roof to it. This, I say, is no private judgment of this man or that, but the common opinion and experience of all countries. The two great divisions of religion feel it, Roman Catholic and Protestant, between whom the controversy lies. Skeptics and liberals who are spectators of the conflict feel it philosophers feel it a school of divines there is i grant dear to memory who have not felt it and their exception will have its weight till we reflect that the particular theology which they advocate has not the prescription of success never has been realized in fact or if realized for a moment had no stay moreover that when it has been enacted by human authority, it has scarcely travelled beyond the paper on which it was printed, or out of the legal forms in which it was embodied. But putting the weight of these revered names at the highest, they do not constitute more than an exception to the general rule, such as is found in every subject that comes into discussion. 5. And this general testimony to the oneness of Catholicism extends to its past teaching relatively to its present, as well as to the portions of its present teaching one with another. No one doubts, with such exception as has just been allowed, that the Roman Catholic communion of this day is the successor and representative of the medieval church, or that the medieval church is the legitimate heir of the Nicene, even allowing that it is a question whether a line cannot be drawn between the Nicene Church and the Church which preceded it. On the whole, all parties will agree that, of all existing systems, the present communion of Rome is the nearest approximation in fact to the Church of the Fathers, possible though some may think it to be nearer still to that Church on paper. Did St. Athanasius or St. Ambrose come suddenly to life, it cannot be doubted what communion he would take to be his own. All surely will agree that these fathers, with whatever opinions of their own, whatever protests, if we will, would find themselves more at home with such men as St. Bernard or St. Ignatius Loyola, or with the lonely priest in his lodging, or the holy sisterhood of mercy, or the unlettered crowd before the altar, than with the teachers or with the members of any other creed. And may we not add that were those same saints who once sojourned, one in exile, one on embassy, at Treves, to come more northward still, and to travel until they reached another fair city, seated among groves, green meadows, and calm streams, the holy brothers would turn from many a high aisle and solemn cloister 
which they found there, and asked the way to some small chapel where mass was said in the populous alley or forlorn suburb. And, on the other hand, can any one who has but heard his name and cursorily read his history doubt for one instant how, in turn, the people of England, we, our princes, our priests, and our prophets, lords and commons, universities, ecclesiastical courts, marts of commerce, great towns, country parishes, would deal with Athanasius, Athanasius, who spent his long years in fighting against sovereigns for a theological term. End of section 4section five of an essay on the development of christian doctrine by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three on the historical argument in behalf of the existing developments section one method of proof it seems then that we have to deal with a case something like the following certain doctrines come to us professing to be apostolic and possessed of such high antiquity that though we are only able to assign the date of their formal establishment to the fourth or the fifth or the eighth or the thirteenth century as it may happen yet their substance may for what appears be coeval with the apostles and be expressed or implied in texts of scripture further these existing doctrines are universally considered without any question in each age to be the echo of the doctrines of the times immediately preceding them and thus are continually thrown back to a date indefinitely early even though their ultimate junction with the apostolic creed be out of sight and unascertainable moreover they are confessed to form one body one with another so that to reject one is to disparage the rest. And they include within the range of their system even those primary articles of faith, as the Incarnation, which many an impugner of the said doctrinal system as a system professes to accept, and which, do what he will, he cannot intelligibly separate, whether in point of evidence or of internal character, from others which he disavows. Further, these doctrines occupy the whole field of theology and leave nothing to be supplied, except in detail, by any other system, while, in matter of fact, no rival system is forthcoming, so that we have to choose between this theology and none at all. Moreover, this theology alone makes provision for that guidance of opinion and conduct which seems externally to be the special aim of revelation, and fulfills the promises of Scripture by adapting itself to the various problems of thought and practice which meet us in life. And further, it is the nearest approach, to say the least, to the religious sentiment and what is called ethos of the early Church, nay, to that of the apostles and prophets, for all will agree so far as this, that Elijah, Jeremiah, the Baptist, and St. Paul are in their history and mode of life, I do not speak of measures of grace, no, nor of doctrine and conduct, for these are points in dispute, but in what is external and meets the eye, and this is no slight resemblance when things are viewed as a whole and from a distance, these saintly and heroic men, I say, are more like a Dominican preacher, or a Jesuit missionary, or a Carmelite friar, more like St. Toribio, or St. Vincent Ferrer, or St. Francis Xavier, or St. Alfonso Liguori, than to any individuals, or to any classes of men that can be found in other communions. And then, in addition, there is the high antecedent probability that Providence would watch over his own work, and would direct and ratify those developments of doctrine which were inevitable. 
2. If this is, on the whole, a true view of the general shape under which the existing body of developments, commonly called Catholic, present themselves before us, antecedently to our looking into the particular evidence on which they stand, I think we shall be at no loss to determine what both logical truth and duty prescribe to us as to our reception of them. It is very little to say that we should treat them as we are accustomed to treat other alleged facts and truths, and the evidence for them, such as come to us with a fair presumption in their favor. Such are of every day's occurrence. And what is our behavior towards them? We meet them, not with suspicion and criticism, but with a frank confidence. We do not, in the first instance, exercise our reason upon opinions which are received, but our faith. We do not begin with doubting. We take them on trust, and we put them on trial, and that not of set purpose, but spontaneously. We prove them by using them, by applying them to the subject matter, or the evidence, or the body of circumstances to which they belong, as if they gave it its interpretation or its color as a matter of course. And only when they fail, in the event, in illustrating phenomena or harmonizing facts, do we discover that we must reject the doctrines or the statements which we had in the first instance taken for granted. Again, we take the evidence for them, whatever it be, as a whole, as forming a combined proof, and we interpret what is obscure in separate portions by such portions as are clear. Moreover, we bear with these in proportion to the strength of the antecedent probability in their favor. We are patient with difficulties in their application, with apparent objections to them drawn from other matters of fact, deficiency in their comprehensiveness, or want of neatness in their working, provided their claims on our attention are considerable. 3. Thus most men take Newton's theory of gravitation for granted, because it is generally received, and use it without rigidly testing it first, each for himself, as it can be tested, by phenomena. And if phenomena are found which it does not satisfactorily solve, this does not trouble us, for a way there must be of explaining them, consistently with that theory, though it does not occur to ourselves. Again, if we found a concise or obscure passage in one of Cicero's letters to Atticus, we should not scruple to admit as its true explanation a more explicit statement in his Ad Familiaris. Aeschylus is illustrated by Sophocles in point of language, and Thucydides by Aristophanes in point of history. Horace, Perseus, Suetonius, Tacitus, and Juvenal may be made to throw light upon each other. Even Plato may gain a commentator in Plotinus, and St. Anselm is interpreted by St. Thomas. Two writers, indeed, may be already known to differ, and then we do not join them together as fellow witnesses to common truths. Luther has taken on himself to explain St. Augustine, and Voltaire, Pascal, without persuading the world that they have a claim to do so. But in no case do we begin with asking whether a comment does not disagree with its text when there is a prima facie congruity between them. We elucidate the text by the comment though, or rather because, the comment is fuller and more explicit than the text. 4. Thus, too, we deal with Scripture, when we have to interpret the prophetical text and the types of the Old Testament. The event which is the development is also the interpretation of the prediction. It provides a fulfillment by imposing a meaning. And we accept certain events as the fulfillment of prophecy from the broad correspondence of the one with the other, in spite of many incidental difficulties. The difficulty, for instance, in accounting for the fact that the dispersion of the Jews followed upon their keeping, not their departing from their law, does not hinder us from insisting on their present state as an argument against the infidel. 
Again, we readily submit our reason on competent authority and accept certain events as an accomplishment of predictions which seem very far removed from them, as in the passage, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Nor do we find a difficulty when St. Paul appeals to a text of the Old Testament which stands otherwise in our Hebrew copies, as the words, A body hast thou prepared me. We receive such difficulties on faith and leave them to take care of themselves. Much less do we consider mere fullness in the interpretation, or definiteness, or again strangeness, as a sufficient reason for depriving the text, or the action to which it is applied, of the advantage of such interpretation. We make it no objection that the words themselves come short of it, or that the sacred writer did not contemplate it, or that a previous fulfillment satisfies it. A reader who came to the inspired text by himself, beyond the influence of that traditional acceptation which happily encompasses it, would be surprised to be told that the prophet's words, A virgin shall conceive, etc., or Let all the angels of God worship him, refer to our Lord, but assuming the intimate connection between Judaism and Christianity, and the inspiration of the New Testament, we do not scruple to believe it. We rightly feel that it is no prejudice to our receiving the prophecy of Balaam in its Christian meaning that it is adequately fulfilled in David, or the history of Jonah that it is poetical in character and has a moral in itself like an apologue, or the meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek that it is too brief and simple to mean any great thing, as St. Paul interprets it. 5. Butler corroborates these remarks when speaking of the particular evidence for Christianity. Quote, the obscurity or unintelligibleness, he says, of one part of a prophecy does not in any degree invalidate the proof of foresight arising from the appearing completion of those other parts which are understood. For the case is evidently the same as if those parts which are not understood were lost or not written at all, or written in an unknown tongue. Whether this observation be commonly attended to or not, it is so evident that one can scarce bring oneself to set down an instance in common matters to exemplify it. End quote. He continues, quote, Though a man should be incapable, for want of learning or opportunities of inquiry, or from not having turned his studies this way, even so much as to judge whether particular prophecies have been throughout completely fulfilled, yet he may see in general that they have been fulfilled to such a degree as, upon very good ground, to be convinced of foresight more than human in such prophecies, and of such events being intended by them. For the same reason also, though, by means of the deficiencies in civil history, and the different accounts of historians, the most learned should not be able to make out to satisfaction that such parts of the prophetic history have been minutely and throughout fulfilled, yet a very strong proof of foresight may arise from that general completion of them which is made out. As much proof of foresight, perhaps, as the giver of prophecy intended should ever be afforded by such parts of prophecy. End quote. 6. He illustrates this by the parallel instance of fable and concealed satire. Quote, a man might be assured that he understood what an author intended by a fable or parable, related without any application or moral, merely from seeing it to be easily capable of such application, and that such a moral might naturally be deduced from it. And he might be fully assured that such persons and events were intended in a satirical writing merely from its being applicable to them. And, agreeably to the last observation, he might be in a good measure satisfied of it, though he were not enough informed in affairs or in the story of such persons to understand half the satire. For his satisfaction that he understood the meaning, the intended meaning of these writings, 
would be greater or less in proportion as he saw the general turn of them to be capable of such application and in proportion to the number of particular things capable of it End quote. and he infers hence that if a known course of events or the history of a person as our lord is found to answer on the whole to the prophetical text it becomes fairly the right interpretation of that text in spite of difficulties in detail and this rule of interpretation admits of an obvious application to the parallel case of doctrinal passages when a certain creed which professes to have been derived from revelation comes recommended to us on strong antecedent grounds and presents no strong opposition to the sacred text the same author observes that the first fulfillment of a prophecy is no valid objection to a second when what seems like a second has once taken place and in like manner an interpretation of doctrinal texts may be literal exact and sufficient yet in spite of all this may not embrace what is really the full scope of their meaning and that fuller scope if it so happen may be less satisfactory and precise as an interpretation than their primary and narrow sense thus if the protestant interpretation of the sixth chapter of saint john were true and sufficient for its letter which of course i do not grant that would not hinder the roman which at least is quite compatible with the text being the higher sense and the only rightful in such cases the justification of the larger and higher interpretation lies in some antecedent probability such as catholic consent and the ground of the narrow is the context and the rules of grammar and whereas the argument of the critical commentator is that the sacred text need not mean more than the letter those who adopt a deeper view of it maintain as butler in the case of prophecy that we have no warrant for putting a limit to the sense of words which are not human but divine seven now it is but a parallel exercise of reasoning to interpret the previous history of a doctrine by its later development and to consider that it contains the later in posse and in the divine intention and the grudging and jealous temper which refuses to enlarge the sacred text for the fulfillment of prophecy is the very same that will occupy itself in carping at the anti-nicene testimonies for nicene or medieval doctrines and usages when i and my father are one is urged in proof of our lord's unity with the father heretical disputants do not see why the words must be taken to denote more than a unity of will when this is my body is alleged as a warrant for the change of the bread into the body of christ they explain away the words into a figure because such is their most obvious interpretation and in like manner when roman catholics urge saint gregory's invocations they are told that these are but rhetorical or saint clement's allusion to purgatory that perhaps it was platonism or origen's language about praying to angels and the merits of martyrs that it is but an instance of his heterodoxy or saint cyprian's exaltation of the cathedra petri that he need not be contemplating more than a figurative or abstract sea or the general testimony to the spiritual authority of rome in primitive times that it arose from her temporal greatness or tertullian's language about tradition and the church that he took a lawyer's view of those subjects whereas the early condition and the evidence of each doctrine respectively ought consistently to be interpreted by means of that development which was ultimately attained eight moreover since as above shown the doctrines all together make up one integral religion it follows that the several evidences which respectively support those doctrines belong to a whole and must be thrown into a common stock and all are available in the defence of any a collection of weak evidences makes up a strong evidence again 
one strong argument imparts cogency to collateral arguments which are in themselves weak. For instance, as to the miracles, whether of Scripture or the Church, quote, the number of those which carry with them their own proof now, and are believed for their own sake, is small, and they furnish the grounds on which we receive the rest. End quote. Again, no one would fancy it necessary, before receiving St. Matthew's Gospel, to find primitive testimony in behalf of every chapter and verse. When only part is proved to have been in existence in ancient times, the whole is proved, because that part is but part of a whole, and when the whole is proved, it may shelter such parts as for some incidental reason have less evidence of their antiquity. Again, it would be enough to show that St. Augustine knew the Italic version of the Scriptures if he quoted it once or twice, and in like manner it will be generally admitted that the proof of a second person in the Godhead lightens greatly the burden of proof necessary for a belief in a third person, and that the atonement being in some sort a correlative of eternal punishment, the evidence for the former doctrine virtually increases the evidence for the latter. And so a Protestant controversialist would feel that it told little, except as an omen of victory, to reduce an opponent to a denial of transubstantiation if he still adhered firmly to the invocation of saints, purgatory, the seven sacraments, and the doctrine of merit, and little too for one of his own party to condemn the adoration of the host, the supremacy of Rome, the acceptableness of celibacy, auricular confession, communion under one kind, and tradition, if he was zealous for the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. 9. The principle on which these remarks are made has the sanction of some of the deepest of English divines. Bishop Butler, for instance, who has so often been quoted here, thus argues in behalf of Christianity itself, though confessing at the same time the disadvantage which in consequence the revealed system lies under. Quote, Probable proofs, he observes, by being added not only increase the evidence, but multiply it. Nor should I dissuade any one from setting down what he thought made for the contrary side. The truth of our religion, like the truth of common matters, is to be judged by all the evidence taken together. And unless the whole series of things which may be alleged in this argument, and every particular thing in it, can reasonably be supposed to have been by accident, for here the stress of the argument for Christianity lies, then is the truth of it proved. In like manner, as if, in any common case, numerous events acknowledged were to be alleged in proof of any other event disputed, the truth of the disputed event would be proved, not only if any one of the acknowledged ones did of itself clearly imply it, but, though no one of them singly did so, if the whole of the acknowledged events taken together could not in reason be supposed to have happened unless the disputed one were true. Quote, it is obvious how much advantage the nature of this evidence gives to those persons who attack Christianity, especially in conversation. For it is easy to show, in a short and lively manner, that such and such things are liable to objection, that this and another thing is of little weight in itself, but impossible to show, in like manner, the united force of the whole argument in one view. End quote. In like manner, Mr. Davison condemns that quote, vicious manner of reasoning which represents any insufficiency of the proof in its several branches as so much objection, which manages the inquiry so as to make it appear that if the divided arguments be inconclusive one by one, we have a series of exceptions to the truths of religion instead of a train of favorable presumptions growing stronger at every step. The disciple of skepticism is taught that he cannot fully rely on this or that motive of belief, that each of them is insecure, and the conclusion is put upon him that they ought to be discarded one after another 
instead of being connected and combined. End quote. No work, perhaps, affords more specimens in a short compass of the breach of the principle of reasoning inculcated in these passages than Barrow's treatise on the Pope's supremacy. 10. The remarks of these two writers relate to the duty of combining doctrines which belong to one body and evidences which relate to one subject, and few persons would dispute it in the abstract. The application which has been here made of the principle is this, that where a doctrine comes recommended to us by strong presumptions of its truth, we are bound to receive it unsuspiciously and use it as a key to the evidences to which it appeals, or the facts which it professes to systematize, whatever may be our eventual judgment about it. Nor is it enough to answer that the voice of our particular Church, denying this so-called Catholicism, is an antecedent probability which outweighs all others and claims our prior obedience, loyally and without reasoning, to its own interpretation. This may excuse individuals, certainly, in beginning with doubt and distrust of the Catholic developments, but it only shifts the blame to the particular church, Anglican or other, which thinks itself qualified to enforce so peremptory a judgment against the one and only successor, heir, and representative of the Apostolic College. Section 2. State of the Evidence Bacon is celebrated for destroying the credit of a method of reasoning much resembling that which it has been the object of this chapter to recommend. Quote, he who is not practiced in doubting, he says, but forward in asserting and laying down such principles as he takes to be approved, granted, and manifest, and according to the established truth thereof, receives or rejects everything, as squaring with, or proving contrary to them, is only fitted to mix and confound things with words, reason with madness, and the world with fable and fiction, but not to interpret the works of nature. End quote. But he was aiming at the application of these modes of reasoning to what should be strict investigation, and that in the province of physics and this he might well censure without attempting what is impossible to banish them from history, ethics, and religion. Physical facts are present. They are submitted to the senses, and the senses may be satisfactorily tested, corrected, and verified. To trust to anything but sense in a matter of sense is irrational, why are the senses given us but to supersede less certain, less immediate informants? We have recourse to reason or authority to determine facts when the senses fail us, but with the senses we begin. We deduce, we form inductions, we abstract, we theorize from facts. We do not begin with surmise and conjecture, much less do we look to the tradition of past ages or the decree of foreign teachers to determine matters which are in our hands and under our eyes. But it is otherwise with history, the facts of which are not present. It is otherwise with ethics, in which phenomena are more subtle, closer, and more personal to individuals than other facts, and not referable to any common standard by which all men can decide upon them. In such sciences, we cannot rest upon mere facts, if we would, because we have not got them. We must do our best with what is given us, and look about for aid from any quarter, and in such circumstances, the opinions of others, the traditions of ages, the prescriptions of authority, antecedent auguries, analogies, parallel cases, these and the like, not indeed taken at random, but, like the evidence from the senses, sifted and scrutinized, obviously become of great importance. 2. And further, if we proceed on the hypothesis that a merciful providence 
has supplied us with means of gaining such truth as concerns us in different subject matters, though with different instruments, then the simple question is what those instruments are which are proper to a particular case. If they are of the appointment of a divine protector, we may be sure that they will lead to the truth, whatever they are. The less exact methods of reasoning may do his work as well as the more perfect, if he blesses them. He may bless antecedent probabilities in ethical inquiries, who blesses experience and induction in the art of medicine. And if it is reasonable to consider medicine, or architecture, or engineering, in a certain sense, divine arts, as being divinely ordained means of our receiving divine benefits, much more may ethics be called divine, while as to religion, it directly professes to be the method of recommending ourselves to him and learning his will. If then it be his gracious purpose that we should learn it, the means he gives for learning it, be they promising or not to human eyes, are sufficient, because they are his. And what they are at this particular time, or to this person, depends on his disposition. He may have imposed simple prayer and obedience on some men as the instrument of their attaining to the mysteries and precepts of Christianity. He may lead others through the written word, at least for some stages of their course. And if the formal basis on which he has rested his revelations be, as it is, of an historical and philosophical character, then antecedent probabilities, subsequently corroborated by facts, will be sufficient, as in the parallel case of other history, to bring us safely to the matter, or at least to the organ of those revelations. 3. Moreover, in subjects which belong to moral proof, such, I mean, as history, antiquities, political science, ethics, metaphysics, and theology, which are preeminently such, and especially in theology and ethics, antecedent probability may have a real weight and cogency which it cannot have in experimental science. And a mature politician or divine may have a power of reaching matters of fact in consequence of his peculiar habits of mind, which is seldom given in the same degree to physical inquirers, who, for the purposes of this particular pursuit, are very much on a level. And this last remark at least is confirmed by Lord Bacon, who confesses, quote, Our method of discovering the sciences does not much depend upon subtlety and strength of genius, but lies level to almost every capacity and understanding. End quote. Though surely sciences there are in which genius is everything, and rules all but nothing. 4. It will be a great mistake, then, to suppose that, because this eminent philosopher condemned presumption and prescription in inquiries into facts which are external to us, present with us, and common to us all, therefore authority, tradition, verisimilitude, analogy, and the like, are mere idols of the den or of the theatre in history or ethics. Here we may oppose to him an author in his own line as great as he is. Quote, Experience, says Bacon, is by far the best demonstration, provided it dwell in the experiment, for the transferring of it to other things judged alike is very fallacious unless done with great exactness and regularity. End quote. Niebuhr explains or corrects him. Quote, Instances are not arguments, he grants, when investigating an obscure question of Roman history. Instances are not arguments, but in history are scarcely of less force, above all, where the parallel they exhibit is in the progressive development of institutions. End quote. Here, this sagacious writer recognizes the true principle of historical logic, while he exemplifies it. The same principle is involved in the well-known maxim of Aristotle that, quote, it is much the same to admit the probabilities of a mathematician and to look for demonstration from an orator, end quote. 
in all matters of human life presumption verified by instances is our ordinary instrument of proof and if the antecedent probability is great it almost supersedes instances of course as is plain we may err grievously in the antecedent view which we start with and in that case our conclusions may be wide of the truth but that only shows that we had no right to assume a premise which was untrustworthy not that our reasoning was faulty five i am speaking of the process itself and its correctness is shown by its general adoption in religious questions a single text of scripture is all sufficient with most people whether the well-disposed or the prejudiced to prove a doctrine or a duty in cases when a custom is established or a tradition is strong quote, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together end quote, is sufficient for establishing social public nay sunday worship quote, where the tree falleth there shall it lie end quote, shows that our probation ends with life quote, forbidding to marry end quote, determines the pope to be the man of sin again it is plain that a man's after course for good or bad brings out the passing words or obscure actions of previous years then on a retrospect we use the event as a presumptive interpretation of the past of those past indications of his character which considered as evidence were too few and doubtful to bear insisting on at the time and would have seemed ridiculous had we attempted to do so and the antecedent probability is even found to triumph over contrary evidence as well as to sustain what agrees with it every one may know of cases in which a plausible charge against an individual was borne down at once by weight of character though that character was incommensurate of course with the circumstances which gave rise to suspicion and had no direct neutralizing force to destroy it on the other hand it is sometimes said and even if not literally true will serve in illustration that not a few of those who are put on trial in our criminal courts are not legally guilty of the particular crime on which a verdict is found against them being convicted not so much upon the particular evidence as on the presumption arising from their want of character and the memory of their former offences nor is it in slight matters only or unimportant that we thus act our dearest interests our personal welfare our property our health our reputation we freely hazard not on proof but on a simple probability which is sufficient for our conviction because prudence dictates to us so to take it we must be content to follow the law of our being in religious matters as well as in secular six but there is more to say on the subordinate position which direct evidence holds among the motiva of conviction in most matters it is no paradox to say that there is a certain scantiness nay an absence of evidence which may even tell in favor of statements which require to be made good there are indeed cases in which we cannot discover the law of silence or deficiency which are then simply unaccountable thus lucian for whatever reason hardly notices roman authors or affairs maximus tyrius who wrote several of his works at rome nevertheless makes no reference to roman history paterculus the historian is mentioned by no ancient writer except priscian what is more to our present purpose seneca pliny the elder and plutarch are altogether silent about christianity and perhaps epictetus also and the emperor marcus the jewish mishnah too compiled about a d one hundred and eighty is silent about christianity and the jerusalem and babylonish talmuds almost so though the one was compiled about a d three hundred and the other a d five hundred eusebius again is very uncertain in his notice of facts 
he does not speak of saint methodius nor of saint anthony nor of the martyrdom of saint perpetua nor of the miraculous powers of saint gregory thaumaturgus and he mentions constantine's luminous cross not in his ecclesiastical history where it would naturally find a place but in his life of the emperor moreover those who receive that wonderful occurrence which is as one who rejects it allows quote, so inexplicable to the historical inquirer end quote, have to explain the difficulty of the universal silence on the subject of all the fathers of the fourth and fifth centuries excepting eusebius in like manner scripture has its unexplained omissions no religious school finds its own tenets and usages on the surface of it the remark applies also to the very context of scripture as in the obscurity which hangs over nathaniel or the magdalene it is a remarkable circumstance that there is no direct intimation all through scripture that the serpent mentioned in the temptation of eve was the evil spirit till we come to the vision of the woman and child and their adversary the dragon in the twelfth chapter of the apocalypse seven omissions thus absolute and singular when they occur in the evidence of facts or doctrines are of course difficulties on the other hand not unfrequently they admit of explanation silence may arise from the very notoriety of the facts in question as in the case of the seasons the weather or other natural phenomena or from their sacredness as the athenians would not mention the mythological theories or from external constraint as the omission of the statues of brutus and cassius in the procession or it may proceed from fear or disgust as on the arrival of unwelcome news or from indignation or hatred or contempt or perplexity as josephus is silent about christianity and eusebius passes over the death of crispus in his life of constantine or from other strong feeling as implied in the poet's sentiment give sorrow words or from policy or other prudential motive or propriety as queen's speeches do not mention individuals however influential in the political world and newspapers after a time were silent about the cholera or again from the natural and gradual course which the fact took as in the instance of inventions and discoveries the history of which is on this account often obscure or from loss of documents or other direct testimonies as we should not look for theological information in a treatise on geology eight again it frequently happens that omissions proceed on some law as the varying influence of an external cause and then so far from being a perplexity they may even confirm such evidence as occurs by becoming as it were its correlative for instance an obstacle may be assignable person or principle or accident which ought if it exists to reduce or distort the indications of a fact to that very point or in that very direction or with the variations or in the order and succession which do occur in its actual history at first sight it might be a suspicious circumstance that but one or two manuscripts of some celebrated document were forthcoming but if it were known that the sovereign power had exerted itself to suppress and destroy it at the time of its publication and that the extant manuscripts were found just in those places where history witnessed to the failure of the attempt the coincidence would be highly corroborative of that evidence which alone remained thus it is possible to have too much evidence that is evidence so full or exact as to throw suspicion over the case for which it is adduced the genuine epistles of saint ignatius contain none of those ecclesiastical terms such as priest or see which are so frequent afterwards and they quote scripture sparingly the interpolated epistles quote it largely that is they are too scriptural to be apostolic 
few persons again who are acquainted with the primitive theology but will be sceptical at first reading of the authenticity of such works as the longer creed of saint gregory thaumaturgus or saint hippolytus contra Beronim, from the precision of the theological language which is unsuitable to the antinicene period nine the influence of circumstances upon the expression of opinion or testimony supplies another form of the same law of omission. Quote, I am ready to admit, says Paley, that the ancient Christian advocates did not insist upon the miracles in argument so frequently as I should have done. It was their lot to contend with notions of magical agency against which the mere production of the facts was not sufficient for the convincing of their adversaries. I do not know whether they themselves thought it quite decisive of the controversy, but since it is proved, I conceive with certainty that the sparingness with which they appealed to miracles was owing neither to their ignorance nor their doubt of the facts. It is at any rate an objection not to the truth of the history, but to the judgment of its defenders." End quote and in like manner christians were not likely to entertain the question of the abstract allowableness of images in the catholic ritual with the actual superstitions and immoralities of paganism before their eyes nor were they likely to determine the place of the blessed mary in our reverence before they had duly secured in the affections of the faithful the supreme glory and worship of god incarnate her eternal lord and son nor would they recognize purgatory as a part of the dispensation till the world had flowed into the church and a habit of corruption had been largely superinduced nor could ecclesiastical liberty be asserted till it had been assailed nor would a pope arise but in proportion as the church was consolidated nor would monachism be needed while martyrdoms were in progress nor could St. Clement give judgment on the doctrine of Berengarius, nor St. Dionysius refute the Ubiquists, nor St. Irenaeus denounce the Protestant view of justification, nor St. Cyprian draw up a theory of toleration. There is, quote, a time for every purpose under the heaven, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, End quote. 10 sometimes when the want of evidence for a series of facts or doctrines is unaccountable an unexpected explanation or addition in the course of time is found as regards a portion of them which suggests a ground of patience as regards the historical obscurity of the rest two instances are obvious to mention of an accidental silence of clear primitive testimony as to important doctrines and its removal in the number of the articles of catholic belief which the reformation especially resisted were the mass and the sacramental virtue of ecclesiastical unity since the date of that movement the shorter epistles of saint ignatius have been discovered and the early liturgies verified and this with most men has put an end to the controversy about those doctrines the good fortune which has happened to them may happen to others and though it does not yet that it has happened to them is to those others a sort of compensation for the obscurity in which their early history continues to be involved eleven i may seem in these remarks to be preparing the way for a broad admission of the absence of any sanction in primitive christianity in behalf of its medieval form but i do not make them with this intention not from misgivings of this kind but from the claims of a sound logic i think it right to insist that whatever early testimonies i may bring in support of later developments of doctrine are in great measure brought ex abundante a matter of grace not of compulsion the onus probandi is with those who assail a teaching which is and has long been in possession as for positive evidence in our behalf, they must take what they can get, if they cannot get as much as they might wish, 
inasmuch as antecedent probabilities, as I have said, go so very far towards dispensing with it. It is a first strong point that, in an idea such as Christianity, developments cannot but be, and those surely divine, because it is divine. A second that, if so, they are those very ones which exist, because there are no others. And a third point is the fact that they are found just there, where true developments ought to be found, namely, in the historic seats of apostolical teaching and in the authoritative homes of immemorial tradition. 12. And if it be said in reply that the difficulty of admitting these developments of doctrine lies not merely in the absence of early testimony for them, but in the actual existence of distinct testimony against them, or, as Chillingworth says in Popes Against Popes, Councils Against Councils, I answer, of course this will be said. But let the fact of this objection be carefully examined, and its value reduced to its true measure before it is used in argument. I grant that there are, quote, bishops against bishops in church history, fathers against fathers, fathers against themselves, end quote, for such differences in individual writers are consistent with, or rather are involved in the very idea of doctrinal development, and consequently are no real objection to it. The one essential question is whether the recognized organ of teaching, the Church herself, acting through Pope or Council as the Oracle of Heaven, has ever contradicted her own enunciations. If so, the hypothesis which I am advocating is at once shattered. But, till I have positive and distinct evidence of the fact, I am slow to give credence to the existence of so great an improbability. End of section 5「6 of an Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine」by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. Instances in Illustration. Part 1. It follows now to inquire how much evidence is actually producible for those large portions of the present creed of Christendom which have not a recognized place in the primordial idea and the historical outline of the religion, yet which come to us with certain antecedent considerations strong enough in reason to raise the effectiveness of that evidence to a point disproportionate, as I have allowed, to its intrinsic value. In urging these considerations here, of course, I exclude for the time the force of the Church's claim of infallibility in her acts, for which so much can be said. But I do not exclude the logical cogency of those acts considered as testimonies to the faith of the times before them. My argument, then, is this, that, from the first age of Christianity, its teaching looked towards those ecclesiastical dogmas afterwards recognized and defined, with, as time went on, more or less determinate advance in the direction of them, till at length that advance became so pronounced as to justify their definition and to bring it about, and to place them in the position of rightful interpretations and keys of the remains and the records in history of the teaching which had so terminated. 2. This line of argument is not unlike that which is considered to constitute a sufficient proof of truths in physical science. An instance of this is furnished us in a work on mechanics of the past generation by a writer of name, and his explanation of it will serve as an introduction to our immediate subject. After treating of the laws of motion, he goes on to observe, quote, these laws are the simplest principles to which motion can be reduced, and upon them the whole theory depends. 
they are not indeed self-evident nor do they admit of accurate proof by experiment on account of the great nicety required in adjusting the instruments and making the experiments and on account of the effects of friction and the air's resistance which cannot entirely be removed they are however constantly and invariably suggested to our senses and they agree with experiment as far as experiment can go and the more accurately the experiments are made and the greater care we take to remove all those impediments which tend to render the conclusions erroneous the more nearly do the experiments coincide with these laws End quote. and thus a converging evidence in favor of certain doctrines may under circumstances be as clear a proof of their apostolical origin as can be reached practically from the quod semper quod ubique quod ab omnibus in such a method of proof there is first an imperfect secondly a growing evidence thirdly in consequence a delayed inference and judgment fourthly reasons producible to account for the delay section one instances cursorily noticed one item one canon of the new testament as regards the new testament catholics and protestants receive the same books as canonical and inspired yet among those books some are to be found which certainly have no right there if following the rule of vincentius we receive nothing as of divine authority but what has been received always and everywhere the degrees of evidence are very various for one book and another Quote, it is confessed says less that not all the scriptures of our new testament have been received with universal consent as genuine works of the evangelists and apostles but that man must have predetermined to oppose the most palpable truths and must reject all history who will not confess that the greater part of the new testament has been universally received as authentic and that the remaining books have been acknowledged as such by the majority of the ancients End quote. two for instance as to the epistle of st james it is true it is contained in the old syriac version in the second century but origin in the third century is the first writer who distinctly mentions it among the greeks and it is not quoted by name by any latin till the fourth st jerome speaks of its gaining credit quote, by degrees in process of time end quote. eusebius says no more than that it had been up to his time acknowledged by the majority and he classes it with the shepherd of st hermas and the epistle of st barnabas again quote, the epistle to the hebrews though received in the east was not received in the latin churches till st jerome's time st irenaeus either does not affirm or denies that it is st paul's tertullian ascribes it to st barnabas caius excludes it from his list st hippolytus does not receive it st cyprian is silent about it it is doubtful whether st optatus received it End quote. again st jerome tells us that in his day towards a d four hundred the greek church rejected the apocalypse but the latin received it again quote, the new testament consists of twenty-seven books in all though of varying importance of these fourteen are not mentioned at all till from eighty to one hundred years after st john's death in which number are the acts the second to the corinthians the galatians the colossians the two to the thessalonians and st james of the other thirteen five videlicet st john's gospel the philippians the first to timothy the hebrews and the first of st john are quoted but by one writer during the same period End quote. three 
on what ground then do we receive the canon as it comes to us but on the authority of the church of the fourth and fifth centuries the church at that era decided not merely bore testimony but passed a judgment on former testimony decided that certain books were of authority and on what ground did she so decide on the ground that hitherto a decision had been impossible in an age of persecution from want of opportunities for research discussion and testimony from the private or the local character of some of the books and from misapprehension of the doctrine contained in others now however facilities were at length given for deciding once for all on what had been in suspense and doubt for three centuries on this subject i will quote another passage from the same tract quote, we depend upon the fourth and fifth centuries thus as to scripture former centuries do not speak distinctly frequently or unanimously except of some chief books as the gospels but we see in them as we believe an ever-growing tendency and approximation to that full agreement which we find in the fifth the testimony given at the latter date is the limit to which all that has been before said converges for instance it is commonly said exceptio probat regulam when we have reason to think that a writer or an age would have witnessed so and so but for this or that and that this or that were mere accidents of his position then he or it may be said to tend towards such testimony in this way the first centuries tend towards the fifth viewing the matter as one of moral evidence we seem to see in the testimony of the fifth the very testimony which every preceding century gave accidents excepted such as the present loss of documents once extant or the then existing misconceptions which want of intercourse between the churches occasioned the fifth century acts as a comment on the obscure text of the centuries before it and brings out a meaning which with the help of the comment any candid person sees really to be theirs End quote. four item two original sin i have already remarked upon the historical fact that the recognition of original sin considered as the consequence of adam's fall was both as regards general acceptance and accurate understanding a gradual process not completed till the time of augustine and pelagius saint chrysostom lived close up to that date but there are passages in his works often quoted which we should not expect to find worded as they stand if they had been written fifty years later it is commonly and reasonably said in explanation that the fatalism so prevalent in various shapes pagan and heretical in the first centuries was an obstacle to an accurate apprehension of the consequences of the fall as the presence of the existing idolatry was to the use of images if this be so we have here an instance of a doctrine held back for a time by circumstances yet in the event forcing its way into its normal shape and at length authoritatively fixed in it that is of a doctrine held implicitly then asserting itself and at length fully developed five item three infant baptism one of the passages of saint chrysostom to which i might refer is this quote, we baptize infants though they are not defiled with sin that they may receive sanctity righteousness adoption heirship brotherhood with christ and may become his members end quote this at least shows that he had a clear view of the importance and duty of infant baptism but such was not the case even with saints in the generation immediately before him as is well known it was not unusual in that age of the church for those who might be considered catechumens to delay their baptism as protestants now delay reception of the holy eucharist 
it is difficult for us at this day to enter into the assemblage of motives which led to this postponement to a keen sense and awe of the special privileges of baptism which could only once be received other reasons would be added reluctance to being committed to a strict rule of life and to making a public profession of religion and to joining in a specially intimate fellowship or solidarity with strangers but so it was in matter of fact for reasons good or bad that infant baptism which is a fundamental rule of christian duty with us was less earnestly insisted on in early times six even in the fourth century saint gregory nazianzen saint basil and saint augustine having christian mothers still were not baptized till they were adults saint gregory's mother dedicated him to god immediately on his birth and again when he had come to years of discretion with the right of taking the gospels into his hands by way of consecration he was religiously minded from his youth and had devoted himself to a single life yet his baptism did not take place till after he had attended the schools of caesarea palestine and alexandria and was on his voyage to athens he had embarked during the november gales and for twenty days his life was in danger he presented himself for baptism as soon as he got to land st basil was the son of christian confessors on both father's and mother's side his grandmother macrina who brought him up had for seven years lived with her husband in the woods of pontus during the decian persecution his father was said to have wrought miracles his mother an orphan of great beauty of person was forced from her unprotected state to abandon the hope of a single life and was conspicuous in matrimony for her care of strangers and the poor and for her offerings to the churches how religiously she brought up her children is shown by the singular blessing that four out of ten have since been canonized as saints saint basil was one of these yet the child of such parents was not baptized till he had come to man's estate till according to the benedictine editor his twenty-first and perhaps his twenty-ninth year saint augustine's mother who is herself a saint was a christian when he was born though his father was not immediately on his birth he was made a catechumen in his childhood he fell ill and asked for baptism his mother was alarmed and was taking measures for his reception into the church when he suddenly got better and it was deferred he did not receive baptism till the age of thirty-three after he had been for nine years a victim of manichaean error in like manner saint ambrose though brought up by his mother and holy nuns one of them his own sister saint marcelina was not baptized till he was chosen bishop at the age of about thirty-four nor his brother saint satyrus till about the same age after the serious warning of a shipwreck saint jerome too though educated at rome and so far under religious influences as with other boys to be in the observance of sunday and of devotions in the catacombs had no friend to bring him to baptism till he had reached man's estate and had traveled seven now how are the modern sects which protest against infant baptism to be answered by anglicans with this array of great names in their favor by the later rule of the church surely by the dicta of some later saints as by saint chrysostom by one or two inferences from scripture by an argument founded on the absolute necessity of baptism for salvation sufficient reasons certainly but impotent to reverse the fact that neither in dalmatia nor in cappadocia neither in rome nor in africa was it then imperative on christian parents as it is now to give baptism to their young children it was on retrospect and after the truths of the creed had sunk into the christian mind that the authority of such men as saint cyprian saint chrysostom and saint augustine brought round the orbis terrarum to the conclusion 
which the infallible church confirmed that observance of the right was the rule and the non-observance the exception eight item four communion in one kind in the beginning of the fifteenth century the council of constance pronounced that quote, though in the primitive church the sacrament of the eucharist was received by the faithful under each kind yet the custom has been reasonably introduced for the avoiding of certain dangers and scandals that it should be received by the consecrators under each kind and by the laity only under the kind of bread since it is most firmly to be believed and in no wise doubted that the whole body and blood of christ is truly contained as well under the kind of bread as under the kind of wine End quote. now the question is whether the doctrine here laid down and carried into effect in the usage here sanctioned was entertained by the early church and may be considered a just development of its principles and practices i answer that starting with the presumption that the council has ecclesiastical authority which is the point here to be assumed we shall find quite enough for its defence and shall be satisfied to decide in the affirmative we shall readily come to the conclusion that communion under either kind is lawful each kind conveying the full gift of the sacrament for instance scripture affords us two instances of what may reasonably be considered the administration of the form of bread without that of wine videlicet our lord's own example towards the two disciples at emmaus and saint paul's action at sea during the tempest moreover saint luke speaks of the first christians as continuing in the quote, breaking of bread and in prayer end quote, and of the first day of the week quote, when they came together to break bread end quote. and again in the sixth chapter of saint john our lord says absolutely he that eateth me even he shall live by me and though he distinctly promises that we shall have it granted to us to drink his blood as well as to eat his flesh nevertheless not a word does he say to signify that as he is the bread from heaven and the living bread so he is the heavenly living wine also again saint paul says that quote, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the lord End quote. many of the types of the holy eucharist as far as they go tend to the same conclusion as the manna to which our lord referred the paschal lamb the showbread the sacrifices from which the blood was poured out and the miracle of the loaves which are figures of the bread alone while the water from the rock and the blood from our lord's side correspond to the wine without the bread others are representations of both kinds as melchizedek's feast and elijah's miracle of the meal and oil nine and further it certainly was the custom in the early church under circumstances to communicate in one kind as we learn from saint cyprian saint dionysius st basil st jerome and others for instance st cyprian speaks of the communion of an infant under wine and of a woman under bread and st ambrose speaks of his brother in shipwreck folding the consecrated bread in a handkerchief and placing it round his neck and the monks and hermits in the desert can hardly be supposed to have been ordinarily in possession of consecrated wine as well as bread from the following letter of saint basil it appears that not only the monks but the whole laity of egypt ordinarily communicated in bread only he seems to have been asked by his correspondent whether in time of persecution it was lawful in the absence of priest or deacon to take the communion in one's own hand that is of course the bread he answers that it may be justified 
by the following parallel cases, in mentioning which he is altogether silent about the cup. Quote, it is plainly no fault, he says, for long custom supplies instances enough to sanction it. For all the monks in the desert, where there is no priest, keep the communion at home and partake it from themselves. In Alexandria, too, and in Egypt, each of the laity, for the most part, has the communion in his house, and when he will, he partakes it by means of himself. For when once the priest has celebrated the sacrifice and given it, he who takes it as a whole together and then partakes of it daily, reasonably ought to think that he partakes and receives from him who has given it. End quote. It should be added that in the beginning of the letter he may be interpreted to speak of communion in both kinds and to say that it is quote, good and profitable. End quote. Here we have the usage of Pontus, Egypt, Africa, and Milan. Spain may be added if a late author is right in his view of the meaning of a Spanish canon, and Syria as well as Egypt, at least at a later date, since Nicephorus tells us that the acephali, having no bishops, kept the bread which their last priests had consecrated, and dispensed crumbs of it every year at Easter for the purposes of communion. 10. But it may be said that after all it is so very hazardous and fearful a measure actually to withdraw from Christians one half of the sacrament, that in spite of these precedents, some direct warrant is needed to reconcile the mind to it. There might have been circumstances which led St. Cyprian or St. Basil or the apostolical Christians before them to curtail it, about which we know nothing. It is not, therefore, safe in us, because it was safe in them. Certainly, a warrant is necessary, and just such a warrant is the authority of the Church. If we can trust her implicitly, there is nothing in the state of the evidence to form an objection to her decision in this instance, and in proportion as we find we can trust her does our difficulty lessen. Moreover, children, not to say infants, were at one time admitted to the Eucharist, at least to the cup. On what authority are they now excluded from cup and bread also? St. Augustine considered the usage to be of apostolical origin, and it continued in the West down to the twelfth century. It continues in the East among Greeks, Russo-Greeks, and the various Monophysite churches to this day, and that on the ground of its almost universality in the primitive church. Is it a greater innovation to suspend the cup than to cut off children from communion altogether? Yet we acquiesce in the latter deprivation without a scruple. It is safer to acquiesce with than without an authority, safer with the belief that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth than with the belief that in so great a matter she is likely to err. 11. Item 5. The Homoousion. The next instance I shall take is from the early teaching on the subject of our Lord's consubstantiality and coeternity. In the controversy carried on by various learned men in the 17th and following century, concerning the statements of the early fathers on this subject, the one party determined the patristic theology by the literal force of the separate expressions or phrases used in it, or by the philosophical opinions of the day. The other, by the doctrine of the Catholic Church, as afterwards authoritatively declared. The one party argued that those fathers need not have meant more than what was afterwards considered heresy. The other answered that there is nothing to prevent their meaning more. Thus the position which Bull maintains seems to be nothing beyond this, that the Nicene Creed is a natural key for interpreting the body of Antinicene theology. His very aim is to explain difficulties. Now, the notion of difficulties and their explanation 
implies a rule to which they are apparent exceptions, and in accordance with which they are to be explained. Nay, the title of his work, which is A Defense of the Creed of Nicaea, shows that he is not investigating what is true and what false, but explaining and justifying a foregone conclusion as sanctioned by the testimony of the Great Council. Unless the statements of the Fathers had suggested difficulties, his work would have had no object. He allows that their language is not such as they would have used after the creed had been imposed, but he says in effect that, if we will but take it in our hands and apply it equitably to their writings, we shall bring out and harmonize their teaching, clear their ambiguities, and discover their anomalous statements to be few and insignificant. In other words, he begins with a presumption, and shows how naturally facts close round it and fall in with it, if we will but let them. He does this triumphantly, yet he has an arduous work. Out of about thirty writers whom he reviews, he has, for one cause or another, to, quote, explain piously, end quote, nearly twenty. Section 2. Our Lord's Incarnation and the Dignity of His Blessed Mother and of all saints. Bishop Bull's controversy had regard to Antinicene writers only, and to little more than to the doctrine of the Divine Son's consubstantiality and coeternity, and as being controversy it necessarily narrows and dries up a large and fertile subject. Let us see whether, treated historically, it will not present itself to us in various aspects, which may rightly be called developments, as coming into view, one out of another, and following one after another, by a natural order of succession. 2. First, then, that the language of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, on the subject of our Lord's Divinity, may be far more easily accommodated to the Arian hypothesis than can the language of the post-Nicene, is agreed on all hands. Thus, St. Justin speaks of the Son as subservient to the Father in the creation of the world, as seen by Abraham, as speaking to Moses from the bush, as appearing to Joshua before the fall of Jericho, as minister and angel, and as numerically distinct from the Father. Clement, again, speaks of the Word as the, quote, instrument of God, close to the soul almighty, ministering to the omnipotent Father's will, an energy, so to say, or operation of the Father, and constituted by His will as the cause of all good, end quote. Again, the Council of Antioch, which condemned Paul of Samosata, says that he, quote, appears to the patriarchs and converses with them, being testified sometimes to be an angel, at other times Lord, at others God. That while it is impious to think that the God of all is called an angel, the Son is the angel of the Father, end quote. Formal proof, however, is unnecessary. Had not the fact been as I have stated it, neither Sandius would have professed to differ from the post-Nicene fathers, nor would Bull have had to defend the anti-Nicene. 3. One principal change which took place as time went on was the following. The anti-Nicene fathers, as in some of the foregoing extracts, speak of the angelic visions in the Old Testament as if they were appearances of the sun. But St. Augustine introduced the explicit doctrine, which has been received since his date, that they were simply angels through whom the omnipresent Son manifested himself. This indeed is the only interpretation which the Antonicene statements admitted as soon as reason began to examine what they did mean. They could not mean that the eternal God could really be seen by bodily eyes. If anything was seen, that must have been some created glory or other symbol by which it pleased the Almighty to signify His presence. What was heard was a sound, 
as external to his essence and as distinct from his nature as the thunder or the voice of the trumpet which pealed along mount sinai what it was had not come under discussion till saint augustine both question and answer were alike undeveloped the earlier fathers spoke as if there were no medium interposed between the creator and the creature and so they seemed to make the eternal son the medium what it really was they had not determined saint augustine ruled and his ruling has been accepted in later times that it was not a mere atmospheric phenomenon or an impression on the senses but the material form proper to an angelic presence or the presence of an angel in that material garb in which blessed spirits do ordinarily appear to men henceforth the angel in the bush the voice which spoke with abraham and the man who wrestled with jacob were not regarded as the son of god but as angelic ministers whom he employed and through whom he signified his presence and his will thus the tendency of the controversy with the arians was to raise our view of our lord's mediatorial acts to impress them on us in their divine rather than their human aspect and to associate them more intimately with the ineffable glories which surround the throne of god the mediatorship was no longer regarded in itself in that prominently subordinate place which it had once occupied in the thoughts of christians but as an office assumed by one who though having become man in order to bear it was still god works and attributes which had hitherto been assigned to the economy or to the sonship were now simply assigned to the manhood a tendency was also elicited as the controversy proceeded to contemplate our lord more distinctly in his absolute perfections than in his relation to the first person of the blessed trinity thus whereas the nicene creed speaks of the quote, father almighty and his only begotten son our lord god from god light from light very god from very god and of the holy ghost the lord and giver of life end quote we are told in the Athanasian of quote, the Father Eternal, the Son Eternal, and the Holy Ghost Eternal, and that none is afore or after other, none is greater or less than another. End quote. 4. The Apollinarian and Monophysite controversy, which followed in the course of the next century, tended towards a development in the same direction since the heresies which were in question maintained at least virtually that our lord was not man it was obvious to insist on the passages of scripture which describe his created and subservient nature and this had the immediate effect of interpreting of his manhood texts which had hitherto been understood more commonly of his divine sonship thus for instance my father is greater than i which had been understood even by saint athanasius of our lord as god is applied by later writers more commonly to his humanity and in this way the doctrine of his subordination to the eternal father which formed so prominent a feature in antonicene theology comparatively fell into the shade five and coincident with these changes a most remarkable result is discovered the Catholic polemic, in view of the Arian and Monophysite errors, being of this character, became the natural introduction to the cultus sanctorum. For in proportion as texts descriptive of created mediation ceased to belong to our Lord, so was a room opened for created mediators. Nay, as regards the instance of angelic appearances itself, as St. Augustine explained them, if those appearances were creatures certainly creatures were worshipped by the patriarchs not indeed in themselves but as the token of a presence greater than themselves when moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon god he hid his face before a creature when jacob said i have seen god face to face and my life is preserved the son of god was there but what he saw 
what he wrestled with was an angel. When Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship before the captain of the Lord's host, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? What was seen and heard was a glorified creature, if St. Augustine is to be followed, and the Son of God was in him. And there were plain precedents in the Old Testament for the lawfulness of such adoration. When the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. When Daniel, too, saw a certain man clothed in linen, there remained no strength in him, for his comeliness was turned in him into corruption. He fell down on his face, and next remained on his knees and hands, and at length stood trembling, and said, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? It might be objected, perhaps, to this argument, that a worship which was allowable in an elementary system might be unlawful when grace and truth had come through Jesus Christ. But then it might be retorted, surely, that that elementary system had been emphatically opposed to all idolatry, and had been minutely jealous of everything which might approach to favoring it. Nay, the very prominence given in the Pentateuch to the doctrine of a creator, and the comparative silence concerning the angelic creation, and the prominence given to the angelic creation in the later prophets, taken together were a token both of that jealousy and of its cessation as time went on. Nor can anything be concluded from St. Paul's censure of angel worship, since the sin which he is denouncing was that of not holding the head, and of worshipping creatures instead of the Creator as the source of good. The same explanation avails for passages like those in St. Athanasius and Theodoret, in which the worship of angels is discountenanced. 6. The Arian controversy had led to another development, which confirmed by anticipation the cultus to which St. Augustine's doctrine pointed. In answer to the objection urged against our Lord's supreme divinity from texts which speak of his exaltation, St. Athanasius is led to insist forcibly on the benefits which have accrued to man through it. He says that, in truth, not Christ, but that human nature which he had assumed was raised and glorified in him. The more plausible was the heretical argument against his divinity from those texts, the more emphatic is St. Athanasius's exaltation of our regenerate nature by way of explaining them. But intimate indeed must be the connection between Christ and his brethren, and high their glory, if the language which seemed to belong to the incarnate word really belonged to them. Thus the pressure of the controversy elicited and developed a truth which till then was held indeed by Christians, but less perfectly realized and not publicly recognized. The sanctification, or rather the deification of the nature of man, is one main subject of St. Athanasius's theology. Christ, in rising, raises his saints with him to the right hand of power. They become instinct with his life, of one body with his flesh, divine sons, immortal kings, gods. He is in them because he is in human nature, and he communicates to them that nature, deified by becoming his, that them it may deify. He is in them by the presence of his spirit, and in them he is seen. They have those titles of honor by participation which are properly his. Without misgiving, we may apply to them the most sacred language of psalmists and prophets. Thou art a priest forever, may be said of St. Polycarp or St. Martin, as well as of their Lord. He hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, was fulfilled in St. Lawrence. 
I have found David my servant, first said typically of the King of Israel, and belonging really to Christ, is transferred back again by grace to his vicegerent upon earth. I have given thee the nations for thine inheritance, is the prerogative of popes. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, the record of a martyr. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, the praise of virgins. 7. Quote, As Christ, says St. Athanasius, died and was exalted as man, so as man is he said to take what as God he ever had, in order that even this so high a grant of grace might reach to us. For the word did not suffer loss in receiving a body, that he should seek to receive a grace, but rather he deified that which he put on, nay, gave it graciously to the race of man. For it is the Father's glory that man, made and then lost, should be found again, and, when done to death, that he should be made alive and should become God's temple. For whereas the powers in heaven, both angels and archangels, were ever worshipping the Lord, as they are now too worshipping him in the name of Jesus, this is our grace and high exaltation, that, even when he became man, the Son of God is worshipped, and the heavenly powers are not startled at seeing all of us, who are of one body with him, introduced into their realms. End quote. In this passage it is almost said that the glorified saints will partake in the homage paid by angels to Christ, the true object of all worship. And at least a reason is suggested to us by it for the angels shrinking in the Apocalypse from the homage of St. John, the theologian and prophet of the Church. But St. Athanasius proceeds still more explicitly, quote, in that the Lord, even when come in human body and called Jesus, was worshipped and believed to be God's Son, and that through him the Father is known, it is plain, as has been said, that not the Word, considered as the Word, received this so great grace, but we. For, because of our relationship to his body, we too have become God's temple, and in consequence have been made God's sons, so that even in us the Lord is now worshipped, and beholders report, as the Apostle says, that God is in them of a truth. End quote. It appears to be distinctly stated in this passage that those who are formerly recognized as God's adopted sons in Christ are fit objects of worship on account of him who is in them, a doctrine which both interprets and accounts for the invocation of saints, the cultus of relics, and the religious veneration in which even the living have sometimes been held, who, being saintly, were distinguished by miraculous gifts. Worship, then, is the necessary correlative of glory, and in the same sense in which created natures can share in the Creator's incommunicable glory, are they also allowed a share of that worship which is His property alone. 8. There was one other subject on which the Arian controversy had a more intimate though not an immediate influence. Its tendency to give a new interpretation to the texts which speak of our Lord's subordination has already been noticed. Such as admitted of it were henceforth explained more prominently of his manhood than of his mediatorship or his sonship. But there were other texts which did not admit of this interpretation, and which, without ceasing to belong to him, might seem more directly applicable to a creature than to the Creator. He indeed was really the wisdom in whom the Father eternally delighted. Yet it would be but natural if, under the circumstances of Arian misbelief, theologians looked out for other than the Eternal Son to be the immediate object of such descriptions. And thus the controversy opened a question which it did not settle. It discovered a new sphere, if we may so speak, 
in the realms of light to which the church had not yet assigned its inhabitant arianism had admitted that our lord was both the god of the evangelical covenant and the actual creator of the universe but even this was not enough because it did not confess him to be the one everlasting infinite supreme being but as one who was made by the supreme it was not enough in accordance with that heresy to proclaim him as having an ineffable origin before all worlds not enough to place him high above all creatures as the type of all the works of god's hands not enough to make him the king of all saints the intercessor for man with god the object of worship the image of the father not enough because it was not all and between all and anything short of all there was an infinite interval the highest of creatures is leveled with the lowest in comparison of the one creator himself that is the nicene council recognized the eventful principle that while we believe and profess any being to be made of a created nature such a being is really no god to us though honored by us with whatever high titles and with whatever homage arius or asterius did all but confess that christ was the almighty they said much more than saint bernard or saint alfonso have since said of the blessed mary yet they left him a creature and were found wanting thus there was a wonder in heaven a throne was seen far above all other created powers mediatorial intercessory a title archetypal a crown bright as the morning star a glory issuing from the eternal throne robes pure as the heavens and a sceptre over all and who was the predestined heir of that majesty since it was not high enough for the highest who was that wisdom and what was her name Quote, the mother of fair love and fear and holy hope exalted like a palm tree in engadi and a rose plant in jericho created from the beginning before the world in god's everlasting counsels and in jerusalem her power End quote. the vision is found in the apocalypse a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars the votaries of mary do not exceed the true faith unless the blasphemers of her son came up to it the church of rome is not idolatrous unless arianism is orthodoxy nine i am not stating conclusions which were drawn out in the controversy but of premises which were laid broad and deep it was then shown it was then determined that to exalt a creature was no recognition of its divinity nor am i speaking of the semi-arians who holding our lord's derivation from the substance of the father yet denying his consubstantiality really did lie open to the charge of maintaining two gods and present no parallel to the defenders of the prerogatives of saint mary but i speak of the arians who taught that the sun's substance was created and concerning them it is true that saint athanasius's condemnation of their theology is a vindication of the medieval yet it is not wonderful considering how socinians sabellians nestorians and the like abound in these days without their even knowing it themselves if those who never rise higher in their notions of our lord's divinity than to consider him a man singularly inhabited by a divine presence that is a catholic saint if such men should mistake the honor paid by the church to the human mother for that very honor which and which alone is worthy of her eternal son ten i have said that there was in the first ages no public and ecclesiastical recognition of the place which saint mary holds in the economy of grace this was reserved for the fifth century as the definition of our lord's proper divinity had been the work of the fourth 
there was a controversy contemporary with those already mentioned i mean the nestorian which brought out the complement of the development to which they had been subservient and which if i may so speak supplied the subject of that august proposition of which arianism had provided the predicate in order to do honour to christ in order to defend the true doctrine of the incarnation in order to secure a right faith in the manhood of the eternal son the council of ephesus determined the blessed virgin to be the mother of god thus all heresies of that day though opposite to each other tended in a most wonderful way to her exaltation and the school of antioch the fountain of primitive rationalism led the church to determine first the conceivable greatness of a creature and then the incommunicable dignity of the blessed virgin eleven but the spontaneous or traditional feeling of christians had in great measure anticipated the formal ecclesiastical decision thus the title theotokos or mother of god was familiar to christians from primitive times and had been used among other writers by origen eusebius saint alexander saint athanasius saint ambrose saint gregory nazianzen saint gregory nissen and saint nilus she had been called ever virgin by others as by saint epiphanius saint jerome and didymus by others quote, the mother of all living end quote, as being the antitype of eve for as saint epiphanius observes quote, in truth not in shadow from mary was life itself brought into the world that mary might bear things living and might become mother of living things end quote. saint augustine says that all have sinned quote, except the holy virgin mary concerning whom for the honor of the lord i wish no question to be raised at all when we are treating of sins End quote. she was alone and wrought the world's salvation says saint ambrose alluding to her conception of the redeemer she is signified by the pillar of the cloud which guided the israelites according to the same father and she had so great grace as not only to have virginity herself but to impart it to those to whom she came the rod out of the stem of jesse says saint jerome and the eastern gate through which the high priest alone goes in and out yet is ever shut the wise woman says saint nilus who hath clad all believers from the fleece of the lamb born of her with the clothing of incorruption and delivered them from their spiritual nakedness the mother of life of beauty of majesty the morning star according to antiochus the mystical new heavens the heavens carrying the divinity the fruitful vine by whom we are translated from death unto life according to saint ephraim the manna which is delicate bright sweet and virgin which as though coming from heaven has poured down on all the people of the churches a food pleasanter than honey according to saint maximus saint proclus calls her the unsullied shell which contains the pearl of price the sacred shrine of sinlessness the golden altar of holocaust the holy oil of anointing the costly alabaster box of spikenard the ark gilt within and without the heifer whose ashes that is the lord's body taken from her cleanses those who are defiled by the pollution of sin the fair bride of the canticles the stay stedigma of believers the church's diadem the expression of orthodoxy these are oratorical expressions but we use oratory on great subjects not on small elsewhere he calls her god's only bridge to man and elsewhere he breaks forth run through all creation in your thoughts and see if there be equal to or greater than the holy virgin mother of god 
12. Theodotus, too, one of the fathers of Ephesus, or whoever it is whose homilies are given to St. Amphilochius, quote, as debtors and God's well-affected servants, let us make confession to God, the Word, and to his mother, of the gift of words, as far as we are able. Hail, mother, clad in light, of the light which sets not. Hail, all undefiled mother of holiness. Hail, most pellucid fountain of the life-giving stream. End quote. After speaking of the Incarnation, he continues, quote, Such paradoxes doth the Divine Virgin Mother ever bring to us in her holy irradiations, for with her is the fount of life, and breasts of the spiritual and guileless milk, from which to suck the sweetness we have even now earnestly run to her, not as in forgetfulness of what has gone before, but in desire of what is to come. End quote. To St. Fulgentius is ascribed the following, quote, Mary became the window of heaven, for God through her poured the true light upon the world, the heavenly ladder, for through her did God descend upon earth. Come, ye virgins, to a virgin, come ye who conceive to one who did conceive, ye who bear to one who bore, mothers to a mother, ye who give suck to one who suckled, young women, to the young. End quote. Lastly, quote, Thou hast found grace, says St. Peter Chrysologus. How much? He had said above, full. And full indeed, which with full shower might pour upon and into the whole creation. End quote. Such was the state of sentiment on the subject of the Blessed Virgin, which the Arian, Nestorian, and Monophysite heresies found in the Church, and on which the doctrinal decisions consequent upon them impressed a form and a consistency which has been handed on in the East and West to this day. End of Section 6 Section 7 of An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Instances in Illustration, Part 2. Section 3 The Papal Supremacy. I will take one instance more. Let us see how, on the principles which I have been laying down and defending, the evidence lies for the Pope's supremacy. As to this doctrine, the question is this, whether there was not, from the first, a certain element at work, or in existence, divinely sanctioned, which, for certain reasons, did not at once show itself upon the surface of ecclesiastical affairs and of which events in the fourth century are the development, and whether the evidence of its existence and operation, which does occur in the earlier centuries, be it much or little, is not just such as ought to occur upon such an hypothesis. 2. For instance, it is true St. Ignatius is silent in his epistles on the subject of the Pope's authority, but if, in fact, that authority could not be in active operation then, such silence is not so difficult to account for as the silence of Seneca or Plutarch about Christianity itself, or of Lucian about the Roman people. St. Ignatius directed his doctrine according to the need. While apostles were on earth, there was the display neither of bishop nor pope. Their power had no prominence as being exercised by apostles. In course of time, first the power of the bishop displayed itself, and then the power of the pope. When the apostles were taken away, Christianity did not at once break into portions, yet separate localities might begin to be the scene of internal dissensions, 
and a local arbiter in consequence would be wanted christians at home did not yet quarrel with christians abroad they quarrelled at home among themselves saint ignatius applied the fitting remedy the sacramentum unitatis was acknowledged on all hands the mode of fulfilling and the means of securing it would vary with the occasion and the determination of its essence its seat and its laws would be a gradual supply for a gradual necessity three this is but natural and is parallel to instances which happen daily and may be so considered without prejudice to the divine right whether of the episcopate or of the papacy it is a common occurrence for a quarrel and a lawsuit to bring out the state of the law and then the most unexpected results often follow st peter's prerogative would remain a mere letter till the complication of ecclesiastical matters became the cause of ascertaining it while christians were of one heart and one soul it would be suspended love dispenses with laws christians knew that they must live in unity and they were in unity in what that unity consisted how far they could proceed as it were in bending it and what at length was the point at which it broke was an irrelevant as well as unwelcome inquiry relatives often lived together in happy ignorance of their respective rights and properties till a father or a husband dies and then they find themselves against their will in separate interests and on divergent courses and dare not move without legal advisers again the case is conceivable of a corporation or an academical body going on for centuries in the performance of the routine business which came in its way and preserving a good understanding between its members with statutes almost a dead letter and no precedents to explain them and the rights of its various classes and functions undefined then of its being suddenly thrown back by the force of circumstances upon the question of its formal character as a body politic and in consequence developing in the relation of governors and governed the regalia petri might sleep as the power of a chancellor has slept not as an obsolete for they never had been carried into effect but as a mysterious privilege which was not understood as an unfulfilled prophecy for saint ignatius to speak of popes when it was a matter of bishops would have been like sending an army to arrest a housebreaker the bishop's power indeed was from god and the pope's could be no more he as well as the pope was our lord's representative and had a sacramental office but i am speaking not of the intrinsic sanctity or divinity of such an office but of its duties Four. when the church then was thrown upon her own resources first local disturbances gave exercise to bishops and next ecumenical disturbances gave exercise to popes and whether communion with the pope was necessary for catholicity would not and could not be debated till a suspension of that communion had actually occurred it is not a greater difficulty that saint ignatius does not write to the asian greeks about popes than that saint paul does not write to the corinthians about bishops and it is a less difficulty that the papal supremacy was not formally acknowledged in the second century than that there was no formal acknowledgment on the part of the church of the doctrine of the holy trinity till the fourth no doctrine is defined till it is violated and in like manner it was natural for christians to direct their course in matters of doctrine by the guidance of mere floating and as it were endemic tradition while it was fresh and strong but in proportion as it languished or was broken in particular places did it become necessary to fall back upon its special homes first the apostolic seas and then the see of saint peter five moreover an international bond and a common authority 
could not be consolidated were it ever so certainly provided while persecutions lasted if the imperial power checked the development of councils it availed also for keeping back the power of the papacy the creed the canon in like manner both remained undefined the creed the canon the papacy ecumenical councils all began to form as soon as the empire relaxed its tyrannous oppression of the church and as it was natural that her monarchical power should display itself when the empire became christian so was it natural also that further developments of that power should take place when that empire fell moreover when the power of the holy see began to exert itself disturbance and collision would be the necessary consequence of the temple of solomon it was said that quote, neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was in building end quote. this is a type of the church above it was otherwise with the church below whether in the instance of popes or apostles in either case a new power had to be defined as saint paul had to plead nay to strive for his apostolic authority and enjoined saint timothy as bishop of ephesus to let no man despise him so popes too have not therefore been ambitious because they did not establish their authority without a struggle it was natural that polycrates should oppose saint victor and natural too that saint cyprian should both extol the see of saint peter yet resist it when he thought it went beyond its province and at a later day it was natural that emperors should rise in indignation against it and natural on the other hand that it should take higher ground with a younger power than it had taken with an elder and time-honored six we may follow barrow here without reluctance except in his imputation of motives Quote, in the first times he says while the emperors were pagans there the popes pretenses were suited to their condition and could not soar high they were not then so mad as to pretend to any temporal power and a pittance of spiritual eminency did content them End quote. again quote, the state of the most primitive church did not well admit such an universal sovereignty for that did consist of small bodies incoherently situated and scattered about in very distant places and consequently unfit to be modeled into one political society or to be governed by one head especially considering their condition under persecution and poverty what convenient resort for direction or justice could a few distressed christians in egypt ethiopia parthia india mesopotamia syria armenia cappadocia and other parts have to rome End quote. again quote, whereas no point avowed by christians could be so apt to raise offence and jealousy in pagans against our religion as this which setteth up a power of so vast extent and huge influence whereas no novelty could be more surprising or startling than the creation of an universal empire over the consciences and religious practices of men whereas also this doctrine could not be but very conspicuous and glaring in ordinary practice it is prodigious that all pagans should not loudly exclaim against it end quote. that is on the supposition that the papal power really was then in actual exercise and again quote, it is most prodigious that in the disputes managed by the fathers against heretics the gnostics valentinians etc they should not even in the first place allege and urge the sentence of the universal pastor and judge as a most evidently conclusive argument as the most efficacious and compendious method of convincing and silencing them end quote. once more quote, even popes themselves have shifted their pretenses 
and varied in style according to the different circumstances of time and their variety of humours designs interests in time of prosperity and upon advantage when they might safely do it any pope almost would talk high and assume much to himself but when they were low or stood in fear of powerful contradiction even the boldest popes would speak submissively or moderately end quote. on the whole supposing the power to be divinely bestowed yet in the first instance more or less dormant a history could not be traced out more probable more suitable to that hypothesis than the actual course of the controversy which took place age after age upon the papal supremacy seven it will be said that all this is a theory certainly it is it is a theory to account for facts as they lie in the history to account for so much being told us about the papal authority in early times and not more a theory to reconcile what is and what is not recorded about it and which is the principal point a theory to connect the words and acts of the anti-nicene church with that antecedent probability of a monarchical principle in the divine scheme and that actual exemplification of it in the fourth century which forms their presumptive interpretation all depends on the strength of that presumption supposing there be otherwise good reason for saying that the papal supremacy is part of christianity there is nothing in the early history of the church to contradict it eight it follows to inquire in what this presumption consists it has as i have said two parts the antecedent probability of a popedom and the actual state of the post nicene church the former of these reasons has unavoidably been touched upon in what has preceded it is the absolute need of a monarchical power in the church which is our ground for anticipating it a political body cannot exist without government and the larger is the body the more concentrated must the government be if the whole of christendom is to form one kingdom one head is essential at least this is the experience of eighteen hundred years as the church grew into form so did the power of the pope develop and wherever the pope has been renounced decay and division have been the consequence we know of no other way of preserving the sacramentum unitatis but a centre of unity the nestorians have had their catholicus the lutherans of prussia have their general superintendent even the independents i believe have had an overseer in their missions the anglican church affords an observable illustration of this doctrine as her prospects have opened and her communion extended the see of canterbury has become the natural centre of her operations it has at the present time jurisdiction in the mediterranean at jerusalem in hindustan in north america at the antipodes it has been the organ of communication when a prime minister would force the church to a redistribution of her property or a protestant sovereign abroad would bring her into friendly relations with his own communion eyes have been lifted up thither in times of perplexity thither have addresses been directed and deputations sent thence issue the legal decisions or the declarations in parliament or the letters or the private interpositions which shape the fortunes of the church and are the moving influence within her separate dioceses it must be so no church can do without its pope we see before our eyes the centralizing process by which the see of saint peter became the sovereign head of christendom if such be the nature of the case it is impossible if we may so speak reverently that an infinite wisdom which sees the end from the beginning in decreeing the rise of an universal empire should not have decreed the development of a sovereign ruler moreover 
all this must be viewed in the light of the general probability so much insisted on above that doctrine cannot but develop as time proceeds and need arises and that its developments are parts of the divine system and that therefore it is lawful or rather necessary to interpret the words and deeds of the earlier church by the determinate teaching of the later nine and on the other hand as the counterpart of these anticipations we are met by certain announcements in scripture more or less obscure and needing a comment and claimed by the papal see as having their fulfillment in itself such are the words thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and i will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven again feed my lambs feed my sheep and satan hath desired to have you i have prayed for thee and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren such too are other various indications of the divine purpose as regards saint peter too weak in themselves to be insisted on separately but not without a confirmatory power such as his new name his walking on the sea his miraculous draught of fishes on two occasions our lord's preaching out of his boat and his appearing first to him after his resurrection it should be observed moreover that a similar promise was made by the patriarch jacob to judah quote, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise the sceptre shall not depart from judah till shiloh come End quote. yet this promise was not fulfilled for perhaps eight hundred years during which long period we hear little or nothing of the tribe descended from him in like manner on this rock i will build my church i give unto thee the keys feed my sheep are not precepts merely but prophecies and promises promises to be accomplished by him who made them prophecies to be fulfilled according to the need and to be interpreted by the event by the history that is of the fourth and fifth centuries though they had a partial fulfillment even in the preceding period and a still more noble development in the middle ages ten a partial fulfillment or at least indications of what was to be there certainly were in the first age faint one by one at least they are various and are found in writers of many times and countries and thereby illustrative of each other and forming a body of proof thus saint clement in the name of the church of rome writes to the corinthians when they were without a bishop saint ignatius of antioch addresses the roman church out of the churches to which he writes as quote, the church which has in dignity the first seat of the city of the romans end quote and implies that it was too high for his directing as being the church of St. Peter and St. Paul. St. Polycarp of Smyrna has recourse to the Bishop of Rome on the question of Easter. The heretic Marcion, excommunicated in Pontus, betakes himself to Rome. Soter, Bishop of Rome, sends alms according to the custom of his church to the churches throughout the empire, and, in the words of Eusebius, quote, affectionately exhorted those who came to Rome as a father his children. End quote. The Montanists from Phrygia come to Rome to gain the countenance of its bishop. Praxias from Asia attempts the like, and for a while is successful. Saint Victor, bishop of Rome, threatens to excommunicate the Asian churches saint irenaeus speaks of rome as quote, the greatest church the most ancient the most conspicuous and founded and established by peter and paul end quote. appeals to its tradition not in contrast indeed but in preference to that of other churches and declares that quote, to this church every church that is the faithful from every side must resort 
or must agree with it, propter potiorem principalitatem. End quote. Quote, o Church, happy in its position, says Tertullian, into which the Apostles poured out, together with their blood, their whole doctrine. End quote. And elsewhere, though in indignation and bitter mockery, he calls the Pope the Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Bishops. The presbyters of St. Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria, complain of his doctrine to St. Dionysius of Rome. The latter expostulates with him, and he explains. The Emperor Aurelian leaves, quote, to the bishops of Italy and of Rome, end quote, the decision whether or not Paul of Samosata shall be dispossessed of the sea house at Antioch. St. Cyprian speaks of Rome as, quote, the sea of Peter and the principal church, whence the unity of the priesthood took its rise, whose faith has been commended by the apostles, to whom faithlessness can have no access. End quote. St. Stephen refuses to receive St. Cyprian's deputation, and separates himself from various churches of the East. Fortunatus and Felix, deposed by St. Cyprian, have recourse to Rome. Basilides, deposed in Spain, betakes himself to Rome and gains the ear of St. Stephen. 11. St. Cyprian had his quarrel with the Roman See, but it appears he allows to it the title of the Cathedra Petri, and even Firmilian is a witness that Rome claimed it. In the 4th and 5th centuries, this title and its logical results became prominent. Thus, St. Julius, A.D. 342, remonstrated by letter with the Eusebian party for, quote, proceeding on their own authority as they pleased, and then, as he says, desiring to obtain our concurrence in their decisions, though we never condemned Athanasius. Not so have the constitutions of Paul, not so have the traditions of the Fathers directed. This is another form of procedure, a novel practice. For what we have received from the blessed Apostle Peter, that I signify to you, and I should not have written this, as deeming that these things are manifest unto all men, had not these proceedings so disturbed us. St. Athanasius, by preserving this protest, has given it his sanction. Moreover, it is referred to by Socrates, and his account of it has the more force because he happens to be incorrect in the details, and therefore did not borrow it from St. Athanasius. Quote, Julius wrote back, he says, that they acted against the canons, because they had not called him to the council, the ecclesiastical canon commanding that the churches ought not to make canons beside the will of the bishop of Rome. End quote. And Sozomen, quote, It was a sacerdotal law to declare invalid whatever was transacted beside the will of the bishop of the Romans. End quote. On the other hand, the heretics themselves, whom St. Julius withstands, are obliged to acknowledge that Rome was, quote, the school of the apostles and the metropolis of orthodoxy from the beginning, end quote. And two of their leaders, Western bishops indeed, some years afterwards recanted their heresy before the Pope in terms of humble confession. 12. Another Pope St. Damasus, in his letter addressed to the Eastern bishops against Apollinaris, A.D. 382, calls those bishops his sons. Quote, in that your charity pays the due reverence to the apostolical see, ye profit yourselves the most, most honored sons. For if, placed as we are in that holy church in which the holy apostle sat and taught, how it becometh us to direct the helm to which we have succeeded, we nevertheless confess ourselves unequal to that honor. Yet do we therefore study as we may, if so be, we may be able to attain to the glory of his blessedness. Quote. Quote, I speak, 
says St. Jerome to the same St. Damasus, with the successor of the fisherman and the disciple of the cross. I, following no one as my chief but Christ, am associated in communion with thy blessedness, that is, with the see of Peter. I know that on that rock the church is built. Whosoever shall eat the lamb outside this house is profane. If a man be not in the ark of Noah, he shall perish when the flood comes in its power. St. Basil entreats St. Damasus to send persons to arbitrate between the churches of Asia Minor, or at least to make a report on the authors of their troubles and name the party with which the Pope should hold communion. Quote, we are in no wise asking anything new, he proceeds, but what was customary with blessed and religious men of former times, and especially with yourself. For we know, by tradition of our fathers of whom we have inquired, and from the information of writings still preserved among us, that Dionysius, that most blessed bishop, while he was eminent among you for orthodoxy and other virtues, sent letters of visitation to our church at Caesarea, and of consolation to our fathers, with ransomers of our brethren from captivity. End quote. In like manner, Ambrosiaster, a Pelagian in his doctrine, which here is not to the purpose, speaks of the quote, church being God's house, whose ruler at this time is Damasus. End quote. 13. Quote, we bear, says St. Siricius, another pope, A.D. 385, the burden of all who are laden, yea, rather the blessed apostle Peter beareth them in us, who, as we trust, in all things protects and defends us the heirs of his government. End quote. And he, in turn, is confirmed by St. Optatus. Quote, you cannot deny your knowledge, says the latter to Parmenian, the Donatist, that in the city Rome, on Peter first hath an episcopal see been conferred, in which Peter sat, the head of all the apostles, in which one see unity might be preserved by all, lest the other apostles should support their respective sees, in order that he might be at once a schismatic and a sinner who against that one see, singularim, placed a second. Therefore that one see, unicam, which is the first of the church's prerogatives, Peter filled first, to whom succeeded Linus, to Linus Clement, to Clement, etc., etc., to Damasus, Siricius, who at this day is associated with us, Socius, together with whom the whole world is in accordance with us, in the one bond of communion, by the intercourse of letters of peace. End quote. Another Pope, quote, Diligently and congruously do ye consult the arcana of the apostolical dignity, says St. Innocent to the Council of Milevis, A.D. 417, the dignity of him on whom, besides those things which are without, falls the care of all the churches, following the form of the ancient rule, which you know as well as I, has been preserved always by the whole world. End quote. Here the Pope appeals, as it were, to the rule of Vincentius, while St. Augustine bears witness that he did not outstep his prerogative, for giving an account of this and another letter, he says, quote, He, the Pope, answered us as to all these matters, as it was religious and becoming, in the Bishop of the Apostolic See. End quote. Another Pope, quote, We have a special anxiety about all persons, says St. Celestine, A.D. 425, to the Illyrian bishops, on whom in the holy Apostle Peter Christ conferred the necessity of making all men our care, when he gave him the keys of opening and shutting. End quote and St. Prosper, his contemporary, confirms him when he calls Rome, quote, the seat of Peter, which being made to the world the head of pastoral honor, possesses by religion 
what it does not possess by arms. End quote. And Vincent of Lerins, when he calls the Pope quote, the head of the world. End quote. 14. Another Pope. Quote, Blessed Peter, says St. Leo, A.D. 440, etc., hath not deserted the helm of the Church which he had assumed. His power lives, and his authority is preeminent in his see. That immovableness which, from the rock Christ, he, when made a rock, received, has been communicated also to his heirs. End quote. And as St. Athanasius and the Eusebians, by their contemporary testimonies, confirm St. Julius, and St. Jerome, St. Basil, and Ambrosiaster, St. Damasus, and St. Optatus, St. Siricius, and St. Augustine, St. Innocent, and St. Prosper and Vincent, St. Celestine, so do St. Peter Chrysologus and the Council of Chalcedon confirm St. Leo. Quote, Blessed Peter, says Chrysologus, who lives and presides in his own see, supplies truth of faith to those who seek it. End quote. And the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, addressing St. Leo respecting Dioscorus, Bishop of Alexandria, quote, He extends his madness even against him to whom the custody of the vineyard has been committed by the Saviour, that is, against thy apostolical holiness, end quote. But the instance of St. Leo will occur again in a later chapter. 15. The acts of the 4th century speak as strongly as its words. We may content ourselves here with Barrow's admissions. Quote, the Pope's power, he says, was much amplified by the importunity of persons condemned or extruded from their places, whether upon just accounts or wrongfully and by faction, for they, finding no other more hopeful place of refuge and redress, did often apply to him. For what will not men do, whither will not they go in straits? Thus did Marcion go to Rome and sue for admission to communion there. So Fortunatus and Felicissimus in St. Cyprian, being condemned in Afric, did fly to Rome for shelter, of which absurdity St. Cyprian doth so complain. So likewise Martianus and Basilides in St. Cyprian, being outed of their sees for having lapsed from the Christian profession, did fly to Stephen for succor to be restored. So Maximus the Cynic, went to Rome to get a confirmation of his election at Constantinople. So Marcellus, being rejected for heterodoxy, went thither to get attestation to his orthodoxy, of which St. Basil complaineth. So Apiarus, being condemned in Afric for his crimes, did appeal to Rome. And, on the other side, Athanasius, being with great partiality condemned by the Synod of Tyre, Paulus, and other bishops being extruded from their sees for orthodoxy, St. Chrysostom being condemned and expelled by Theophilus and his complices, Flavianus being deposed by Dioscorus and the Ephesine Synod, Theodoret being condemned by the same, did cry out for help to Rome. Caledonius, bishop of Besançon, being deposed by Hilarius of Arles, for crime, did fly to Pope Leo. End quote. Again, quote, Our adversaries do oppose some instances of popes meddling in the constitution of bishops, as Pope Leo I saith, that Anatolius did, by the favor of his assent, obtain the bishopric of Constantinople. The same pope is alleged as having confirmed Maximus of Antioch, the same doth write to the bishop of Thessalonica, his vicar, that he should confirm the elections of bishops by his authority. He also confirmed Donatus, an African bishop. We will that Donatus preside over the Lord's flock, upon condition that he remember to send us an account of his faith. Pope Damasus 
did confirm the ordination of Peter Alexandrinus. End quote. 16. And again, quote, the popes indeed in the fourth century began to practice a fine trick, very serviceable to the enlargement of their power, which was to confer on certain bishops, as occasion served, or for continuance, the title of their vicar or lieutenant, thereby pretending to impart authority to them, whereby they were enabled for performance of diverse things, which otherwise by their own episcopal or metropolitical power they could not perform. By which device they did engage such bishops to such a dependence on them, whereby they did promote the papal authority in provinces to the oppression of the ancient rights and liberties of bishops and synods, doing what they pleased under pretense of this vast power communicated to them, and for fear of being displaced, or out of affection to their favorer, doing what might serve to advance the papacy. Thus did Pope Celestine constitute Cyril in his room. Pope Leo appointed Anatolius of Constantinople. Pope Felix, Acacius of Constantinople. Pope Simplicius to Zeno, Bishop of Seville. We thought it convenient that you should be held up by the vicariate authority of our see. So did Siricius and his successors constitute the bishops of Thessalonica to be their vicars in the diocese of Illyricum, wherein being then a member of the Western Empire, they had caught a special jurisdiction, to which Pope Leo did refer in those words which sometimes are impertinently alleged with reference to all bishops, but concern only Anastasius, bishop of Thessalonica. We have entrusted thy charity to be in our stead, so that thou art called into part of the solicitude, not into plenitude of the authority. So did Pope Zosimus bestow a like pretense of vicarious power upon the bishop of Arles, which city was the seat of the temporal exarch in Gaul. End quote. 17. More ample testimony for the papal supremacy, as now professed by Roman Catholics, is scarcely necessary than what is contained in these passages. The simple question is whether the clear light of the 4th and 5th centuries may be fairly taken to interpret to us the dim, though definite, outlines traced in the preceding. End of section 7section eight of an essay on the development of christian doctrine by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain part two doctrinal developments viewed relatively to doctrinal corruptions chapter five genuine developments contrasted with corruptions I have been engaged in drawing out the positive and direct argument in proof of the intimate connection, or rather oneness, with primitive apostolic teaching of the body of doctrine known at this day by the name of Catholic, and professed substantially both by Eastern and Western Christendom. That faith is undeniably the historical continuation of the religious system, which bore the name of Catholic in the 18th century in the 17th, in the 16th, and so back in every preceding century, till we arrive at the first. Undeniably the successor, the representative, the heir of the religion of Cyprian, Basil, Ambrose, and Augustine. The only question that can be raised is whether the said Catholic faith as now held is logically as well as historically the representative of the ancient faith. This, then, is the subject to which I have as yet addressed myself, and I have maintained that modern Catholicism is nothing else but simply the legitimate growth and complement, that is, the natural and necessary development of the doctrine of the early Church, and that its divine authority is included in the divinity of Christianity. 2. 
so far i have gone but an important objection presents itself for distinct consideration it may be said in answer to me that it is not enough that a certain large system of doctrine such as that which goes by the name of catholic should admit of being referred to beliefs opinions and usages which prevailed among the first christians in order to my having a logical right to include a reception of the later teaching in the reception of the earlier that an intellectual development may be in one sense natural and yet untrue to its original as diseases come of nature yet are the destruction or rather the negation of health that the causes which stimulate the growth of ideas may also disturb and deform them and that christianity might indeed have been intended by its divine author for a wide expansion of the ideas proper to it and yet this great benefit hindered by the evil birth of cognate errors which acted as its counterfeit in a word that what i have called developments in the roman church are nothing more or less than what used to be called her corruptions and that new names do not destroy old grievances this is what may be said and i acknowledge its force it becomes necessary in consequence to assign certain characteristics of faithful developments which none but faithful developments have and the presence of which serves as a test to discriminate between them and corruptions this i at once proceed to do and i shall begin by determining what a corruption is and why it cannot rightly be called and how it differs from a development three to find then what a corruption or perversion of the truth is let us inquire what the word means when used literally of material substances now it is plain first of all that a corruption is a word attaching to organized matters only a stone may be crushed to powder but it cannot be corrupted corruption on the contrary is the breaking up of life preparatory to its termination this resolution of a body into its component parts is the stage before its dissolution it begins when life has reached its perfection and it is the sequel or rather the continuation of that process towards perfection being at the same time the reversal and undoing of what went before till this point of regression is reached the body has a function of its own and a direction and aim in its action and a nature with laws these it is now losing and the traits and tokens of former years and with them its vigor and powers of nutrition of assimilation and of self-reparation four taking this analogy as a guide i venture to set down seven notes of varying cogency independence and applicability to discriminate healthy developments of an idea from its state of corruption and decay as follows there is no corruption if it retains one and the same type the same principles the same organization if its beginnings anticipate its subsequent phases and its later phenomena protect and subserve its earlier if it has a power of assimilation and revival and a vigorous action from first to last on these tests i shall now enlarge nearly in the order in which i have enumerated them section one first note of a genuine development preservation of type this is readily suggested by the analogy of physical growth which is such that the parts and proportions of the developed form however altered correspond to those which belong to its rudiments the adult animal has the same make as it had on its birth young birds do not grow into fishes nor does the child degenerate into the brute wild or domestic of which he is by inheritance lord vincentius of lerin adopts this illustration in distinct reference to christian doctrine Quote, let the soul's religion he says imitate the law of the body which as years go on develops indeed and opens out its due proportions 
and yet remains identically what it was. Small are a baby's limbs, a youth's are larger, yet they are the same. End quote. 2. In like manner, every calling or office has its own type, which those who fill it are bound to maintain, and to deviate from the type in any material point is to relinquish the calling. Thus both Chaucer and Goldsmith have drawn pictures of a true parish priest. These differ in details, but on the whole they agree together and are one in such sense that sensuality or ambition must be considered a forfeiture of that high title. Those magistrates, again, are called corrupt who are guided in their judgments by love of lucre or respect of persons, for the administration of justice is their essential function. Thus collegiate or monastic bodies lose their claim to their endowments or their buildings as being relaxed and degenerate if they neglect their statutes or their rule. Thus, too, in political history, a mayor of the palace, such as he became in the person of Pepin, was no faithful development of the office he filled, as originally intended and established. 3. In like manner, it has been argued by a late writer, whether fairly or not does not interfere with the illustration, that the miraculous vision and dream of the labarum could not have really taken place, as reported by Eusebius, because it is counter to the original type of Christianity. Quote, For the first time, he says, an occasion of Constantine's introduction of the standard into his armies, the meek and peaceful Jesus became a god of battle, and the cross, the holy sign of Christian redemption, a banner of bloody strife. This was the first advance to the military Christianity of the Middle Ages, a modification of the pure religion of the Gospel, if directly opposed to its genuine principles, still apparently indispensable to the social progress of men. End quote. On the other hand, a popular leader may go through a variety of professions. He may court parties and break with them. He may contradict himself in words and undo his own measures, yet there may be a steady fulfillment of certain objects or adherence to certain plain doctrines which gives a unity to his career and impresses on beholders an image of directness and large consistency which shows a fidelity to his type from first to last. 4. However, as the last instances suggest to us, this unity of type characteristic as it is of faithful developments, must not be pressed to the extent of denying all variation, nay, considerable alteration of proportion and relation as time goes on in the parts or aspects of an idea. Great changes in outward appearance and internal harmony occur in the instance of the animal creation itself. The fledged bird differs much from its rudimental form in the egg. The butterfly is the development, but not in any sense the image of the grub. The whale claims a place among mammalia, though we might fancy that, as in the child's game of cat's cradle, some strange intersusception had been permitted to make it so like, yet so contrary to the animals with which it is itself classed. And in like manner, if beasts of prey were once in paradise, and fed upon grass, they must have presented bodily phenomena very different from the structure of muscles, claws, teeth, and viscera which now fit them for a carnivorous existence. Eutychius, patriarch of Constantinople, on his deathbed, grasped his own hand and said, quote, I confess that in this flesh we shall all rise again. End quote. Yet flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and a glorified body has attributes incompatible with its present condition on earth. 5. More subtle still and mysterious are the variations which are consistent or not inconsistent with identity in political and religious developments. 
the Catholic doctrine of the Holy Trinity has ever been accused by heretics of interfering with that of the divine unity out of which it grew. And even believers will, at first sight, consider that it tends to obscure it. Yet Petavius says, quote, I will affirm, what perhaps will surprise the reader, that that distinction of persons which, in regard to proprietates, is in reality most great, is so far from disparaging the unity and simplicity of God, that this very real distinction especially avails for the doctrine that God is one and most simple. End quote. Again, Arius asserted that the second person of the Blessed Trinity was not able to comprehend the first, whereas Eunomius's characteristic tenet was in an opposite direction, videlicet, that, that not only the Son, but that all men could comprehend God. Yet no one can doubt that Eunomianism was a true development, not a corruption, of Arianism. The same man may run through various philosophies or beliefs, which are in themselves irreconcilable, without inconsistency, since in him they may be nothing more than accidental instruments or expressions of what he is inwardly from first to last. The political doctrines of the modern Tory resemble those of the primitive Whig, yet few will deny that the Whig and Tory characters have each a discriminating type. Calvinism has changed into Unitarianism, yet this need not be called a corruption, even if it be not, strictly speaking, a development, for Harding, in controversy with Jewell, surmised the coming change three centuries since, and it has occurred not in one country, but in many. 6. The history of national character supplies an analogy rather than an instance strictly in point. Yet there is so close a connection between the development of minds and of ideas that it is allowable to refer to it here. Thus we find England of old the most loyal supporter, and England of late the most jealous enemy of the Holy See. As great a change is exhibited in France, once the eldest born of the Church and the flower of her knighthood, now democratic and lately infidel. Yet in neither nation can these great changes be well called corruptions. Or again, let us reflect on the ethical vicissitudes of the chosen people. How different is their groveling and cowardly temper on leaving Egypt from the chivalrous spirit, as it may be called, of the age of David, or again from the bloody fanaticism which braved Titus and Hadrian? In what contrast is that impotence of mind, which gave way at once and bowed the knee at the very sight of a pagan idol, with the stern iconoclasm and bigoted nationality of later Judaism. How startling the apparent absence of what would be called talent in this people during their supernatural dispensation, compared with the gifts of mind which various witnesses assign to them now. 7. And in like manner ideas may remain when the expression of them is indefinitely varied and we cannot determine whether a professed development is truly such or not without further knowledge than an experience of the mere fact of this variation. Nor will our instinctive feelings serve as a criterion. It must have been an extreme shock to St. Peter to be told he must slay and eat beasts unclean as well as clean, though such a command was implied already in that faith which he held and taught a shock which a single effort or a short period or the force of reason would not suffice to overcome. Nay, it may happen that a representation which varies from its original may be felt as more true and faithful than one which has more pretensions to be exact. So it is with many a portrait which is not striking. At first look, of course, it disappoints us. But when we are familiar with it, we see in it what we could not see at first, and prefer it, not to a perfect likeness, 
but to many a sketch which is so precise as to be a caricature. 8. On the other hand, real perversions and corruptions are often not so unlike externally to the doctrine from which they come, as are changes which are consistent with it and true developments. When Rome changed from a republic to an empire, it was a real alteration of polity, or what may be called a corruption, yet in appearance the change was small. The old offices or functions of government remained, it was only that the imperator or commander-in-chief concentrated them in his own person. Augustus was consul and tribune, supreme pontiff and censor, and the imperial rule was, in the words of Gibbon, quote, an absolute monarchy disguised by the forms of a commonwealth. End quote. On the other hand, when the dissimulation of Augustus was exchanged for the ostentation of Diocletian, the real alteration of constitution was trivial, but the appearance of change was great. Instead of plain consul, censor, and tribune, Diocletian became dominus or king assumed the diadem, and threw around him the forms of a court. Nay, one cause of corruption in religion is the refusal to follow the course of doctrine as it moves on, and an obstinacy in the notions of the past. Certainly, as we see conspicuously in the history of the chosen race, the Samaritans, who refused to add the prophets to the law, and the Sadducees, who denied a truth which was covertly taught in the book of Exodus, were, in appearance only, faithful adherents to the primitive doctrine. Our Lord found His people precisions in their obedience to the letter. He condemned them for not being led on to its spirit, that is, to its developments. The gospel is the development of the law, yet what difference seems wider than that which separates the unbending rule of Moses from the grace and truth which came by Jesus Christ? Samuel had of old time fancied that the tall Eliab was the Lord's anointed, and Jesse had thought David only fit for the sheep coat, and when the great king came, he was, quote, as a root out of a dry ground, end quote but strength came out of weakness, and out of the strong sweetness. So it is in the case of our friends. The most obsequious are not always the truest, and seeming cruelty is often genuine affection. We know the conduct of the three daughters in the drama towards the old king. She who had found her love, quote, more richer than her tongue, and could not heave her heart into her mouth, End quote, was in the event alone true to her father. 9. An idea, then, does not always bear about it the same external image. This circumstance, however, has no force to weaken the argument for its substantial identity as drawn from its external sameness when such sameness remains. On the contrary, for that very reason, unity of type becomes so much the surer guarantee of the healthiness and soundness of developments when it is persistently preserved in spite of their number or importance. Section 2. Second note. Continuity of principles. As in mathematical creations figures are formed on distinct formulae, which are the laws under which they are developed, so it is in ethical and political subjects. Doctrines expand variously according to the mind, individual or social into which they are received, and the peculiarities of the recipient are the regulating power, the law, the organization, or as it may be called, the form of the development. The life of doctrines may be said to consist in the law or principle which they embody. Principles are abstract and general. Doctrines relate to facts. Doctrines develop, and principles at first sight do not. Doctrines grow and are enlarged. Principles are permanent. Doctrines are intellectual, 
and principles are more immediately ethical and practical. Systems live in principles and represent doctrines. Personal responsibility is a principle, the being of a God is a doctrine. From that doctrine all theology has come in due course, whereas that principle is not clearer under the gospel than in paradise, and depends not on belief in an almighty governor, but on conscience. Yet the difference between the two sometimes merely exists in our mode of viewing them, and what is a doctrine in one philosophy is a principle in another. Personal responsibility may be made a doctrinal basis and develop into Arminianism or Pelagianism. Again, it may be discussed whether infallibility is a principle or a doctrine of the Church of Rome, and dogmatism a principle or doctrine of Christianity. Again, consideration for the poor is a doctrine of the Church considered as a religious body, and a principle when she is viewed as a political power. Doctrines stand to principles as the definitions to the axioms and postulates of mathematics. Thus, the 15th and 17th propositions of Euclid's book the first are developments not of the three first axioms, which are required in the proof, but of the definition of a right angle. Perhaps the perplexity which arises in the mind of a beginner on learning the early propositions of the second book arises from these being more prominently exemplifications of axioms than developments of definitions. He looks for developments from the definition of the rectangle and finds but various particular cases of the general truth that, quote, the whole is equal to its parts, end quote. 2. It might be expected that the Catholic principles would be later in development than the Catholic doctrines, inasmuch as they lie deeper in the mind and are assumptions rather than objective professions. This has been the case. The Protestant controversy has mainly turned, or is turning, on one or other of the principles of Catholicity, and to this day the rule of Scripture interpretation, the doctrine of inspiration, the relation of faith to reason, moral responsibility, private judgment, inherent grace, the seat of infallibility, remain, I suppose, more or less undeveloped, or at least undefined, by the Church. Doctrines stand to principles, if it may be said without fancifulness, as fecundity viewed relatively to generation, though this analogy must not be strained. Doctrines are developed by the operation of principles, and develop variously according to those principles. Thus a belief in the transitiveness of worldly goods leads the Epicurean to enjoyment, and the ascetic to mortification. And from their common doctrine of the sinfulness of matter, the Alexandrian Gnostics became sensualists and the Syrian devotees. The same philosophical elements received into a certain sensibility or insensibility to sin and its consequences leads one mind to the Church of Rome, another to what, for want of a better word, may be called Germanism. Again, religious investigation sometimes is conducted on the principle that it is a duty, quote, to follow and speak the truth, end quote which really means that it is no duty to fear error, or to consider what is safest, or to shrink from scattering doubts, or to regard the responsibility of misleading, and thus it terminates in heresy or infidelity without any blame to religious investigation in itself. Again, to take a different subject, what constitutes a chief interest of dramatic compositions and tales is to use external circumstances, which may be considered their law of development, as a means of bringing out into different shapes and showing under new aspects the personal peculiarities of character, according as either those circumstances or those peculiarities vary in the case of the personages introduced. 3. Principles are popularly said to develop when they are but exemplified. Thus, 
the various sects of protestantism unconnected as they are with each other are called developments of the principle of private judgment of which really they are but applications and results a development to be faithful must retain both the doctrine and the principle with which it started doctrine without its correspondent principle remains barren if not lifeless of which the greek church seems an instance or it forms those hollow professions which are familiarly called shams as a zeal for an established church and its creed on merely conservative or temporal motives such too was the roman constitution between the reigns of augustus and diocletian on the other hand principle without its corresponding doctrine may be considered as the state of religious minds in the heathen world viewed relatively to revelation that is of the quote, children of god who are scattered abroad end quote. pagans may have heretics cannot have the same principles as catholics if the latter have the same they are not real heretics but in ignorance principle is a better test of heresy than doctrine heretics are true to their principles but change to and fro backwards and forwards in opinion for very opposite doctrines may be exemplifications of the same principle thus the antiochenes and other heretics sometimes were arians sometimes sabellians sometimes nestorians sometimes monophysites as if at random from fidelity to their common principle that there is no mystery in theology thus calvinists become unitarians from the principle of private judgment the doctrines of heresy are accidents and soon run to an end its principles are everlasting this too is often the solution of the paradox extremes meet and of the startling reactions which take place in individuals videlicet the presence of some one principle or condition which is dominant in their minds from first to last if one of two contradictory alternatives be necessarily true on a certain hypothesis then the denial of the one leads by mere logical consistency and without direct reasons to a reception of the other thus the question between the church of rome and protestantism falls in some minds into the proposition quote, rome is either the pillar and ground of the truth or she is antichrist end quote in proportion then as they revolt from considering her the latter are they compelled to receive her as the former hence too men may pass from infidelity to rome and from rome to infidelity from a conviction in both courses that there is no tangible intellectual position between the two protestantism viewed in its more catholic aspect is doctrine without active principle viewed in its heretical it is active principle without doctrine many of its speakers for instance use eloquent and glowing language about the church and its characteristics some of them do not realize what they say but use high words and general statements about the faith and primitive truth and schism and heresy to which they attach no definite meaning while others speak of unity universality and catholicity and use the words in their own sense and for their own ideas four the science of grammar affords another instance of the existence of special laws in the formation of systems some languages have more elasticity than others and greater capabilities and the difficulty of explaining the fact cannot lead us to doubt it there are languages for instance which have a capacity for compound words which we cannot tell why is in matter of fact denied to others we feel the presence of a certain character or genius in each which determines its path and its range and to discover and enter into it is one part of refined scholarship and when particular writers in consequence perhaps of some theory tax a language beyond its powers the failure is conspicuous very subtle too and difficult to draw out 
are the principles on which depends the formation of proper names in a particular people. In works of fiction, names or titles, significant or ludicrous, must be invented for the characters introduced, and some authors excel in their fabrication, while others are equally unfortunate. Foreign novels, perhaps, attempt to frame English surnames and signally fail, yet what every one feels to be the case, no one can analyze. That is, our surnames are constructed on a law which is only exhibited in particular instances and which rules their formation on certain, though subtle, determinations. And so, in philosophy, the systems of physics or morals, which go by celebrated names, proceed upon the assumption of certain conditions which are necessary for every stage of their development. The Newtonian theory of gravitation is based on certain axioms. For instance, that the fewest causes assignable for phenomena are the true ones, and the application of science to practical purposes depends upon the hypothesis that what happens today will happen tomorrow. And so, in military matters, the discovery of gunpowder developed the science of attack and defense in a new instrumentality. Again, it is said that when Napoleon began his career of victories, the enemy's generals pronounced that his battles were fought against rule, and that he ought not to be victorious. 5. So, states have their respective policies, on which they move forward, and which are the conditions of their well-being. Thus, it is sometimes said that the true policy of the American Union, or the law of its prosperity, is not the enlargement of its territory, but the cultivation of its internal resources. Thus Russia is said to be weak in attack, strong in defense, and to grow not by the sword, but by diplomacy. Thus Islamism is said to be the form or life of the Ottoman, and Protestantism of the British Empire, and the admission of European ideas into the one, or of Catholic ideas into the other, to be the destruction of the respective conditions of their power. Thus Augustus and Tiberius governed by dissimulation. Thus Pericles, in his funeral oration, draws out the principles of the Athenian commonwealth, videlicet, that it is carried on, not by formal and severe enactments, but by the ethical character and spontaneous energy of the people. The political principles of Christianity, if it be right to use such words of a divine polity, are laid down for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Contrarywise to other empires, Christians conquer by yielding. They gain influence by shrinking from it. They possess the earth by renouncing it. Gibbon speaks of, quote, the vices of the clergy as being, to a philosophic eye, far less dangerous than their virtues. End quote. Again, as to Judaism, it may be asked on what law it developed. That is, whether Mahometanism may not be considered as a sort of Judaism, as formed by the presence of a different class of influences. In this contrast between them, Perhaps it may be said that the expectation of a Messiah was the principle or law which expanded the elements, almost common to Judaism with Mahometanism, into their respective characteristic shapes. One of the points of discipline to which Wesley attached most importance was that of preaching early in the morning. This was his principle. In Georgia, he began preaching at five o'clock every day, winter and summer. Quote, early preaching, he said, is the glory of the Methodists. Whenever this is dropped, they will dwindle away into nothing. They have lost their first love. They are a fallen people. End quote. 6. Now, these instances show, as has been incidentally observed of some of them, that the destruction of the special laws or principles of a development is its corruption. Thus, as to nations, when we talk of the spirit of a people being lost, we do not mean that this or that act has been committed, or measure carried. 
but that certain lines of thought or conduct by which it has grown great are abandoned. Thus the Roman poets consider their state in course of ruin because its prisci mores and pietas were failing. And so we speak of countries or persons as being in a false position when they take up a course of policy or assume a profession inconsistent with their natural interests or real character. Judaism, again, was rejected when it rejected the Messiah. Thus, the continuity or the alteration of the principles on which an idea has developed is a second mark of discrimination between a true development and a corruption. Section 3. Third Note. Power of Assimilation. In the physical world, whatever has life is characterized by growth, so that in no respect to grow is to cease to live. It grows by taking into its own substance external materials, and this absorption or assimilation is completed when the materials appropriated come to belong to it or enter into its unity. Two things cannot become one, except there be a power of assimilation in one or the other. Sometimes assimilation is effected only with an effort. It is possible to die of repletion, and there are animals who lie torpid for a time under the contest between the foreign substance and the assimilating power. And different food is proper for different recipients. This analogy may be taken to illustrate certain peculiarities in the growth or development in ideas which were noticed in the first chapter. It is otherwise with mathematical and other abstract creations, which, like the soul itself, are solitary and self-dependent. But doctrines and views which relate to man are not placed in a void, but in the crowded world, and make way for themselves by interpenetration and develop by absorption. Facts and opinions which have hitherto been regarded in other relations and grouped round other centers, henceforth are gradually attracted to a new influence and subjected to a new sovereign. They are modified, laid down afresh, thrust aside as the case may be. A new element of order and composition has come among them, and its life is proved by this capacity of expansion, without disarrangement or dissolution. An eclectic, conservative, assimilating, healing, molding process, a unitive power, is of the essence and a third test of a faithful development. 2. Thus, a power of development is a proof of life, not only in its essay, but especially in its success. For a mere formula either does not expand or is shattered in expanding. A living idea becomes many, yet remains one. The attempt at development shows the presence of a principle and its success the presence of an idea. Principles stimulate thought and an idea concentrates it. The idea never was that throve and lasted, yet, like mathematical truth, incorporated nothing from external sources. So far from the fact of such incorporation implying corruption, as is sometimes supposed, development is a process of incorporation. Mahometanism may be in external developments scarcely more than a compound of other theologies, yet no one would deny that there has been a living idea somewhere in a religion which has been so strong, so wide, so lasting a bond of union in the history of the world. Why it has not continued to develop after its first preaching, if this be the case, as it seems to be, cannot be determined without a greater knowledge of that religion and how far it is merely political, how far theological, than we commonly possess. 3. In Christianity, opinion, while a raw material, is called philosophy or scholasticism. When a rejected refuse, it is called heresy. Ideas are more open to an external bias in their commencement than afterwards. 
Hence, the great majority of writers who considered the medieval church corrupt trace its corruption to the first four centuries, not to what are called the Dark Ages. That an idea more readily coalesces with these ideas than with those does not show that it has been unduly influenced, that is, corrupted by them, but that it has an antecedent affinity to them. At least it shall be assumed here that, when the Gospels speak of virtue going out of our Lord, and of his healing with the clay which his lips had moistened, they afford instances not of a perversion of Christianity, but of affinity to notions which were external to it, and that St. Paul was not biased by Orientalism, though he said, after the manner of some Eastern sects, that it was, quote, excellent not to touch a woman, end quote. 4. Thus, in politics, too, ideas are sometimes proposed, discussed, rejected, or adopted, as it may happen, and sometimes they are shown to be unmeaning and impossible. Sometimes they are true, but partially so, or in subordination to other ideas, with which in consequence they are as wholes or in part incorporated, as far as these have affinities to them, the power to incorporate being thus recognized as a property of life. Mr. Bentham's system was an attempt to make the circle of legal and moral truths developments of certain principles of his own. Those principles of his may, if it so happen, prove unequal to the weight of truths which are eternal, and the system founded on them may break into pieces. Or, again, a state may absorb certain of them for which it has affinity, that is, it may develop in Benthamism, yet remain in substance what it was before. In the history of the French Revolution, we read of many middle parties who attempted to form theories of constitutions short of those which they would call extreme, and successively failed from the want of power or reality in their characteristic ideas. The Semi-Arians attempted a middle way between orthodoxy and heresy, but could not stand their ground. At length part fell into Macedonianism, and part joined the Church. 5. The stronger and more living is an idea, that is, the more powerful hold it exercises on the minds of men, the more able is it to dispense with safeguards, and trust to itself against the danger of corruption. As strong frames exult in their agility, and healthy constitutions throw off ailments, so parties or schools that live can afford to be rash, and will sometimes be betrayed into extravagances, yet are brought right by their inherent vigor. On the other hand, unreal systems are commonly decent externally. Forms, subscriptions, or articles of religion are indispensable when the principle of life is weakly. Thus, Presbyterianism has maintained its original theology in Scotland, where legal subscriptions are enforced, while it has run into Arianism or Unitarianism, where that protection is away. We have yet to see whether the Free Kirk can keep its present theological ground. The Church of Rome can consult expedients more freely than other bodies, as trusting to her living tradition, and is sometimes thought to disregard principle and scruple when she is but dispensing with forms. Thus, saints are often characterized by acts which are no pattern for others, and the most gifted men are, by reason of their very gifts, sometimes led into fatal inadvertences. Hence, vows are the wise defense of unstable virtue, and general rules the refuge of feeble authority. And so much may suffice on the unitive power of faithful developments, which constitutes their third characteristic. End of section 8